Luella Miller by Mary Wilkins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Luttrell. Luella Miller by Mary Wilkins. Close to the village street stood the one-story house in which Luella Miller, who had an evil name in the village, had dwelt. She had been dead for years, yet there were those in the village who, in spite of the clear light which comes on a vantage point from a long past danger, half believed in the tale which they had heard from their childhood. In their hearts, although they scarcely would have owned it, was a survival of the wild, horror, and frenzied fear of their ancestors who had dwelt in the same age with Luella Miller. Young people even would stare with a shudder at the old houses they passed, and children never played around it, as was their wont, around an untenanted building. Not a window in the old Miller house was broken. The panes reflected the morning sunlight in patches of emerald and blue, and the latch of the sagging front door was never lifted, although no bolt secured it. Since Luella Miller had been carried out of it, the house had had no tenant except one friendless old soul who had no choice between that and the far-off shelter of the open sky. This old woman, who had survived her kindred and friends, lived in the house one week. Then one morning no smoke came out of the chimney, and a body of neighbors, a score strong, entered and found her dead in her bed. There were dark whispers as to the cause of her death, and there were those who testified to an expression of fear so exalted that it showed forth the state of the departing soul upon the dead face. The old woman had been hale and hearty when she entered the house, and in seven days she was dead. It seemed that she had fallen a victim to some uncanny power. The minister talked in the pulpit with covert severity against the sin of superstition. Still, the belief prevailed. Not a soul in the village but would have chosen the almshouse rather than that dwelling. No vagrant, if he heard the tale, would seek shelter beneath that old roof, unhallowed by nearly half a century of superstitious fear. There was only one person in the village who had actually known Luella Miller. That person was a woman well over 80, but a marvel of vitality and unextinct youth. Straighted as an arrow with the spring of one recently let loose from the bow of life, she moved about the streets and she always went to church, rain or shine. She had never married and had lived alone for years in a house across the road from Luella Miller's. This woman had none of the garrulousness of age, but never in all her life had she ever held her tongue for any will save her own, and she never spared the truth when she essayed to present it. She it was who bore testimony to the life, evil, though possibly wittingly or designedly so, of Luella Miller, and to her personal appearance. When this old woman spoke, and she had the gift of description, although her thoughts were clothed in the rude vernacular of her native village, one could seem to see Luella Miller as she had really looked. According to this woman, Lydia Anderson by name, Luella Miller had been a beauty of a type rather unusual in New England. She had been a slight, pliant sort of creature, as ready with a strong yielding to fate and as unbreakable as a willow. She had glimmering lengths of straight fair hair, which she wore softly looped around a long, lovely face. She had blue eyes full of soft pleading, a little slender, clinging hands, and a wonderful grace of motion and attitude. Luella Miller used to sit in a way nobody else could if they sat up and studied a week of Sundays, said Lydia Anderson, and it was a sight to see her walk. If one of them willows over there on the edge of the brook should start up and get its roots free of the ground and move off, it would just go the way Luella Miller used to. She had a green shot silk she used to wear, too, and a hat with green ribbon streamers and a lace veil blowing across her face and out sideways, and a green ribbon flying from her waist. That was what she came out bride in when she married Erastus Miller. Her name before she was married was Hill. There was always a sight of L's in her name, married or single. Erastus Miller was good-looking, too, better-looking than Luella. Sometimes I used to think that Luella wasn't so handsome after all. Erastus just about worshipped her. I used to know him pretty well. He lived next door to me, and we went to school together. Folks used to say he was waiting on me, but he wasn't. I never thought he was except once or twice when he said things that some girls might have suspected meant something. 
That was before Luella came here to teach the district school. It was funny how she came to get it, for folks said she hadn't any education, and that one of the big girls, Lottie Henderson, used to do all the teaching for her while she sat back and did embroidery work on a cambric pocket handkerchief. Lottie Henderson was a real smart girl, a splendid scholar, and she just set her eyes by Luella as all the girls did. Lottie would have made a real smart woman, but she died when Luella had been here about a year, just faded away and died. Nobody knew what aided her. She dragged herself to that schoolhouse and helped Luella teach till the very last minute. The committee all knew how Luella didn't do much of the work herself, but they winked at it. It wasn't long after Lottie died that Erastus married her. I always thought he heard it up because she wasn't fit to teach. One of the big boys used to help her after Lottie died, but he hadn't much government, and the school didn't do very well, and Luella might have had to give it up, for the committee couldn't have shut their eyes to things much longer. The boy that helped her was a real honest, innocent sort of fellow, and he was a good scholar, too. Folks said he overstudied, and that was the reason he took crazy the year after Luella married, but I don't know. And I don't know what made Erastus Miller go into consumption of the blood the year after he was married. Consumption wasn't in his family. He just grew weaker and weaker and went almost bent double when he tried to wait on Luella, and he spoke feeble like an old man. He worked terrible hard till the last trying to save up a little to leave Luella. I've seen him out in the worst storms on a wood sled. He used to cut and sell wood, and he was hunched up on top, looking more dead than alive. Once I couldn't stand it, I went over and helped him pitch some wood on the cart. I was always strong in my arms. I wouldn't stop for all he told me to, and I guess he was glad enough for the help. That was only a week before he died. He fell on the kitchen floor while he was getting breakfast. He always got the breakfast and let Luella lay abed. He did all the sweeping and the washing and the ironing and most of the cooking. He couldn't bear to have Luella lift her finger, and she let him do for her. She lived like a queen for all the work she did. She didn't even do her sewing. She said it made her shoulder ache to sew, and poor Erastus' sister Lily used to do all her sewing. She weren't able to either. She was never strong in her back, but she did it beautifully. She had to, to suit Luella. She was so dreadful particular. I never saw anything like the faggot and hem stitching that Lily Miller did for Luella. She made all of Luella's wedding outfit and that green silk dress after Maria Babbitt cut it. Maria, she cut it for nothing, and she did a lot more cutting and fitting for nothing for Luella, too. Lily Miller went to live with Luella after Erastus died. She gave up her home, though she was real attached to it, and weren't a mite afraid to stay alone. She rented it, and she went to live with Luella right away after the funeral. Then this old woman, Lydia Anderson, who remembered Luella Miller, would go on to relate the story of Lily Miller, it seemed that on the removal of Lily Miller to the house of her dead brother to live with his widow, the village people first began to talk. This Lily Miller had been hardly past her first youth and a most robust and blooming woman, rosy-cheeked with curls of strong black hair, overshadowing round, candid temples and bright dark eyes. It was not six months after she had taken up a residence with her sister-in-law that her rosy color faded and her pretty curves became wan hollows. White shadows began to show in the black rings of her hair, and the light died out of her eyes, her features sharpened, and there were pathetic lines at her mouth, which yet wore always an expression of utter sweetness and even happiness. She was devoted to her sister. There was no doubt that she loved her with her whole heart and was perfectly content in her service. It was her sole anxiety lest she should die and leave her alone. The way Lily Miller used to talk about Luella was enough to make you mad, enough to make you cry, said Lydia Anderson. I've been in there sometimes toward the last when she was too feeble to cook and carried her some blanc mange or custard something I thought she might relish, and she thanked me, and when I asked her how she was, say she felt better than she did yesterday, and asked me if I didn't think she looked better. Dreadful pitiful, and say poor Luella had an awful time taking care of her and doing the work. She weren't strong enough to do anything, when all the time Luella weren't lifting her finger and poor Lily didn't get any care except what the neighbors gave her. And Luella eat up everything. That was carried in for Lily. I had it real straight that she did. Luella used to just sit and cry and do nothing. She did act real fond of Lily, and she pined away considerable, too. 
There was those that thought she'd go into decline herself. But after Lily died, her aunt Abby Mixter came, and then Luella picked up and grew as fat and rosy as ever. But poor Aunt Abby began to droop just the way Lily had, and I guess somebody wrote to her married daughter, Mrs. Sam Abbott, who lived in Bar, for she wrote her mother that she must leave right away and come and make her a visit. But Aunt Abby wouldn't go. I can see her now. She was a real good-looking woman, tall and large, with a big square face and a high forehead that looked of itself kind of benevolent and good. She just tended out on Luella as if she had been a baby. And when her married daughter sent for her, she couldn't stir one inch. She'd always thought a lot of her daughter, too. But she said Luella needed her, and her married daughter didn't. Her daughter kept writing and writing, but it didn't do any good. Finally, she came, and when she saw how bad her mother looked, she broke down and cried and all but went on her knees to have her come away. She spoke her mind out to Luella, too. She told her that she'd killed her husband and everybody that had anything to do with her, and she thanked her to leave her mother alone. Luella went into hysterics, and Aunt Abby was so frightened that she called me after her daughter went. Mrs. Sam Abbott, she went away fairly crying out loud in the buggy. The neighbors heard her, and well, she might for she never saw her mother again alive. I went in that night when Aunt Abby called for me, standing in the door with her little green check shawl over her head. I can see her now. Do come over here, Miss Anderson, she sung out, kind of gasping for breath. I didn't stop for anything. I put over as fast as I could, and when I got there, there was Luella laughing and crying all together, and Aunt Abby trying to hush her and all the time she herself was white as a sheet and shaking, so she could hardly stand. For the land's sakes, Mrs. Mixter, says I, you look worse than she does. You ain't fit to... Oh, there ain't anything the matter with me, says she. Then she went on talking to Luella. There, there, don't, don't, poor little lamb, says she. Aunt Abby is here. She going, ain't going away and leave you. Don't, don't, poor little lamb. Do leave her with me, Mrs. Mixter, and you get back to bed, says I, for Aunt Abby had been laying down considerable lately, though somehow she contrived to do the work. I'm well enough, says she. Don't you think she had better have the doctor, Miss Anderson? The doctor, says I. I think you had better have the doctor. I think you need him much worse than some folks I could mention. And I looked right straight at Luella Miller laughing and crying and going on as if she was the center of all creation. All the time she was acting so, seemed as if she was too sick to sense anything. She was a keeping a sharp lookout as to how we took it out of the corner of her eye. I see her. You could never cheat me about Luella Miller. Funny, I got real mad and I run home and I got a bottle of valerian I had and I poured some boiling hot water on a handful of catnip and I mixed up that catnip tea with most half a wine glass of valerian and I went with it over to Luella's. I marched right up to Luella, a holding out this cup all smoking. Now, says I, Luella Miller, you swallow this. What is, what is it? Oh, what is it? She sort of screeches out. Then she goes off a laughing enough to kill. Poor lamb, poor little lamb, says Aunt Abby, standing over her all kind of tottery and trying to bathe her head with camphor. You swallow this right down, says I, and I didn't waste any ceremony. I just took hold of Luella Miller's chin, and I tipped her head back, and I caught her mouth open with laughing, and I clapped that cup to her lips, and I fairly hollered at her, swallow, 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 and she gulped it right down. She had to, and I guess it did her good. Anyhow, she stopped crying and laughing and let me put her to bed, and she went to sleep like a baby inside of half an hour. That was more than poor Aunt Abby did. She lay awake all that night, and I stayed with her, though she tried not to have me. Said she weren't sick enough for watchers, but I stayed, and I made some good cornmeal gruel, and I fed her with a teaspoon every little while all night long. It seemed to me as if she was just dying from being all wore out. In the morning, as soon as it was light, I ran over to the Brisbys and sent Johnny Brisby for the doctor. I told him to tell the doctor to hurry, and he'd come pretty quick. Poor Aunt Abby didn't seem to know much of anything when he got there. You wouldn't hardly tell she breathed. She was so used up. When the doctor had gone, Luella came into the room looking like a baby in a ruffled nightgown. I can see her now. Her eyes were as blue and her face all pink and white like a blossom. And she looked at Aunt Abby in the bed, sort of innocent and surprised. Why, says she, Aunt Abby ain't got up yet? 
No, she ain't, says I pretty short. I thought I didn't smell the coffee, says Luella. Coffee, says I. I guess if you have coffee this morning, you'll make it yourself. I never made the coffee in all my life, says she, dreadful astonished. Erastus always made the coffee as long as he lived, and then Lily, she made it, and then Aunt Abby made it. I don't believe I can make coffee, Miss Anderson. You can make it or go without just as you please, says I. Ain't Aunt Abby going to get up, says she. I guess she won't get up, says I, sick as she is. I was getting madder and madder. There was something about that little pink and white thing standing there and talking about coffee when she had killed so many better folks than she was and had just killed another that made me feel most as if I wished somebody would up and kill her before she had a chance to do any more harm. Is Aunt Abby sick? says Luella, as if she was sort of aggrieved and injured. Yes, says I, she's sick and she's going to die and then you'll be left alone and you'll have to do for yourself and wait on yourself or do without things. I don't know, but I was sort of hard, but it was the truth. And if I was any harder than Luella Miller had been, I'll give up. I ain't never been sorry that I said it. Well, Luella, she up, and she had hysterics at that, and I just let her have them. All I did was bundle her into the room on the other side of the entry where Aunt Abby couldn't hear. If she weren't past it, I don't know how she was, and set her down hard in a chair and told her not to come back into the other room, and she minded. She had her hysterics in there till she got tired. When she found out that nobody was coming to coddle her and do for her, she stopped. At least I suppose she did. I had all I could with poor Aunt Abby trying to keep the breath of life in her. The doctor had told me that she was dreadful low and gave me some very strong medicine to give to her in drops real often and told me real particular about the nourishment. Well, I did as he told me, real faithful, till she weren't able to swallow any longer. Then I had her daughter sent for. I had begun to realize that she wouldn't last any time at all. I hadn't realized it before, though I spoke to Luella the way I did. The doctor, he came, and Mrs. Sam Abbott. But when she got there, it was too late. Her mother was dead. Aunt Abby's daughter just gave one look at her mother laying there. Then she turned sort of sharp and sudden and looked at me. Where is she, says she, and I knew she meant Luella. She's out in the kitchen, says I. She's too nervous to see folks die. She's afraid it will make her sick. The doctor, he speaks up then. He was a young fellow. Old Dr. Park had died the year before, and this was a young fellow just out of college. Mrs. Miller is not strong, says he, kind of severe, and she is quite right in not agitating herself. You are another young man. She's got her pretty claw on you, thinks I. But I didn't say anything to him. I just said over to Mrs. Sam Abbott that Luella was in the kitchen, and Mrs. Sam Abbott, she went out there, and I went too, and I never heard anything like the way she talked to Luella Miller. I felt pretty hard to Luella myself, but this was more than I ever would have dared say. Luella, she was too scared to go into hysterics. She just flopped. She seemed to just shrink away to nothing in that kitchen chair with Mrs. Sam Abbott standing over her and talking and telling her the truth. I guess the truth was most too much for her, and no mistake, because Luella presently actually did faint away, and there weren't any sham about it, the way I always suspected there was about them hysterics. She fainted dead away, and we had to lay her flat on the floor, and the doctor, he came running out, and he said something about a weak heart, dreadful fierce to Mrs. Sam Abbott but she weren't a mite scared. She faced him just as white as even Luella was laying there looking like death and the doctor feeling of her pulse. Weak heart, says she, weak heart, weak fiddlesticks. There ain't nothing weak about that woman. She's got strength enough to hang on to other folks till she kills him. Weak? It was my poor mother that was weak. This woman killed her as much as if she had taken a knife to her. But the doctor, he didn't pay much attention. He was bending over Luella, laying there with her yellow hair all a-streaming, and her pretty pink and white face all pale, and her blue eyes like stars gone out. And he was holding onto her hand and smoothing her forward and telling me to get the brandy in Aunt Abby's room. And I was sure as I wanted to be that Luella had got somebody else to hang on to. Now Aunt Abby was gone. And I thought of poor Rastus Miller. And I sort of pitied the poor young doctor, led away by a pretty face, and I made up my mind I'd see what I could do. I waited till Aunt Abby had been dead and buried about a month, and the doctor was going to see Luella steady, and folks were beginning to talk. 
Then one evening, when I knew the doctor had been called out of town and wouldn't be round, I went over to Luella's. I found her all dressed up in a blue muslin with white polka dots on and her hair curled just as pretty, and there weren't a young girl in the place could compare with her. There was something about Luella Miller seemed to draw the heart right out of you, but she didn't draw it out of me. She was set and rocking in the chair by her setting room window, and Maria Brown had gone home. Maria Brown had been in to help her, or rather to do the work, for Luella weren't helped when she didn't do anything. Maria Brown was real capable, and she didn't have any ties. She weren't married and lived alone, so she'd offered. I couldn't see why she should do the work any more than Luella. She weren't any too strong, but she seemed to think she could, and Luella seemed to think so too. So she went over and did all the work, washed and ironed and baked, while Luella sat and rocked. Maria didn't live long afterward. She began to fade away just the same fashion the others had. Well, she was warned, but she acted real mad when folks said anything, said Luella was a poor, abused woman, too delicate to help herself, and they ought to be ashamed, and if she died helping that couldn't help themselves, she would, and she did. I suppose Maria has gone home, says I to Luella, when I had gone in and sat down opposite her. Yes, Maria went half an hour ago after she got supper and washed the dishes, says Luella in her pretty way. I suppose she has got a lot of work to do in her own house tonight, says I, kind of bitter. But that was all thrown away on Luella Miller. It seemed to her right that other folks that weren't any better able than she was herself should wait on her. And she couldn't get it through her head that anybody should think it weren't right. Yes, yeah, says Luella, real sweet and pretty. Yes, yeah, she said. She had to do her washing tonight. She has let it go for a fortnight, along of coming over here. Why don't you stay home and do her washing instead of coming over here and doing your work, when you're just as well able and enough sight more so than she is, says I. Then Luella, she looked at me like a baby who has a rattle and shook it. She sort of laughed as innocent as you please. Oh, I can't do the work myself, Miss Anderson, says she. I never did. Maria has to do it. Then I spoke out. Has to do it, says I. Has to do it? She don't have to do it either. Maria Brown has her own home and enough to live on. She ain't beholden to you to come over here and slave for you and kill herself. Luella, she just sat and stared at me for all the world like a doll baby that was so abused that it was coming to life. Yes, says I, she's killing herself. She's going to die just the way Erastus did. And Lily and your Aunt Abby, you're killing her just as you did them. I don't know what there is about you, but you seem to bring a curse, says I. You kill everybody that is fool enough to care anything about you and do for you. She stared at me, and she was pretty pale. And Maria ain't the only one you're going to kill, says I. You're going to kill Dr. Malcolm before you're done with him. Then a red color came flaming all over her face. I ain't going to kill him either, says she, and she began to cry. Yes, you be, says I. Then I spoke as I never spoke before. You see, I felt it on account of Erastus. I told her that she hadn't any business to think of another man after she'd been married to one that had died for her, that she was a dreadful woman, and she was. That's true enough, but sometimes I have wondered lately if she knew it, if she weren't like a baby with scissors in its hand, cutting everybody without knowing what it was doing. Luella, she kept getting paler and paler, and she never took her eyes off my face. There was something awful about the way that she looked at me and never spoke one word. After a while, I quit talking and I went home. I watched that night, but her lamp went out before nine o'clock. And when Dr. Malcolm came driving past and sort of slowed up, he see there weren't any light, and he drove along. I saw her sort of shy out of meeting the next Sunday, too, so he shouldn't go home with her. And I was begun to think maybe she did have some conscience after all. It was only a week after that that Maria Brown died, sort of sudden at the last though everybody had seen it was coming. Well, then there was a good deal of feeling and pretty dark whispers. Folks said the days of witchcraft had come again, and they were pretty shy of Luella. She acted sort of offish to the doctor, and he didn't go there, and there weren't anybody to do anything for her. I don't know how she did get along. I wouldn't go in there and offer to help her, not because I was afraid of dying like the rest, but I thought she was just as well able to do her own work. And I was to do it for her, and I thought it was about time that she did it and stopped killing other folks. But it weren't very long before folks began to say that Luella herself was going into decline, just the way her husband and Lily and Aunt Abby and the others had. And I saw myself that she looked pretty bad. 
I used to see her going past in the store with a bundle, as if she could hardly crawl. But I remembered how Erastus used to wait and tend when he couldn't hardly put one foot before the other, and I didn't go out to help her. But at last one afternoon I saw the doctor come driving up like mad with his medicine chest, and Mrs. Babbitt came in after supper and said that Luella was real sick. I'd offer to go in and nurse her, says she, but I've got my children to consider, and maybe it ain't true what they say, but it's queer how many folks that have done for her have died. I didn't say anything, but I considered how she had been Erastus's wife and how he had set his eyes by her, and I made up my mind to go in the next morning, unless she was better, and see what I could do. But the next morning I see her at the window, and pretty soon she came stepping out as spry as you please. And a little while afterward, Mrs. Babbitt came in and told me the doctor had got a girl from out of town, a Sarah Jones, to come there, and she said she was pretty sure that the doctor was going to marry Luella. I saw him kiss her in the door that night myself, and I knew it was true. The woman came that afternoon, and the way she flew around was a caution. I don't believe Luella had swept since Maria died. She swept and dusted and washed and ironed, Wet clothes and dusters and carpets were flying all over there all day, and every time Luella set her foot out when the doctor weren't there, there was that Sarah Jones helping of her up and down the steps, as if she hadn't learned to walk. Well, everybody knew that Luella and the doctor were going to be married, but it wasn't long before they began to talk about his looking so poorly, just as they had about the others, and they talked about Sarah Jones, too. Well, the doctor did die, and he wanted to be married first, so as to leave what little he had to Luella. But he died before the minister could get there, and Sarah Jones died a week afterwards. Well, that wound up everything for Luella Miller. Not another soul in the whole town would lift a finger for her. There got to be a sort of panic. Then she began to droop in good earnest. She used to have to go to the store herself, for Mrs. Babbitt was afraid to let Tommy go for her. And I've seen her going past and stopping every two or three feet to rest. Well, I stood it as long as I could, but one day I see her coming with her arms full and stopping to lean against the back Babbitt fence. And I run out and took her bundles and carried them to her house. Then I went home and never spoke one word to her, though she called after me dreadful kind of pitiful. Well, that night I was taken sick with a chill, and I was sick as I wanted to be for two weeks. Mrs. Babbitt had seen me run out to help Luella, and she came in and told me I was going to die on account of it. I didn't know whether I was or not, but I considered I had done right by Erastus' wife. That last two weeks, Luella, she had a dreadful hard time, I guess. She was pretty sick, and as near as I could make out, nobody dared go near her. I don't know as she was really needing anything very much, for there was enough to eat in her house, and it was warm weather, and she made out to cook a little flour gruel every day, I know. But I guess she had a hard time, she that had been so petted and done for all her life. When I got so I could go out, I went over there one morning. Mrs. Babbitt had just come in to say she hadn't seen any smoke, and she didn't know that it was somebody's duty to go in, but she couldn't help thinking of her children, and got right up, though I hadn't been out of the house for two weeks, and I went in there, and Luella, she was a-laying on the bed, and she was dying. She lasted all that day and into the night, but I sat there after the new doctor had gone away. Nobody else dared to go there. It was about midnight that I left her for a minute to run home and get some medicine I had been taken, for I began to feel rather bad. It was a full moon that night, and just as I started out of my door to cross the street back to Luella's, I stopped short, for I saw something. Lydia Anderson, at this juncture, always said with a certain defiance that she did not expect to believe, be believed, and then proceeded in a hushed tone. I saw what I saw, and I know I saw it, and I will swear on my deathbed that I saw it. I saw Luella Miller, and Erastus Miller, and Lily, and Aunt Abby, and Maria, and the doctor, and Sarah, all going out of her door, and all but Luella shone white in the moonlight, and they were all helping her along till she seemed to fairly fly in the midst of them. Then it all disappeared. I stood a minute with my heart pounding, then I went over there. I thought of going for Mrs. Babbitt, but I thought she'd be afraid, so I went alone, though I knew what had happened. Luella was laying real peaceful, dead on her bed. This was a story that the old woman Lydia Anderson told. But the sequel was told by the folks who survived her, and this is the tale which has become folklore in the village. Lydia Anderson died when she was 87. She had continued wonderfully hale and hearty for one of her years until about two weeks before her death. 
One bright moonlit evening, she was sitting beside a window in her parlor when she made a sudden exclamation, and she was out of the house and across the street before the neighbor who was taking care of her could stop her. She followed as fast as possible and found Lydia Anderson stretched on the ground before the door of Luella Miller's deserted house, and she was quite dead. The next night, there was a red gleam of fire all forth the moonlight, and the old house of Luella Miller was burned to the ground. Nothing is now left of it except a few old cellar stones and a lilac bush, and in summer a helpless trail of morning glories among the weeds, which might be considered emblematic of Luella herself. End of Luella Miller by Mary Wilkins. Recording by Margaret Luttrell. The Glamour of the Snow by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Glamour of the Snow by Algernon Blackwood. 1. Hibbert, always conscious of two worlds, was in this mountain village conscious of three. It lay on the slopes of the Valley Alps and he had taken a room in the little post office where he could be at peace to write his book yet at the same time enjoy the winter sports and find companionship in the hotels when he wanted it the three worlds that met and mingled here seemed to his imaginative temperament very obvious though it is doubtful if another mind less intuitively equipped would have seen them so well defined there was the world of tourist english civilized quasi-educated, to which he belonged by birth. At any rate, there was the world of peasants to which he felt himself drawn by sympathy, for he loved and admired their toiling, simple life. And there was this other, which he could only call the world of nature. To this last, however, in virtue of a vehement poetic imagination and a tumultuous pagan instinct, fed by his very blood, he felt that most of him belonged the others borrowed from it as it were for visits here with the soul of nature hid his central life between all three was conflict potential conflict on the skating rink each sunday the tourists regarded the natives as intruders in the church the peasants plainly questioned why do you come we are here to worship you to stare and whisper for neither of these two worlds accepted the other and neither did nature except the visitors for it took advantage of their least mistakes and indeed even of the peasant world accepted only those who were strong and bold enough to invade her savage domain with sufficient skill to protect themselves from several forms of death now hibbert was keenly aware of this potential conflict and want of harmony he felt outside yet caught by it torn in the three directions because he was partly of each world, but wholly in only one. There grew in him a constant subtle effort, or at least desire, to unify them and decide positively to which he should belong and live in. The attempt, of course, was largely subconscious. It was the natural instinct of a richly imaginative nature, seeking the point of equilibrium, so that the mind could feel at peace, and his brain be free to do good work. Among the guests, no one especially claimed his interest. The men were nice, but undistinguished, athletic schoolmasters, doctors snatching a holiday, good fellows all. The women equally various, the clever, the would-be fast, the dare-to-be dull, the women who understood, and the usual pack of jolly dancing girls and flappers. And Hibbert, with his forty-odd years of thick experience behind him, got on well with the lot. He understood them all. They belonged to the definite, predigested types that are the same the world over, and that he had met the world over long ago. But to none of them did he belong. His nature was too multiple to subscribe to the set of shibboleths of any one class. And since all liked him and felt that somehow he seemed outside of them, spectator, looker-on, all sought to claim him. In a sense, therefore, the three worlds fought for him, natives, tourists, nature. It was thus began the singular conflict for the soul of Hibbert. In his own soul, however, 
it took place. Neither the peasants nor the tourists were conscious that they fought for anything. And nature, they say, is merely blind and automatic. The assault upon him of the peasants may be left out of account, for it is obvious that they stood no chance of success. The tourist world, however, made a gallant effort to subdue him to themselves. But the evenings in the hotel, when dancing was not in order, were English. The provincial imagination was set upon a throne and worshipped heavily through incense of the stupidest conventions possible. Hibbert used to go back early to his room in the post office to work. It is a mistake on my part to have realized that there is any conflict at all, he thought, as he crunched home over the snow at midnight after one of the dances. It would have been better to have kept outside at all and done my work. Better he added, looking back, down the silent village street to the church tower, and safer. The adjective slipped from his mind before he was aware of it. He turned with an involuntary start and looked about him. He knew perfectly well what it meant. This thought that had thrust its head up from the instinctive region. He understood without being able to express it fully, the meaning that betrayed itself in the choice of the adjective. For if he had ignored the existence of this conflict, he would at the same time have remained outside the arena, whereas now he had entered the lists. Now this battle for his soul must have issue, and he knew that the spell of nature was greater for him than all other spells in the world combined, greater than love, revelry, pleasure, greater even than study. He had always been afraid to let himself go. His pagan soul dreaded her terrific powers of witchery, even while he worshipped. The little village already slept. The world lay smothered in snow. The chalet roofs shone white beneath the moon, and pitch-black shadows gathered against the walls of the church. His eye rested a moment on the square stone tower with its frosted cross that pointed to the sky then travelled with a leap of many thousand feet to the enormous mountains that brushed the brilliant stars. Like a forest rose the huge peaks above the slumbering village, measuring the night and heavens. They beckoned him. And something born of the snowy desolation, born of the midnight and the silent grandeur, born of the great listening hollows of the night, something lay twixt terror and wonder, dropped from the vast wintry spaces down into his heart and called him very softly, unrecorded in any word or thought his brain could compass, it laid its spell upon him. Fingers of snow brushed the surface of his heart. The power and quiet majesty of the winter's night appalled him. Fumbling a moment with the big unwieldy key, he let himself in and went upstairs to bed. Two thoughts went with him, apparently quite ordinary and sensible ones. What fools these peasants are to sleep through such a night! and the other. Those dances tire me. I'll never go again. My work only suffers in the morning. The claims of peasants and tourists upon him seemed thus in a single instant weakened. The clash of battle troubled half his dreams. Nature had sent her beauty of the night and won the first assault. The others, routed and dismayed, fled far away. 2. Don't go back to your dreary old post office. We're going to have supper in my room, something hot. Come and join us. Hurry up. There had been an ice carnival, and the last party, tailing up the snow slope to the hotel, called him. The Chinese lanterns smoked and sputtered on the wires. The band had long since gone. The cold was bitter, and the moon came only momentarily between high driving clouds. From the shed, where the people changed from skates to snow boots, he shouted something to the effect that he was following. But no answer came. The moving shadows of those who had called were already merged high up against the village darkness. The voices died away. Doors slammed. Hibbert found himself alone on the deserted rink. And it was then, quite suddenly, the impulse came to stay and skate alone. The thoughts of the stuffy hotel room and of those noisy people with their obvious jokes and laughter, oppressed him. He felt a longing to be alone with the night, to taste her wonder all by himself, there beneath the stars, gliding over the ice. It was not yet midnight, 
and he could skate for half an hour. That supper party, if they noticed his absence at all, would merely think he had changed his mind and gone to bed. It was an impulse, yes, and not an unnatural one. Yet even at the time it struck him that something more than impulse lay concealed behind it. More than invitation, yet certainly less than command. There was a vague, queer feeling that he stayed because he had to, almost as though there was something he had forgotten, overlooked, left undone. Imaginative temperaments are often thus, and impulse is ever weakness. For with such ill-considered opening of the doors to hasty action, may come an invasion of other forces at the same time, forces merely waiting their opportunity, perhaps. He caught the fugitive warning even while he dismissed it as absurd, and the next minute he was whirling over the smooth ice in delightful curves and loops beneath the moon. There was no fear of collision. He could take his own speed and space as he willed. The shadows of the towering mountains fell across the rink, and a wind of ice came from the forest where the snow lay ten feet deep. The hotel lights winked and went out. The village slept. The high-wire netting could not keep out the wonder of the winter night that grew about him like a presence. He skated on and on, keen, exhilarating pleasure in his tingling blood, and weariness all forgotten. And then, midway in the delight of rushing movement, he saw a figure gliding behind the wire netting, watching him. With a start that almost made him lose his balance, for the abruptness of the new arrival was so unlooked for, he paused and stared. Although the light was dim, he made out that it was the figure of a woman, and she was feeling her way along the netting, trying to get in. Against the white background of the snowfield, he watched her rather stealthy efforts as she passed with a silent step over the banked up snow. She was tall and slim and graceful. He could see that, even in the dark. And then, of course, he understood. It was another adventurous skater like himself, stolen down unawares from hotel or chalet, and searching for the opening. At once, making a sign and pointing with one hand, he turned swiftly and skated over to the little entrance on the other side. But even before he got there, there was a sound on the ice behind him, and, with an exclamation of amazement he could not suppress, he turned to see her swerving up to his side, crossing the width of the rink. She had somehow found another way in. Hibbert, as a rule, was punctilious, and in these free and easy places perhaps especially so. If only for his own protection, he did not seek to make advances unless some kind of introduction paved the way. But for these two to skate together in the semi-darkness without speech, often of necessity brushing shoulders almost, was too absurd to think of. Accordingly, he raised his cap and spoke. His actual words he seemed unable to recall, nor what the girl said in reply, except that she answered him in accented English, with some commonplace about doing figures at midnight on an empty rink. Quite natural it was, and right. She wore grey clothes of some kind, though not the customary long gloves or sweater, for indeed her hands were bare, and presently when he skated with her, he wondered with something like astonishment at their dry and icy coldness. And she was delicious to skate with, supple, sure, and light, fast as a man, yet with the freedom of a child, sinuous and steady, at the same time. Her flexibility made him wonder, and when he asked where she had learned, she murmured. He caught the breath against his ear, and recalled later that it was singularly cold, that she could hardly tell for she had been accustomed to the ice ever since she could remember. But her face he never properly saw. A muffler of white fur buried her neck to the ears, and her cap came down over her eyes. He only saw that she was young. Nor could he gather her hotel or chalet, for she vaguely pointed when he asked her, up the slopes. Just over there, she said, quickly taking his hand again. He did not press her. No doubt she wished to hide her escapade, and the touch of her hand thrilled him more than anything he could remember. Even through his thick glove he felt the softness of that cold and delicate softness. The clouds thickened over the mountains. It grew darker. They talked very little, and did not always skate together. Often they separated, curving about in corners by themselves, 
but always coming together again in the centre of the rink. And when she left him, thus, Hibbert was conscious of, yes, of missing her. He found a peculiar satisfaction, almost a fascination, in skating by her side. It was quite an adventure, these two strangers, with the ice and snow and night. Midnight had long since sounded from the old church tower before they parted. She gave the sign, and he skated quickly to the shed, meaning to find a seat and help her take her skates off. Yet, when he turned, she had already gone. He saw her slim figure gliding away across the snow, and hurrying for the last time round the rink alone, he searched in vain for the opening she had twice used in this curious way. How very queer, he thought, referring to the wire netting. She must have lifted it and wriggled under. Wondering how in the world she managed it, what in the world had possessed him to be so free with her, and who in the world she was, he went up the steep slope to the post office and so to bed, her promise to come again another night still ringing delightfully in his ears. And curious were the thoughts and sensations that accompanied him. Most of all, perhaps, was the half-suggestion of some dim memory that he had known this girl before, had met her somewhere, more, that she knew him. For in her voice, a low, soft, windy little voice it was, tender and soothing for all its quiet coldness, there lay some faint reminder of two others he had known, both long since gone, the voice of the woman he had loved, and the voice of his mother. But this time, through his dreams, there ran no clash of battle. He was conscious, rather, of something cold and clinging that made him think of sifting snowflakes climbing slowly with entangling touch and thickness round his feet. The snow coming without noise, each flake so light and tiny, none can mark the spot whereon it settles, yet the mass of it able to smother whole villages wove through the very texture of his mind, cold, bewildering, deadening effort, with its clinging network of ten million feathery touches. 3. In the morning Hibbert realized he had done perhaps a foolish thing, the brilliant sunshine that drenched the valley made him see this, and the sight of his work-table, with its typewriter, books, papers, and the rest, brought additional conviction. To have skated with a girl alone at midnight, no matter how innocently the thing had come about, was unwise, unfair, especially to her. Gossip in these little winter resorts was much was worse than in a provincial town. He hoped no one had seen them. Luckily the night had been dark. Most likely none had heard the ring of skates. Deciding that in future he would be more careful, he plunged into work and sought to dismiss the matter from his mind. But in his times of leisure the memory returned persistently to haunt him. When he skied, luged, or danced in the evenings, and especially when he skated on the little rink, he was aware that the eyes of his mind forever sought this strange companion of the night. A hundred times he fancied that he saw her, but always a sight deceived him. Her face he might not know, but he could hardly fail to recognize her figure. Yet nowhere among the others did he catch a glimpse of that slim young creature he had skated with alone beneath the clouded stars. He searched in vain. Even his inquiries as to the occupants of the private chalets brought no results. He had lost her. But the queer thing was that he felt as though she were somewhere close. He knew that she had not really gone. While people came and left with every day, it never once occurred to him that she had left. On the contrary, he felt assured that they would meet again. This thought he never quite acknowledged. Perhaps it was the wish that fathered it only. And even when he did meet her, it was a question of how he would speak and claim acquaintance, or whether she would recognize himself. It might be awkward, he almost came to dread a meeting, though dread, of course, was far too strong a word to describe an emotion that was half delight, half wondering anticipation. Meanwhile the season was in full swing. Hibbert felt in perfect health, worked hard, skied, skated, luged, and at night danced fairly often, in spite of his decision. This dancing was, however, an act of subconscious surrender. It really meant he hoped to find her among the whirling couples. He was searching for her without quite acknowledging it to himself. And the hotel world, meanwhile, thinking it had won him over, teased and chafed him. 
he made excuses in a similar vein but all the time he watched and searched and waited for several days the sky held clear and bright and frosty bitterly cold everything crisp and sparkling in the sun but there was no sign of fresh snow and the skiers began to grumble on the mountains was an ice crust that made running dangerous they wanted the frozen dry and powdery snow that makes for speed renders steering easier and falling less severe but the keen east wind showed no signs of changing for a whole ten days then suddenly there came a touch of softer air and the weather wise began to prophesy hibbert who was delicately sensitive to the least change in earth or sky was perhaps the first to feel it only he did not prophesy he knew through every nerve in his body that moisture had crept into the air was accumulating and that presently a fall would come for he responded to the moods of nature like a fine barometer and knowledge this time brought into his heart a strange little wavered emotion that was hard to account for a feeling of unexplained uneasiness and disquieting joy for behind it woven through it rather ran a faint exhilaration that connected remotely somewhere with that touch of delicious alarm that tiny anticipating dread that so puzzled him when he thought of his next meeting with the skating companion of the night it lay beyond all words all telling this queer relationship between the two but somehow the girl and snow ran in a pair across his mind perhaps for imaginative writing men more than for other workers the smallest change of mood betrays itself at once his work at any rate revealed the slight shifting of emotional values in his soul not that his writing suffered but that it altered subtly as those changes of sky or sea or landscape that come with the passing of afternoon into evening imperceptibly a subconscious excitement sought to push outwards and express itself and knowing the uneven effect such moods produced in his work he laid his pen aside and took instead to reading that he had to do meanwhile the brilliance passed from the sunshine the sky grew slowly overcast by dusk the mountain tops came singularly close and sharp the distant valley rose into absurdly near perspective the moisture increased rapidly approaching saturation point when it must fall in snow hibbert watched and waited and in the morning the world lay smothered beneath its fresh white carpet it snowed heavily till noon thickly incessantly chokingly a foot or more then the sky cleared the sun came out in splendor the wind shifted back to the east and frost came down upon the mountains with its keenest and most biting tooth the drop in the temperature was tremendous but the skiers were jubilant next day the running would be fast and perfect already the mass was settling and the surface freezing into those moss-like powdery crystals that make the ski run almost of their own accord and with a faint sishing as of a bird's wings through the air four that night there was excitement in the little hotel world first because there was a bal costume but chiefly because the new snow had come and hibbert went felt drawn to go he did not go in costume but he wanted to talk about the slopes and skiing with the other men and at the same time ah there was the truth the deeper necessity that called for the singular connection between the stranger and the snow again betrayed itself utterly beyond explanation as before but vital and insistent some hidden instinct in his pagan soul heaven knows how he phrased it even to himself if he phrased it at all whispered that with the snow the girl would be somewhere about would emerge from her hiding place would even look for him absolutely unwarranted it was he laughed while he stood before the little glass and trimmed his moustache trying to make his black tie sit straight and shook down his dinner jacket so that it should lie upon the shoulders without a crease his brown eyes were very bright i look younger than i usually do he thought it was unusual even significant in a man who had no vanity about his appearance and certainly never questioned his age or tried to look younger than he was affairs of the heart with one tumultuous exception that left no fuel for lesser subsequent fires had never troubled him 
the forces of his soul and mind not called upon for work and obvious duties all went to nature the desolate wild places of the earth were what he loved night and the beauty of the stars and snow and this evening he felt their claims upon him mightily stirring a rising wildness caught his blood quickened his pulse woke longing and passion too but chiefly snow the snow whirred softly through his thoughts like white seductive dreams for the snow had come and she it seemed had somehow come with it into his mind and yet he stood there before that twisted mirror and pulled his tie and coat askew a dozen times as though it mattered what in the world is up with me he thought then laughing a little he turned before leaving the room to put his private papers in order the green morocco desk that held them he took down from the shelf and laid upon the table tied to the lid was the visiting card with his brother's london address in case of accident on the way down to the hotel he wondered why he had done this for though imaginative he was not the kind of man who dealt in presentiments moods with him were strong but ever held in leash it's almost like a warning he thought smiling he drew his thick coat tightly round the throat as the freezing air bit at him those warnings one reads off in stories sometimes a delicious happiness was in his blood over the edge of the hills across the valley rose the moon he saw her silver sheet the world of snow snow covered all it smothered sound and distance it smothered houses streets and human beings it smothered life five in the hall there was light and bustle people were already arriving from other hotels and chalets their costumes hidden beneath many wraps groups of men in evening dress stood about smoking talking snow and skiing the band was tuning up the claims of the hotel world clashed about him faintly as of old at the big glass windows of the veranda peasants stopped a moment on their way home from the cafe to peer hibbert thought laughingly of that conflict he used to imagine he laughed because it suddenly seemed so unreal he belonged so utterly to nature and the mountains and especially to those desolate slopes where now the snow lay thick and fresh and sweet that there was no question of a conflict at all the power of the newly fallen snow had caught him proving it without effort out there upon those lonely reaches of the moonlit ridges the snow lay ready masses and masses of it cool soft inviting he longed for it it awaited him he thought of the intoxicating delight of skiing in the moonlight then somehow in vivid flashing vision he thought of it while he stood there smoking with the other men and talking all the shop of skiing and ever mysteriously blended with this power of the snow poured also through his inner being the power of the girl he could not disabuse his mind of the insinuating presence of the two together he remembered that queer skating impulse of ten days ago the impulse that had let her in that any mind even an imaginative one could pass beneath the sway of such a fancy was strange enough and hibbert while fully aware of the disorder yet found a curious joy in yielding to it this insubordinate centre that drew him towards old pagan beliefs had assumed command with a kind of sensuous pleasure he let himself be conquered and snow that night seemed in everybody's thoughts the dancing couples talked of it the hotel proprietors congratulated one another it meant good sport and satisfied their guests every one was planning trips and expeditions talking of slopes and telemarks of flying speed and distance of drifts and crust and frost vitality and enthusiasm pulsed in the very air all were alert and active positive radiating currents of creative life even into the stuffy atmosphere of that crowded ballroom and the snow had caused it the snow had brought it all this discharge of eager sparkling energy was due primarily to the snow but in the mind of hibbert by some swift alchemy of his pagan yearnings this energy became transmuted it rarefied itself gleaming in white and crystal currents of passionate anticipation which he transferred as by a species of electrical imagination into the personality of the girl the girl of the snow 
she somehow was waiting for him expecting him calling to him softly from those leagues of moonlit mountain he remembered the touch of that cool dry hand the soft and icy breath against his cheek the hush and softness of her presence in the way she came and the way she had gone again like a flurry of snow the wind sent gliding up the slopes she like himself belonged out there he fancied that he heard her little windy voice come sifting to him through the snowy branches of the trees calling his name that haunting little voice that dived straight to the centre of his life as once long years ago two other voices used to do but nowhere among the costumed dancers did he see her slender figure he danced with one and all distrait and absent a stupid partner as each girl discovered his eyes ever turning towards the door and windows hoping to catch the luring face the vision the vision that did not come and at length hoping even against hope for the ballroom thinned groups left one by one going home to their hotels and chalets the band tired obviously people sat drinking lemon squashes at the little tables the men mopping their foreheads everybody ready for bed it was close on midnight as hibbert passed through the hall to get his overcoat and snow boots he saw men in the passage by the sport room greasing their ski against an early start knapsack luncheons were being ordered by the kitchen swing doors he sighed lighting a cigarette a friend offered him he returned a confused reply to some question as to whether he could join their party in the morning it seemed he did not hear it properly he passed through the outer vestibule between the double glass doors and went into the night the man who asked the question watched him go an expression of anxiety momentarily in his eyes do you think he heard you said one laughing you've got to shout to hibbert his mind's so full of his work he works too hard suggested the first full of queer ideas and dreams but hibbert's silence was not rudeness he had not caught the invitation that was all the call of the hotel world had faded he no longer heard it another wilder call was sounding in his ears for up the street he had seen a little figure moving close against the shadow of the baker's shop it glided white slim enticing six and at once into his mind passed the hush and softness of the snow yet with it a searching crying wildness for the heights he knew by some incalculable swift instinct she would not meet him in the village street it was not there amid crowding houses she would speak to him indeed already she had disappeared melted from view up the white vista of the moonlit road yonder he divined she waited where the highway narrowed abruptly into the mountain path beyond the chalets it did not even occur to him to hesitate mad though it seemed and was the sudden craving for the heights with her at least for open spaces where the snow lay thick and fresh it was too imperious to be denied he does not remember going up to his room putting the sweater over his evening clothes and getting into the fur gauntlet gloves and the helmet cap of wool most certainly he had no recollection of fastening on his key he must have done it automatically some faculty of normal observation was in abeyance as it were his mind was out beyond the village out with the snowy mountains and the moon henri de fargo putting up the shutters over his cafe windows saw him pass and wondered mildly a monsieur qui fait du ski à cette heure il est anglais don he shrugged his shoulders as though a man had the right to choose his own way of death and martha perotti the hunchback wife of the shoemaker looking by chance from her window caught his figure moving swiftly up the road she had other thoughts for she knew and believed the old traditions of the witches and snow beings that steal the souls of men she had even heard twas said the dreaded synagogue passed roaring down the street at night and now as then she hid her eyes they've called to him and he must go she murmured making the sign of the cross but no one sought to stop him hibbert recalls only a single incident until he found himself beyond the houses searching for her along the fringe of forest where the moonlight met the snow in a bewildering frieze of fantastic shadows 
and the incident was simply this, that he remembered passing the church. Catching the outline of its tower against the stars, he was aware of a faint sense of hesitation. A vague uneasiness came and went, jarred unpleasantly across the flow of his excited feelings, chilling exhilaration. He caught the instant's discord, dismissed it, and passed on. The seduction of the snow smothered the hint before he realized that it had brushed the skirts of warning. And then he saw her. She stood there, waiting in a little clear space of shining snow, dressed all in white, part of the moonlight in the glistening background, her slender figure just discernible. I waited, for I knew you would come. The silvery little voice of windy beauty flowed down to him. You had to come. I am ready, he answered. I knew it, too. The world of nature caught him to its heart in those few words, the wonder and the glory of the night and snow. Life leaped within him. The passion of his pagan soul exulted, rose in joy, flowed out to her. He neither reflected nor considered, but let himself go, like the veriest schoolboy in the wildness of first love. Give me your hand, he cried. I'm coming. A little farther on, a little higher, came her delicious answer. Here it is too near the village and the church. And the words seemed wholly right and natural. He did not dream of questioning them. He understood that, with this little touch of civilization in sight, the familiarity he suggested was impossible. Once out upon the open mountains, mid the freedom of huge slopes and towering peaks, the stars and moon to witness, and the wilderness of snow to watch, they could taste an innocence of happy intercourse, free from the dead conventions that imprison literal minds. He urged his pace, yet did not quite overtake her. The girl always kept just a little bit ahead of his best efforts. And soon they left the trees behind, and passed on to the enormous slopes of the sea of snow that rolled in mountainous terror and beauty to the stars. The wonder of the white world caught him away. Under the steady moonlight, it was more than haunting. It was a living, white, bewildering power that deliciously confused the senses and laid a spell of wild perplexity upon the heart. It was a personality that cloaked and yet revealed itself through all this sheeted whiteness of snow. It rose, went with him, fled before and followed after. Slowly it dropped lithe, gleaming arms about his neck, gathering him in. Certainly some soft persuasion coaxed his very soul, urging him ever forwards, upwards, on towards the higher icy slopes. Judgment and reason left their throne, it seemed, completely, as in the madness of intoxication. The girl, slim and seductive, kept always just ahead, so that he never quite came up with her. He saw the white enchantment of her face and figure, something that streamed about her neck flying like a wreath of snow in the wind, and heard the alluring accents of her whispering voice that called from time to time. A little farther on, a little higher, then we'll run home together. Sometimes he saw her hand stretched out to find his own, but each time, just as he came with her, he saw her still in front the hand and arm withdrawn. They took a gentle angle of ascent. The toil seemed nothing. In this crystal, wine-like air, fatigue vanished. The sishing of the ski through the powdery surface of the snow was the only sound that broke the stillness. This, with his breathing and the rustle of her skirts, was all he heard. Cold moonshine, snow and silence held the world. The sky was black, and the peaks beyond cut into it like frosted wedges of iron and steel. Far below the valley slept, the village long since hidden out of sight. He felt he could never tire. The sound of the church clock rose from time to time, faintly through the air, more and more distant. Give me your hand. It's time now to turn back. Just one more slope, she laughed. That ridge above us. Then we'll make for home and her low voice mingled pleasantly with the purring of her ski. His own seemed harsh and ugly by comparison. But I have never come so high before. It's glorious. 
this world of silent snow and moonlight, and you. You're a child of the snow, I swear. Let me come up closer to see your face and touch your little hand. Her laughter answered him. Come on, a little higher. Here we're quite alone together. It's magnificent, he cried. But why did you hide away so long? I've looked and searched for you in vain ever since we skated. He was going to say ten days ago, but the accurate memory of time had gone from him. He was not sure whether it was days or years or minutes. His thoughts of earth were scattered and confused. You look for me in the wrong places, he heard her murmur just above him. You looked in places where I never go. Hotels and houses kill me. I avoid them. She laughed, a fine, shrill, windy little laugh. I loathe them, too. He stopped. The girl had suddenly come quite close. A breath of ice passed through his very soul. She had touched him. But this awful cold, he cried out sharply, this freezing cold that takes me. The wind is rising. It's a wind of ice. Come, let us turn. But when he plunged forward to hold her, or at least to look, the girl was gone again. And something in the way she stood there, a few feet beyond, and stared down into his eyes so steadfastly in silence, made him shiver. The moonlight was behind her, but in some odd way he could not focus sight upon her face, although so close. The gleam of eyes he caught, but all the rest seemed white and snowy, as though he looked beyond her, out into space. The sound of the church bell came up faintly from the valley far below, and he counted the strokes. Five. A sudden curious weakness seized him as he listened. Deep within it was, deadly, yet somehow sweet, and hard to resist. He felt like sinking down upon the snow and lying there. They had been climbing for five hours. It was, of course, the warning of complete exhaustion. With a great effort he fought and overcame it. It passed away as suddenly as it came. We'll turn, he said, with a decision he hardly felt. It will be dawn before we reach the village again. Come at once. It's time for home. The sense of exhilaration had utterly left him. An emotion that was akin to fear swept coldly through him. But a whispering answer turned it instantly to terror. A terror that gripped him horribly and turned him weak and unresisting. Our home is here. A burst of wild, high laughter, loud and shrill, accompanied the words. It was like a whistling wind. The wind had risen, and clouds obscured the moon. A little higher, where we cannot hear the wicked bells, she cried, and for the first time seized him deliberately by the hand. She moved, was suddenly close against his face. Again she touched him. And Hibbert tried to turn away and escape and so trying found for the first time that the power of the snow, that other power which does not exhilarate but deadens effort, was upon him. The suffocating weakness that it brings to exhausted men, luring them to the sleep of death in her clinging soft embrace, lulling the will and conquering all desire for life, this was awfully upon him. His feet were heavy and entangled. He could not turn or move. The girl stood in front of him, very near. He felt her chilly breath upon his cheeks. Her hair passed blindingly across his eyes, and that icy wind came with her. He saw her whiteness close. Again, it seemed, his sight passed through her into space as though she had no face. Her arms were round his neck. She drew him softly downwards to his knees. He sank. He yielded utterly. He obeyed. Her weight was upon him, smothering, delicious. The snow was to his waist. She kissed him softly on the lips, the eyes, all over his face. And then she spoke his name in that voice of love and wonder, the voice that held the accent of two others, both taken over long ago by death, the voice of his mother and of the woman he had loved. He made one more feeble effort to resist, then, realizing even while he struggled 
that this soft weight about his heart was sweeter than anything life could ever bring, he let his muscles relax and sank back into the soft oblivion of the covering snow. Her wintry kisses bore him into sleep. 7. They say that men who know the sleep of exhaustion in the snow find no awakening on the hither side of death. The hours passed, and the moon sank down below the white world's rim. Then suddenly there came a little crash upon his breast and neck, and Hibbert woke. He slowly turned, bewildered, heavy eyes upon the desolate mountains, stared dizzily about him, tried to rise. At first his muscles would not act. A numbing, aching pain possessed him. He uttered a long, thin cry for help, and heard its faintness swallowed by the wind. And then he understood vaguely why he was only warm, not dead. For this very wind that took his cry had built up a sheltering mound of driven snow against his body while he slept. Like a curving wave it ran beside him. It was the breaking of its overtoppling edge that caused the crash, and the coldness of the mass against his neck that woke him. Dawn kissed the eastern sky. Pale gleams of gold shot every peak with splendor. But ice was in the air, and the dark and frozen snow blew like powder from the surface of the slopes. He saw the points of his ski projecting just below him. Then he remembered. It seems he had just strength enough to realize that, could he but rise and stand, he might fly with terrific impetus towards the woods and the village far beneath. The ski would carry him. But if he failed and fell... How he contrived it, Hibbert never knew. This fear of death somehow called out his whole available reserve force. He rose slowly, balanced a moment, then, taking the angle of an immense zigzag, started down the awful slopes like an arrow from a bow, and automatically the splendid muscles of the practiced skier and athlete saved and guided him, for he was hardly conscious of controlling either speed or direction. The snow stung face and eyes like fine steel shot. Ridge after ridge flew past. The summits raced across the sky. The valley leaped up with bounds to meet him. He scarcely felt the ground beneath his feet as the huge slopes and distance melted before the lightning speed of that descent from death to life. He took it in four mile-long zigzags, and it was the turning at each corner that nearly finished him. For then the strain of balancing taxed to the verge of collapse the remnants of his strength. Slopes that have taken hours to climb can be descended in a short half-hour on ski. But Hibbert had lost all count of time. Quite other thoughts and feelings mastered him in that wild, swift dropping through the air that was like the flight of a bird. For ever close upon his heels came following forms and voices with the whirling snow dust. He heard that little silvery voice of death and laughter at his back. Shrill and wild, with the whistling of the wind past his ears, he caught its pursuing tones. But in anger now, no longer soft and coaxing. And it was accompanied. She did not follow alone. It seemed a host of these flying figures of the snow chased madly just behind him. He felt them furiously smite his neck and cheeks, snatch at his hands and try to entangle his feet and ski in drifts. His eyes they blinded, and they caught his breath away. The terror of the heights and snow and winter desolation urged him forward in the maddest race with death a human being ever knew. And so terrific was the speed that before the gold and crimson had left the summits to touch the ice lips of the lower glaciers, he saw the friendly forest far beneath swing up and welcome him. And it was then, moving slowly along the edge of the woods, he saw a light. A man was carrying it. A procession of human figures was passing in a dark line laboriously through the snow. And he heard the sound of chanting. Instinctively, without a second's hesitation, he changed his course. No longer flying at an angle as before, he pointed his ski straight down the mountainside. The dreadful steepness did not frighten him. He knew full well it meant a crashing tumble at the bottom, but he also knew it meant a doubling of his speed, with safety at the end. For, though no definite thought passed through his mind, he understood that it was the village curé 
who carried that little gleaming lantern in the dawn and that he was taking the host to a chalet on the lower slopes to some peasant in extremis he remembered her terror of the church and bells she feared the holy symbols there was one last wild cry in his ears as he started a shriek of the wind before his face and a rush of stinging snow against closed eyelids and then he dropped through empty space speed took sight from him it seemed he flew off the surface of the world indistinctly he recalls the murmur of men's voices the touch of strong arms that lifted him and the shooting pain as the ski were unfastened from the twisted ankle for when he opened his eyes again to normal life he found himself lying in his bed at the post office with the doctor at his side but for years to come the story of mad hibbert's skiing at night is recounted in that mountain village he went it seems up slopes and to a height that no man in his senses ever tried before the tourists were agog about it for the rest of the season and the very same day two of the bolder men went over the actual ground and photographed the slopes later hibbert saw these photographs he noticed one curious thing about them though he did not mention it to any one there was only a single track end of the glamour of the snow by algernon blackwood read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama The Moonlit Road by Ambrose Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Moonlit Road by Ambrose Beers. 1. Statement of Joel Hetman, Jr. I am the most unfortunate of men rich respected fairly well educated and of sound health with many other advantages usually valued by those having them and coveted by those who have them not i sometimes think that i should be less unhappy if they had been denied me for then the contrast between my outer and my inner life would not be continually demanding a painful attention in the stress of privation and the need of effort i might sometimes forget the sombre secret ever baffling the conjecture that it compels i am the only child of joel and julia hetman the one was a well-to-do country gentleman the other a beautiful and accomplished woman to whom he was passionately attached with what i now know to have been a jealous and exacting devotion the family home was a few miles from nashville tennessee a large irregularly built dwelling of no particular order of architecture a little way off the road in a park of trees and shrubbery at the time of which i write i was nineteen years old a student at yale one day i received a telegram from my father of such urgency that in compliance with its unexplained demand I left at once for home. At the railway station in Nashville, a distant relative awaited me to apprise me of the reason for my recall. My mother had been barbarously murdered. Why and by whom, none could conjecture. But the circumstances were these. My father had gone to Nashville, intending to return the next afternoon. Something prevented his accomplishing the business in hand, so he returned on the same night, arriving just before the dawn. In his testimony before the coroner, he explained that having no latch-key and not caring to disturb the sleeping servants, he had, with no clearly defined intention, gone round to the rear of the house. As he turned an angle of the building, he heard a sound as of a door gently closed and saw in the darkness indistinctly the figure of a man which instantly disappeared among the trees of the lawn 
a hasty pursuit and brief search of the grounds in the belief that the trespasser was someone secretly visiting a servant proving fruitless he entered at the unlocked door and mounted the stairs to my mother's chamber its door was open and stepping into black darkness he fell headlong over some heavy object on the floor i may spare myself the details it was my poor mother dead of strangulation by human hands nothing had been taken from the house the servants had heard no sound and excepting those terrible finger marks upon the dead woman's throat dear god that i might forget them no trace of the assassin was ever found i gave up my studies and remained with my father who naturally was greatly changed always of a sedate taciturn disposition he now fell into so deep a dejection that nothing could hold his attention yet anything a footfall the sudden closing of a door aroused in him a fitful interest one might have called it an apprehension at any small surprise of the senses he would start visibly and sometimes turn pale then relapse into a melancholy apathy deeper than before i suppose he was what is called a nervous wreck as to me i was younger then than now there is much in that youth is gilead in which is balm for every wound ah that i might again dwell in that enchanted land unacquainted with grief i knew not how to appraise my bereavement i could not rightly estimate the strength of the stroke one night a few months after the dreadful event my father and i walked home from the city the full moon was about three hours above the eastern horizon the entire countryside had the solemn stillness of a summer night our footfalls and the ceaseless songs of the katydids were the only sound aloof black shadows of bordering trees lay athwart the road which in the short reaches between gleamed a ghostly white as we approached the gate to our dwelling whose front was in shadow and in which no light shone my father suddenly stopped and clutched my arm saying hardly above his breath god god what is that i hear nothing i replied but see see he said pointing along the road directly ahead i said nothing is there come father let us go in you are ill he had released my arm and was standing rigid and motionless in the centre of the illuminated roadway staring like one bereft of sense his face in the moonlight showed a pallor and fixity inexpressibly distressing i pulled gently at his sleeve but he had forgotten my existence presently he began to retire backward step by step never for an instant removing his eyes from what he saw or thought he saw i turned half round to follow but stood irresolute i do not recall any feeling of fear unless a sudden chill was its physical manifestation it seemed as if an icy wind had touched my face and enfolded my body from head to foot i could feel the stir of it in my hair at that moment my attention was drawn to a light that suddenly streamed from an upper window of the house one of the servants awakened by what mysterious premonition of evil who can say and in obedience to an impulse that she was never able to name had lit a lamp and when i turned to look for my father he was gone and in all the years that have passed no whisper of his fate had come across the borderland of conjecture from the realm of the unknown two statement of caspar grattan today i am set to live tomorrow here in this room will lie a senseless shape of clay that all too long was i if any one lift the cloth from the face of that unpleasant thing it will be in gratification of a mere morbid curiosity some doubtless will go further and inquire who was he in this writing i supply the only answer that i am able to make 
Caspar Grattan. Surely that should be enough. The name has served my small need for more than twenty years of a life of unknown length. True, I gave it to myself, but lacking another, I had the right. In this world one must have a name. It prevents confusion, even when it does not establish identity. Some, though, are known by numbers, which also seem inadequate distinctions. One day, for illustration, I was passing along a street of a city far from here, when I met two men in uniform, one of whom, half pausing and looking curiously into my face, said to his companion, That man looks like 767. Something in the number seemed familiar and horrible. Moved by an uncontrollable impulse, I sprang into a side street and ran until I fell exhausted in a country lane. I have never forgotten that number, and always it comes to memory attended by gibbering obscenity, peals of joyless laughter, the clang of iron doors. So I say a name, even if self-bestowed, is better than a number. In the register of the potter's field I shall soon have both. What wealth! Of him who shall find this paper I must beg a little consideration. It is not the history of my life, the knowledge to write that is denied me. This is only a record of broken and apparently unrelated memories, some of them as distinct and sequent as brilliant beads upon a thread, others remote and strange having the character of crimson dreams with interspaces blank and black, which fires glowing still and red in a great desolation. Standing upon the shore of eternity, I turn for a last look landward over the course by which I came. There are twenty years of footprints fairly distinct, the impressions of bleeding feet. They lead through poverty and pain, devious and unsure, as of one staggering beneath a burden. Remote, unfriended, melancholy, slow. Ah, the poet's prophecy of me, how admirable, how dreadfully admirable. Backward beyond the beginning of this Via Dolorosa, this epic of suffering with episodes of sin, I see nothing clearly. It comes out of a cloud. I know that it spans only twenty years, yet I am an old man. One does not remember one's birth, one has to be told. But with me it was different. Life came to me full-handed and dowered me with all my faculties and powers. Of a previous existence I know no more than others, for all have stammering intimations that may be memories and may be dreams. I know only that my first consciousness was of maturity in body and mind, a consciousness accepted without surprise or conjecture. I merely found myself walking in a forest, half-clad, footsore, unutterably weary and hungry. Seeing a farmhouse, I approached and asked for food, which was given me by one who inquired my name. I did not know yet knew that all had names. Greatly embarrassed, I retreated, and night coming on, lay down in the forest and slept. The next day I entered a large town which I shall not name, nor shall I recount further incidents of the life that is now to end, a life of wandering, always and everywhere haunted by an overmastering sense of crime and punishment of wrong and of terror in punishment of crime. Let me see if I can reduce it to narrative. I seem once to have lived near a great city, a prosperous planter, married to a woman whom I loved and distrusted. We had, it sometimes seems, one child, a youth of brilliant parts and promise. He is at all times a vague figure, never clearly drawn, frequently altogether out of the picture. One luckless evening it occurred to me to test my wife's fidelity. In a vulgar, commonplace way, familiar to every one who has acquaintance with the literature of fact and fiction, I went to the city, telling my wife 
that I should be absent until the following afternoon. But I returned before daybreak and went to the rear of the house, purposing to enter by a door with which I had secretly so tampered that it would seem to lock, yet not actually fasten. As I approached it, I heard it gently open and close, and saw a man steal away in the darkness. With murder in my heart, I sprang after him, but he had vanished without even the bad luck of identification. Sometimes now I cannot even persuade myself that it was a human being. Crazed with jealousy and rage, blind and bestial with all the elemental passions of insulted manhood, I entered the house and sprang up the stairs to the door of my wife's chamber. It was closed, but having tampered with its lock also, I easily entered, and despite the black darkness soon stood by the side of her bed. My groping hands told me that although disarranged it was unoccupied. She is below, and terrified by my entrance has evaded me in the darkness of the hall. With the purpose of seeking her, I turned to leave the room, but took a wrong direction, the right one. My foot struck her, cowering in a corner of the room. Instantly my hands were at her throat, stifling a shriek. My knees were upon her struggling body, and there in the darkness, without a word of accusation or reproach, I strangled her till she died. There ends the dream. I have related it in the past tense, but the present would be the fitter form, for again and again the sombre tragedy reenacts itself in my consciousness. Over and over I lay the plan, I suffer the confirmation, I redress the wrong. Then all is blank, and afterward the rains beat against the grimy window panes, or the snows fall upon my scant attire. The wheels rattle in the squalid streets where my life lies in poverty and mean employment. If there is ever sunshine, I do not recall it. If there are birds, they do not sing. There is another dream, another vision of the night. I stand among the shadows in a moonlit road. I am aware of another presence, but whose I cannot rightly determine. In the shadow of a great dwelling I catch the gleam of white garments. Then the figure of a woman confronts me in the road. My murdered wife. There is death in the face. There are marks upon the throat. The eyes are fixed on mine with an infinite gravity which is not reproach, nor hate, nor menace, nor anything less terrible than recognition. Before this awful apparition, I retreat in terror, a terror that is upon me as I write. I can no longer rightly shape the words. See, they... Now I am calm, but truly there is more to tell. The incident ends where it began, in darkness and in doubt. Yes, I am again in control of myself, the captain of my soul. But that is not respite. It is another stage and phase of expiation. My penance, constant in degree, is mutable in kind. One of its variants is tranquility. After all, it is only a life sentence. To hell for life, that is a foolish penalty. The culprit chooses the duration of his punishment. Today my term expires. To each and all, the peace that was not mine. 3. Statement of the late Julia Hetman Through the Medium by Rose I had retired early, and fallen almost immediately into a peaceful sleep, from which I awoke with that indefinable sense of peril, which is, I think, a common experience in that other earlier life. Of its unmeaning character, too, I was entirely persuaded, yet that did not banish it. My husband, Joel Hetman, was away from home. The servants slept in another part of the house. But these were familiar conditions. They had never before distressed me. 
Nevertheless, the strange terror grew so insupportable that conquered my reluctance to move. I sat up and lit the lamp at my bedside. Contrary to my expectation, this gave me no relief. The light seemed rather an added danger, for I reflected that it would shine out under the door, disclosing my presence to whatever evil thing might lurk outside. You that are still in the flesh, subject to horrors of the imagination, think what a monstrous fear that must be which seeks in darkness security from malevolent existences of the night. That is to spring to close quarters with an unseen enemy, the strategy of despair. Extinguishing the lamp, I pulled the bed clothing about my head, and lay trembling and silent, unable to shriek, forgetful to pray. In this pitiable state, I must have lain for what you call hours. With us, there are no hours. There is no time. At last it came, a soft, irregular sound of footfalls on the stairs. They were slow, hesitant, uncertain, as of something that did not see its way. To my disordered reason, all the more terrifying for that, as the approach of some blind and mindless malevolence to which is no appeal. I even thought that I must have left the hall lamp burning, and the groping of this creature proved it a monster of the night. This was foolish and inconsistent with my previous dread of the night. But what would you have? Fear has no brains. It is an idiot. The dismal witness that it bears and the cowardly counsel that it whispers are unrelated. We know this well. We who have passed into the realm of terror, who skulk in eternal dusk among the scenes of our former lives, invisible even to ourselves and one another, yet hiding forlorn in lonely places, yearning for speech with our loved ones, yet dumb, and as fearful of them as they of us. Sometimes the disability is removed, the law suspended, by the deathless power of love or hate we break the spell. We are seen by those whom we would warn, console, or punish. What form we seem to them to bear we know not. We know only that we terrify even those whom we most wish to comfort, and from whom we most crave tenderness and sympathy. Forgive, I pray you, this inconsequent digression by what was once a woman. You who consult us in this imperfect way, you do not understand. You ask foolish questions about things unknown and things forbidden. Much that we know and could impart in our speech is meaningless in yours. We must communicate with you through a stammering intelligence in that small fraction of our language that you yourselves can speak. You think that we are of another world. No, we have knowledge of no world but yours, though for us it holds no sunlight, no warmth, no music, no laughter, no song of birds, nor any companionship. O oh God, what a thing it is to be a ghost! cowering and shivering in an altered world, a prey to apprehension and despair. No, I did not die of fright. The thing turned and went away. I heard it go down the stairs hurriedly. I thought, as if itself in sudden fear. Then I rose to call for help. Hardly had my shaking hand found the doorknob, when, merciful heaven, I heard it returning. Its footfalls as it remounted the stairs were rapid, heavy and loud. They shook the house. I fled to an angle of the wall and crouched upon the floor. I tried to pray. I tried to call the name of my dear husband. Then I heard the door thrown open. There was an interval of unconsciousness, and when I revived, I felt a strangling clutch upon my throat felt my arms feebly beating against something that bore me backward, felt my tongue thrusting itself from between my teeth. And then I passed into this life. No, I have no knowledge of what it was. The sum of what we knew at death is the measure of what we know afterward, of all that went before. Of this existence we know many things, but no new light falls upon any page of that. In memory is written all of it that we can read. 
here are no heights of truth overlooking the confused landscape of that dubitable domain we still dwell in the valley of the shadow lurk in its desolate places peering from brambles and thickets at its mad malign inhabitants how should we have new knowledge of that fading past what i am about to relate happened on a night we know when it is night for when you retire to your houses and we can venture from our places of concealment to move unafraid about our old homes to look in at the windows even to enter and gaze upon your faces as you sleep i had lingered long near the dwelling where i had been so cruelly changed to what i am as we do while any that we love or hate remain vainly i had sought some method of manifestation some way to make my continued existence and my great love and poignant pity understood by my husband and son always if they slept they would wake or if in my desperation i dared approach them when they were awake would turn toward me the terrible eyes of the living frightening me by the glances that i sought for the purpose that i held on this night i had searched for them without success fearing to find them they were nowhere in the house nor about the moonlit dawn for although the sun is lost to us for ever the moon full orbed or slender remains to us sometimes it shines by night sometimes by day but always it rises and sets as in that other life i left the lawn and moved in the white light and silence along the road aimless and sorrowing suddenly i heard the voice of my poor husband in exclamations of astonishment with that of my son in reassurance and dissuasion and there by the shadow of a group of trees they stood near so near their faces were toward me the eyes of the elder man fixed upon mine he saw me at last at last he saw me in the consciousness of that my terror fled as a cruel dream the death spell was broken love had conquered lo mad with exultation i shouted i must have shouted he sees me he sees me he will understand then controlling myself i moved forward smiling and consciously beautiful to offer myself to his arms to comfort him with endearments and with my son's hand in mine to speak words that should restore the broken bonds between the living and the dead alas alas his face went white with fear his eyes were as those of a hunted animal he backed away from me as i advanced and at last turned and fled into the wood whither it is not given to me to know to my poor boy left doubly desolate i have never been able to impart a sense of my presence soon he too must pass to this life invisible and be lost to me for ever End of The Moonlit Road by Ambrose Beers Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Picture in the House by H. P. Lovecraft Recording by Alex Lilla This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To learn more or volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Picture in the House by H. P. Lovecraft Searchers after horror haunt strange, far places. For them are the catacombs of Ptolemais and the carven mausolea of the nightmare countries. They climb to the moonlit towers of ruined Rhine castles and falter down black cobweb steps beneath the scattered stones of forgotten cities in asia the haunted wood and the desolate mountain are their shrines and they linger around the sister monoliths on uninhabited islands but the true epicure in the terrible to whom a new thrill of unutterable ghastliness is the chief end and justification of existence esteems most of all 
the ancient lonely farmhouses of backwoods new england for there the dark elements of strength solitude grotesqueness and ignorance combine to for form the perfection of the hideous most horrible of all sights are the little unpainted wooden houses remote from travelled ways usually squatted upon some damp grassy slope or leaning against some gigantic outcropping of rock two hundred years and more they have leaned or squatted there while the vines have crawled and the trees have swelled and spread they are almost hidden now in lawless luxuriances of green and guardian shrouds of shadow but the small paned windows still stare shockingly as if blinking through a lethal stupor which wards off madness by dulling the memory of unutterable things in such houses have dwelt generations of strange people whose like the world has never seen seized with a gloomy and fanatical belief which exiled them from their kind their ancestors sought the wilderness for freedom there the scions of a conquering race indeed flourished free from the restrictions of their fellows but cowered in an appalling slavery to the dismal phantasms of their own minds divorced from the enlightenment of civilization the strength of these puritans turned into singular channels and in their isolation morbid self-repression and a struggle for life with relentless nature there came to them dark furtive traits from the prehistoric depths of their cold northern heritage by necessity practical and by philosophy stern these folk were not beautiful in their sins erring as they all as all mortals must they were forced by their rigid code to seek concealment above all else so that they came to use less and less taste in what they concealed only the silent sleepy staring houses in the backwoods can tell all that has lain hidden since the early days and they are not communicative being loath to shake off the drowsiness which helps them forget sometimes one feels that it would be merciful to tear down these houses for they must often dream it was to a time-battered edifice of this description that i was driven one afternoon in november eighteen ninety six by a rain of such chilling copiousness that any shelter was preferable to exposure i had been travelling for some time amongst the people of the miskatonic valley in quest of certain genealogical data and from the remote devious and problematical nature of my course had deemed it convenient to employ a bicycle despite the lateness of the season now i found myself upon an apparently abandoned road which i had chosen as the shortest cut to arkham overtaken by the storm at a point far from any town and confronted with no refuge save the antique and repellent wooden building which blinked with weird windows from between two huge leafless elms near the foot of a rocky hill distant though it was from the remnant of a road the house none the less impressed me unfavorably the very moment i spied it honest wholesome structures do not stare at travelers so slyly and hauntingly and in my genealogical researches i had encountered legends of a century before which biased me against places of this kind yet the force of the elements was such as to overcome my scruples and i did not hesitate to wheel my machine up the weedy rise to the closed door which seemed at once so suggestive and secretive i had somehow taken it for granted that the house was abandoned yet as i approached it i was not so sure for though the walks were indeed overgrown with weeds they seemed to retain their nature a little too well to argue a complete desertion therefore instead of trying the door i knocked feeling as i did so a trepidation i could scarcely explain as i waited on the rough mossy rock which served as a doorstep i glanced at the neighboring windows and the panes of the transom above me and noticed that although old rattling and almost opaque with dirt they were not broken the building then must still be inhabited despite its isolation and general neglect however my rapping evoked no response so after repeating the summons i tried the rusty latch and found the door unfastened inside was a little vestibule with walls from which the plaster was falling and through the doorway came a faint but peculiarly hateful odor i entered carrying my bicycle and closed the door behind me ahead rose a narrow staircase flanked by a small door probably leading to the cellar 
while to the left and right were closed doors leading to rooms on the ground floor. Leaning my cycle against the wall, I opened the door at the left and crossed into a small, low-sealed chamber, but dimly lighted by its two dusty windows, and furnished in the barest and most primitive possible way. It appeared to be a kind of sitting room, for it had a table and several chairs, and an immense fireplace, above which ticked an antique clock on a mantel. Books and papers were very few, and in the prevailing gloom I could not readily discern the titles. What interested me was the uniform air of archaism as displayed in every visible detail. Most of the houses in this region I had found rich in relics of the past, but here the antiquity was curiously complete, for in all the room I could not discover a single article of definitely post-revolutionary date. Had the furnishings been less humble, the place would have been a collector's paradise. As I surveyed this quaint apartment, I felt an increase in that aversion first excited by the bleak exterior of the house. Just what it was that I feared or loathed I could by no means define, but something in the whole atmosphere seemed redolent of unhallowed age, of unpleasant crudeness, and of secrets which should be forgotten. I felt disinclined to sit down, and wandered about examining the various articles which I had noticed. The first object of my curiosity was a book of medium size lying upon the table, and presenting such an antediluvian aspect that I marveled at beholding it outside a museum or library. It was bound in leather with metal fittings, and was in an excellent state of preservation, being altogether an unusual sort of volume to encounter in an abode so lowly. When I opened it to the title page, my wonder grew even greater, for it proved to be nothing less rare than Pigafetta's account of the Congo region, written in Latin from the notes of the sailor Lopez, and printed at Frankfurt in 1598. I had often heard of this work, with its curious illustrations by the brothers de Bray, hence for a moment forgot my uneasiness and my desire to turn the pages before me. The engravings were indeed interesting, drawn wholly from imagination and careless descriptions, and represented negroes with white skins and Caucasian features. Nor would I soon have closed the book had not an exceedingly trivial circumstance upset my tired nerves and revived my sensation of disquiet. What annoyed me was merely the persistent way in which the volume tended to fall open of itself at plate twelve, which represented in gruesome detail a butcher's shop of the cannibal Anziques. I had experienced some shame at my susceptibility to such a thing, but the drawing nevertheless disturbed me, especially in connection with some adjacent passages descriptive of Anzic gastronomy. I had turned to a neighboring shelf and was examining its meager literary contents, an 18th century Bible, a pilgrim's progress of like period, illustrated with grotesque woodcuts and printed by the almanac maker Isaiah Thomas, the rotting bulk of Cotton Mather's Magnalia Christi Americana, and a few other books of evidently equal age, when my attention was aroused by the unmistakable sound of walking in the room overhead. At first astonished and startled, considering the lack of response to my recent knocking at the door, I immediately afterward concluded that the walker had just awakened from a sound sleep, and listened with less surprise as the footsteps sounded on the creaking stairs. The tread was heavy, yet seemed to contain a curious quality of cautiousness, a quality which I disliked the more because the tread was heavy. When I had entered the room, I had shut the door behind me. Now, after a moment of silence, during which the walker may have been inspecting my bicycle in the hall, I heard a fumbling at the latch, and saw the paneled portal swing open again. In the doorway stood a person of such singular appearance that I should have exclaimed aloud but for the restraints of good breeding. Old, white-bearded, and ragged, my host possessed a countenance and physique which inspired equal wonder and respect. His height could not have been less than six feet, and despite a general air of age and poverty, he was stout and powerful in proportion. His face, almost hidden by a long beard which grew high on the cheeks, seemed abnormally ruddy and less wrinkled than one might expect while over a high forehead fell a shock of white hair, little thinned by the years. His blue eyes, though a trifle bloodshot, seemed inexplicably keen and burning. But for his horrible unkemptness, the man would have been as distinguished-looking as he was impressive. 
This unkemptness, however, made him offensive despite his face and figure. Of what his clothing consisted I could hardly tell, for it seemed to be no more than a mass of tatters surmounting a pair of high, heavy boots, and the lack of cleanliness would surpass description. The appearance of this man, and the instinctive fear he inspired, prepared me for something like enmity, so that I almost shuddered through surprise and a sense of uncanny incongruity when he motioned me to a chair, and addressed me in a thin, weak voice, full of fawning respect and ingratiating hospitality. His speech was very curious, an extreme form of Yankee dialect I had thought long extinct, and I studied it closely as he sat down opposite me for conversation. Catched in the rain, be ye? he greeted. Glad ye was nigh the house and had the sense to come right in. I calculate I was asleep, else I'd a hear ye. I ain't as young as I used to be, and I need a powerful sight of naps nowadays. Travelin' fur? I ain't seen many folks along this rug since they took off the Arkham stage. I replied that I was going to Arkham, and apologized for my rude entry into his domicile, whereupon he continued, Glad to see ye, young sir. New faces scurse around here, and I ain't got much to cheer me up these days. Guess you hail from Boston, don't ye? I never been thar, but I can tell a town man when I see him. We had one for district schoolmaster in eighty four, but he quit sudden and no one never heard on him since. <laughs> Here the old man lapsed into a kind of chuckle and made no explanation when I questioned him. He seemed to be in an aboundingly good humor. Yet to possess those eccentricities which one might guess from his grooming. For some time he rambled on with an almost feverish geniality when it struck me to ask him how he came by so rare a book as Pigafetta's Regnum Congo. The effect of this volume had not left me, and I felt a certain hesitancy in speaking of it, but curiosity overmastered all the vague fears which had steadily accumulated since my first glimpse of the house. To my relief, the question did not seem an awkward one, for the old man answered freely and volubly, Oh, that Afriki book! Captain Ebenezer Holt treaded me that in '68. Him as was kilt in the war. Something about the name of Ebenezer Holt caused me to look up sharply. I had encountered it in my genealogical work, but not in any record since the Revolution. I wondered if my host could help me in the task at which I was laboring, and resolved to ask him about it later on. He continued, Ebenezer was on a Salem merchant man for years, and picked up a sight of queer stuff at every port. He got this in London, I guess. He used to like to buy things at the shops. I was up to his house, walked on the hill, trading horses, when I see this book. I relished the pictures, so he give it to me on a swap. Tis a queer book. Here, leave me get on my spectacles. The old man fumbled among his rags, producing a pair of dirty and amazingly antique glasses, with small octagonal lenses and steel bows. Donning these, he reached for the volume on the table and turned the pages lovingly. Ebenezer could read a little of this, tis Latin, but I can't. I had two or three schoolmasters read me a bit, and Passon Clark, him they say got drowned in the pond. Can you make anything out in it? I told him that I could, and translated for his benefit a paragraph near the beginning. If I erred, he was not scholar enough to correct me, for he seemed childishly pleased at my English version. His proximity was becoming rather obnoxious, yet I saw no way to escape without offending him. I was amused at the childish fondness of this ignorant old man for the pictures in a book he could not read, and wondered how much better he could read the few books in English which adorned the room. This revelation of simplicity removed much of the ill-defined apprehension I had felt, and I smiled as my host rambled on. Queer how pictures can set a body thinking. Take this on here near the front. Have you ever seen trees like that with big leaves a-floppin' over and down? And them men, them can't be niggers, they do beat all. Kind of like Injuns, I guess, even if they be in Africa. Some of these here critters look like monkeys, or half monkeys and half men. But I never heard of nothing like this and Here he pointed to a fabulous creature of the artist, which one might describe as a sort of dragon with the head of an alligator. But now I'll show ye the best un over here and in the middle. The old man's speech grew a trifle thicker and his eyes assumed a brighter glow, but his fumbling hands, though seemingly clumsier than before, were entirely adequate to their mission. 
The book fell open, almost of its own accord, and as if from frequent consultation at this place, to the repellent twelfth plate, showing a butcher's shop among the angsty cannibals. My sense of restlessness returned, though I did not exhibit it. The especially bizarre thing was that the artist had made his Africans look like white men. The limbs and quarters hanging about the walls of the shop were ghastly, while the butcher with his axe was hideously incongruous. But my host seemed to relish the view as much as I disliked it. What do you think of this? Ain't never see the like hereabouts, eh? When I see this, I told Ed Holt, that's something to stir ye up and make your blood tickle. When I read in scripture about slam like them Midianites was slew, I kind of think things. But I ain't got no picture of it. Here a body can see all they is to it. I suppose tis sinful, but ain't we all born living in sin? That fella being chopped up gives me a tickle every time I look at him. I have to keep looking at him, see where the butcher cut off his feet. There's his head on that bench, with one arm aside of it and two other arms on the ground side of the meat block. As the man mumbled on in his shocking ecstasy, the expression on his heavy, spectacled face became indescribable, but his voice sank rather than mounted. My own sensations can scarcely be recorded. All the terror I had dimly felt before rushed upon me actively and vividly, and I knew that I loathed the ancient and abhorrent creature so near me with an infinite intensity. His madness, or at least his partial perversion, seemed almost beyond dispute. He was almost whispering now, with a huskiness more terrible than a scream, and I trembled as I listened. As I says, tis queer how Pictor sets ye thinkin'. Do you know, young sir, I'm right saw on this un here. Arter I got the book off Ebb, I used to look at it a lot, especially when I heard Parson Clark rant a Sundays in his big wig. Once I tried something funny. Here, young sir, don't get scared. All I done was to look at the picture afore I killed the sheep for market. Killing sheep was kind of more fun arter looking at it. The tone of the old man now sank very low, sometimes becoming so faint that his words were hardly audible. I listened to the rain and to the rattling of the bleared, small-paned windows, and marked a rumbling of approaching thunder quite unusual for the season. Once a terrific flash and peal shook the frail house to its foundations, but the whisperer seemed not to notice it. Killing sheep was kind of more fun, but do you know, twa'n't quite satisfying. Queer how a preven gets hold on ye, as ye love the old mighty young man. Don't tell nobody, but I swear to God, that picture begun to make me hungry for victuals I couldn't raise nor buy. Here, sit still, what's ailing ye? I didn't do nothing, only I wondered how twould be if I did. They say meat makes blood and flesh and gives you a new life. So I wondered if twouldn't make a man live longer and longer if twas more the same. But the whisperer never continued. The interruption was not produced by my fright, nor by the rapidly increasing storm and its too fury. I was presently to open my eyes on a smoky solitude of blackened ruins. It was produced by a very simple, though somewhat unusual, happening. The open book lay flat between us, with the picture staring repulsively upward. As the old man whispered the words, more the same, a tiny spattering impact was heard, and something showed on the yellow paper of the upturned volume. I thought of the rain and of a leaky roof, but rain is not red. On the butcher's shop of the N.C. Cabals, a small red spattering glistened picturesquely, lending vividness to the horror of the engraving. The old man saw it and stopped whispering even before my expression of horror made it necessary. Saw it and glanced quickly toward the floor of the room he had left an hour before. I followed his glance and beheld just above us on the loose plaster of the ancient ceiling a large, irregular spot of wet crimson, which seemed to spread even as I viewed it. I did not shriek or move, but merely shut my eyes. A moment later came the titanic thunderbolt of thunderbolts, blasting that accursed house of unutterable secrets, 
and bringing the oblivion which alone saved my mind. End of The Picture in the House by H.P. Lovecraft Recording by Alex Lella The Grey Nun by Natalie von Eschstrut, translated from the German by Lionel Stracci. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Grey Nun by Natalie von Eschstrut. When I was a young man, I once made a foreign journey, betaking myself to the royal court of X on affairs of state. In those days, politics would take strange turns, not of unmixed delight, and so it happened that my mission was prolonged well into the winter, and kept me at X until the carnival season. But at this I did not repine, for to pass a winter in a beautiful climate, and amid the fascinating society of a court, seemed a welcome change to my enthusiastic pleasure-loving young soul the reigning sovereign had a predilection for masked balls a traditionally favorite amusement at the palace i was told and accordingly several fancy dress festivities were enacted on the royal premises during the carnival the first i was unable to participate in because of an inflamed eye and therefore awaited the second with all the keener anticipation. In the becoming costume of a Prussian officer in the army of Frederick the Great, and with the agreeable sensation of being specially well disguised beneath my mask and safe from recognition, I mingled in the gay throng of the dancers and enjoyed to the full the charm of the brilliant and delicious event. An exquisitely graceful little water nix had conquered my heart. The champagne was bubbling in my blood, and in wild spirits I was pursuing the fleeing Undine into an adjacent apartment. Suddenly I stopped as though spellbound, and found myself staring into a pair of dark eyes, black as night, which were rigidly fixed upon me. Standing aloof in a corner of the room, I saw a nun, her long grey garment reached to the ground, and lay about her very feet in folds like a train. Her arms hung straight down, the hands being concealed in the loose sleeves. White linen bands covered her head and chin, and rendered even her mouth invisible, while her forehead and the upper part of her face were protected by a black velvet mask, and the blackness of those eyes that penetrated me was so intense that scarcely were any whites discernible. An indescribable emotion ran over me as I stood under the ban of an evil power, as it were, returning the look of that strange figure. I had forgotten Undine. Drawn by some invisible force, I approached the nun with mechanical footstep. Why, fair mask, I accosted her with a bold laugh. Are you alone? Surely you know that for dancing and love too are needed. Briefly, like a Chinese idol, she nodded her head in assent. A thrill seemed to pass over her wonderfully slender shape, yet she did not budge. I became more venturesome from a sudden feeling as of fire rushing through my veins. You may be vowed to seclusion, beautiful bride of heaven, but today the convent walls have released you. Today you are of the world and the flesh. Today you are mine. Thus I cried aloud, forgetting in my excitement that I was in a country where my mother tongue was only spoken and understood at the German legation. In a moment it occurred to me, did the mask know German? To my astonishment she gave an immediate sign of intelligence by gliding silently as a shadow, another step in my direction, and her biasing eyes appeared to kindle with merriment. Had she a veil over her eyes? It almost looked so, and this extraordinary measure of precaution challenged me the more strongly to overcome her reluctance to being known. Do you understand me? I asked. 
She nodded in the same brief, jerky manner as before. Do you know me? Similarly, she answered by negative motions of the head. I stepped up close to her with a question, but will you not know me and love me? Come into my arms and let us dance. Then something happened that at the moment I found surprising and extremely startling, yet which I took for a mere carnal freak, while later on I could scarce review the occurrence with any degree of clearness. The nun threw her arms about me abruptly and almost desperately, and whirled me into a frenzied dance. I felt no body between my arms, and did not hear the rustle of her dress. I only saw those enigmatic dark eyes, which glowed near, very near my own. And in mad career, regardless of the musical time, or of the tune played, my curious partner tore around the room with me faster and faster, and with ever-increasing fury. Her arms gripped me tighter and tighter, and I was threatened with complete loss of breath in the wild race. Of a sudden I received a violent blow, resembling an electric shock, from each of her hands on my shoulders, felt myself all at once liberated, and staggered faint against a pyramid of plants. Boisterous laughter sounded on my ear. Some other masks had surrounded and seized me, exclaiming, Look at the fine gentleman. He's out of his mind, dancing about the room like a madman, quite alone. I opened my eyes and looked all around. What had become of my partner? Not a sign of her was to be seen, although this other room was likewise very large, just then not well filled with people. Have I been dancing alone? I gasped, tearing the mask off my burning face. Quite alone. Did you imagine it was with your sweetheart? was the mocking, noisy reply. I was deeply annoyed. Nonsense, I cried. You are all in the conspiracy. Where has the nun gone? It was no lady at all. It was a man in disguise. They laughed still more, and some whispered behind fans that I must be drunk. Strange sensations invaded me. Had a joke been played at my expense? Had a member of the German legation dressed in female clothes, and in the height of his whimsical caprice danced with me in that insane fashion? Were the guests in the secret, and were they amusing themselves, as the freedom of the carnival permitted, with teasing a foreigner? Yet surely the mysterious nun must be discoverable. My knees were trembling from a weakness I was unable to account for, but I collected myself, and while various thoughts coursed through my brain for a solution of this carnival prank, I hastened with feverish speed through rooms and galleries in quest of the nun, but in vain. I espied neither herself nor met anyone who had seen her. The lackeys and doorkeepers assured me in perfect good faith that they had seen no nun of any sort. A costume is one of which his majesty does not approve, I was informed in the cloakroom. It is considered irreverent to appear at balls here in the spiritual garb of a nun or a monk, and therefore it is not done. It would certainly have been observed by us, had any lady or gentleman transgressed against the prevailing usage. Then perhaps I may have mistaken for a nun some other mask who intended in her grace you to represent twilight or care. I excused myself hesitatingly, though I had an accurate eye for dresses, and could have registered a solemn note that the mysterious unknown was even wearing especially authentic claustral attire. No one, however, could by any effort remember having noticed a costume, anything like that described by me. Are there any secret passages to any of the rooms and galleries which are the scene of tonight's festivities? I asked the doorkeeper. He looked at me in surprise and answered, All ways of communication were open today because of the crowd of guests, but for safety's sake guarded and watched more carefully than usual. Only the tapestried corridor running the length of the great colonnade to the royal apartments was left unguarded since in that place there is no possibility of improper intrusion. 
A new idea flashed across me. The spot on which I had first set eyes on my nun was at the entrance to that corridor. Might not a member of the royal family have elected to make me, a novice in this foreign court society, the subject of a merry jest? No doubt the nun was a man in disguise, and the young princes and dukes were probably capable of pouncing on the victim and dancing him to death. My confusion was perhaps very diverting, and the secrecy of the few spectators of the joke, who were, of course, initiated, was quite praiseworthy. They asserted not having seen a nun at all, and laughed at me for having rushed round the room alone like a lunatic. Obviously there was no further room for doubt, this explanation, and no other was valid. Why had I not thought of this before? So I joined in the hilarity of the others and made the best of my discomfiture. In any case, the manner in which my partner had dismissed me betrayed a pair of powerful masculine fists. My shoulders, on which he had come down so vigorously, ached as if they were broken, and I was still unable to conquer entirely a peculiar sensation of uneasiness. But while I was pursuing my investigations, the clock struck twelve, the company unmasked and gaily flocked toward the supper rooms. I felt particularly entitled to refreshments, and in the course of my indulgence in the good things of my selection, my faintness, which was more astonishing to my robust, muscular young self than any carnival joke in the world could have been, passed off completely. I was as happy and lively as before, and enjoyed the remainder of the ball as much as I had the beginning. I tried to dismiss the episode from my mind. For a few days I felt a dull pain in my shoulders, which annoyed me at night also, and disturbed my sleep. The image of the nun haunted me, and the sombre penetrating eyes were present to me in my very dreams. This vexed me and I mentally abused the royal gentleman in every key who had pushed this joke rather too far. A week passed, and the court chamberlain issued invitations for the third mask ball at the palace. I purchased a sailor's dress, and on the evening of the ball tripped up the marble stairs in the best of spirits. It had in the meanwhile occurred to me that I had perhaps imbibed too much and that the prince in nun's clothing had perhaps observed my condition, and made me his victim for that reason. But I rejected that proposition. In the first place, I had not taken much to drink. Certainly two or three glasses of champagne and lemonade were not worth mentioning, when I remembered what quantities of alcohol I had frequently absorbed in my university days in Germany. I was a brave boon companion, and capable of consuming a great deal, so how should a few paltry little glasses make me so unsteady on my feet as to collapse in dancing a fast gallop? Absurd! I was sure enough of myself, and sufficiently well brought up in social customs, to know how much one may drink at a court ball. No, I was convinced that I had not been intoxicated but on this occasion I resolved to exercise special caution and to be strictly temperate in the event of the disguised perpetrator of pranks again attempting to make a German stranger the butt of his impudence. This time he should meet his match. I would keep my head clear and my feet steady enough to venture a dance with him. The constantly suspicious attitude of my mind, to be sure, inferred with my pleasure very considerably. I was in too observant mood to float on the topmost wave of enjoyment, and besides an extraordinary disquietude had seized upon me, a contraction about the heart that was quite new to me, such as sensitive people undergo before a storm or in anticipation of momentous changes of fortune. I wandered about restlessly, numerous though the merry mask that flitted around me, that nun's indescribable black eyes did not appear, and no effort was made to involve me again as the hero of another frolic. 
time was dragging heavily i glanced at my watch and wished the supper hour might be near the finger only pointed to half past eleven so that i must still possess my soul in patience for half an hour it was a lovely mild moonlit night the doors to the tapestried passage and the colonnade had been thrown open and i concluded to take a breath of the fragrant air and a rapid view of the illuminated town in its festive brilliancy of a carnival night a female pierrot dances past me with don juan and with a laugh throws a handful of confetti in my face i retaliate a few phrases are exchanged i look after her for a moment and then turn to the entrance of the corridor to get out into the colonnade i am rooted to the ground standing aside in a corner on the very same spot as before is my nun staring at me with the same unfathomable eyes as a week ago where had she come from out of the ground or had she slipped in through the door during my banter with the pierrot she had come through the door of course i am utterly amazed the same costume the same joke how clumsy of the prince to repeat himself i am inclined to ignore the impertinent young gentleman and pass him proudly by yet strange again i am attracted irresistibly as by a supernatural power held by those black orbs i am quite certain of my wits this time the dress is really the forbidden costume of a nun and so far as i can judge exact in every particular on her breast hangs a large cross which is especially conspicuous it is of dull gold with emeralds and pearls inlaid of peculiar shape and certainly antique the pious nun seems to have regaled herself with excessive haste at some sideboard since the white collar and the front of the grey bodice show oblong dark stains as though some beverage had been spilt well fair mask finally remarked in a mocking tone and although my heart is beating furiously you have been waiting for me here i presume she nods slowly and solemnly do you imagine by chance that i wish to dance another hurricane with you again she assents but more emphatically then i say ironically see where you can find a new blockhead my muscular fairy my shoulders are not well yet her arms move hence there are none visible in the long roomy sleeves they are stretched out to me as if in mute appeal a cold shiver runs down my back i know not why if i dance with you again i angrily exclaim you will not fare quite so well as last time i am firmer on my feet to-night than i was last week she presses her arms to her breast something like a tremor agitates the grey shape and her head is slightly raised her position and demeanour though she utters not a word denote intense longing the blood rushes to my head i must go a step nearer to her i must if i dance with you it will be only on one condition with a profound sigh her bosom heaves her arms fall to her side her body is humbly bent forward as if in complete surrender and as if to say ask what you will my condition is that you afterward reveal yourself she nods stiffly like a marionette swear to it she raises her arms for the oath but the grey folds still conceal her hand woe betide you if you deceive me she shakes her head and repeats the passionate gesture of entreaty her slender form trembles with feverish impatience and the wonderful eyes seem to plead in extreme urgency come quickly i put out my arms once more does the terrible woman rush at me once more am i held in that mad embrace once more on the wings of the wind do we dash round the room and once more are all my senses lost in the fiendish whirl i attempt to struggle 
would pit the abounding strength of my youth against the woman and subdue her in vain i can think i can act no longer my whole being is in a swoon and i am conscious of nothing but two icy lips pressed upon mine with a vehemence calculated to draw my very life out of me a shudder seizes me and the fear of death and then again that blow on my shoulders i feel as if a pair of iron clamps had been taken off me and i had been freed and i sink down upon a sofa a laughing jeering crowd surrounds me shouting the sailor is crazy he has gone out of his mind have i again been dancing alone in the public i jump up in a rage and exclaimed as i toss back my dishevelled hair from my burning brow abominable trickery let me pass let me get my hands on her and unmask her something rings on the floor it has fallen from my hand hitherto clenched and just now opened triumphantly i snatch it up exulting her cross ha that shall be my clue on this occasion too no trace of the mysterious nun was to be found it was at first superciliously assumed as before that i must be drunk or insane but my serious mood and energetic investigations soon altered that notion i might myself have doubted my mental soundness had it not been for the cross in my hand which i at once recognized as being that worn by the nun and had not a lackey finally confessed to having beheld the strange figure he was coming from the colonnade with a tray of refreshments when he saw me in conversation with her the mask had something familiar about her he said but he could not remember where he had seen her before he had been a servant in the palace for forty years nobody thought of a spectre on the other hand extravagant speculations became rife of a conspirator being at work it was rumoured the king had originally intended to wear a sailor costume of course it was him the uncanny visitor had his signs upon in view of the fact that the political horizon was very dark and clouded at that time the conjecture was perhaps not altogether fantastical and for this reason the report quickly reached the ears of the king and the royal family i was promptly summoned before his majesty and it gave me a sort of revengeful pleasure to relate the incident to that august person for i was still fully persuaded that some young member of his family had played this obnoxious trick upon me the king nodded thoughtfully upon my frank declaration that according to my researches the enigmatical female could only have come from the royal apartments said his majesty may i ask you my dear baron to show me the cross you found i put it into his hand for a moment the king stared upon it speechless then he turned it over and ejaculated roughly almost under the emotion of his violent surprise great god why it is and he pointed to the small delicately engraved initials surmounted by a crown in the middle of the cross very pale and with heaving breast he went on a nun a grey nun you say what would the object of such a joke be and how how should this cross come back among the living baron come with me i must request your confidence and secrecy we passed through several rooms and then arrived at a narrow gallery whose walls were hung with portraits of royal personages the king came abruptly to a halt and without himself looking up indicated a certain picture observe that painting do you see the same cross there that you have in your hand involuntarily i uttered the loud cry why that is she holy heavens it is my nun the cross compare the cross urged the king his slender white hand trembling with agitation a frosty current ran through my veins as i compared the pictured cross with that in my companion's hand it was the same not a doubt of it 
and the eyes, too, were the same, as also the dress and the whole figure were unmistakably those of the grey nun I had danced with. Yet in those conspicuously large, deep black eyes lay not an expression of peacefulness and mild resignation, but a world of passionate feeling. Having assured the king of the identity of the cross, and he having informed me that it was an ancient heirloom, of which no duplicate existed, he bade me accompany him further. Arrived in the antechamber to his apartments, the king gave an order to one of the attendants on duty there. He walked up and down the room for a few moments in visible excitement, and then, stopping before me and looking at me searchingly, he asked, have you ever in the course of your life met with a manifestation of the supernatural i was so bewildered and nervous that i scarcely could remember enough french to reply may it please your majesty i have not do you believe in the possibility of the dead returning not in the sense of their coming as apparitions i always was still am a skeptic on the point of ghost stories in general nevertheless i am a christian and i believe and know that we continue to live after death the king stared at me mechanically you are a protestant and you say you are a skeptic curious only you saw the apparition it was revealed to no one else then your majesty is of the opinion that this is actually a case of a spectral apparition certainly it seems much more plausible than open theft this very cross i myself he interrupted his sentence as he turned to the door through which with profound obeisance entered two ladies in waiting probably the queen's his majesty addressed one of them in french no doubt to enable me to participate in the conversation you were present madame m when princess a was laid in her coffin seventeen years ago a low curtsy was the affirmative reply and you also madame you i had the honour your majesty of rendering her royal highness the last earthly services you remember perfectly what dress the deceased was buried in quite well your majesty it was the regular dress of the order of grey sisters of which her royal highness was a member do you recollect whether she took any ornaments to her last resting-place excepting the golden cross which your majesty hung round her neck on the day she took the vow no jewellery was put on the princess the duchess even drew the little sapphire ring from her royal highness's finger to keep it as a remembrance and wear it herself you are absolutely certain that the cross went into the coffin you could swear to it i could do so with fullest conviction your majesty would you recognize the cross to be sure i should is this it good heavens it is on the back there ought to be the initials of a royal highness here they are said the king reversing the cross the old woman shrank back appalled then your majesty the vault has been broken into possibly it has the matter shall be investigated i am much obliged to you ladies and earnestly request you will both preserve unconditional silence as to our present interview well said the king to me after the ladies-in-waiting had withdrawn how do you account for this cross being here in my hand considering it was put into the coffin you think the vault may have been pillaged that i believe is out of the question the object of the carnival freak which could have been perpetrated just as easily in any other dress is far too slight to make such a horrible offence as the violation of the dead worth while but i intend to have the vault examined and beg my dear baron that you will attend for the present good night i spent a dreadful night torturing my sleepless brain for a solution of the riddle and being forever haunted by the nun's dark eyes it was late when i woke some hours after the coffin was opened in the presence of the king whose surmise proved correct the bolts on the coffin were intact the gold chain was there safe round the princess's neck but the cross was gone there was not the remotest sign of violence how i got out of the vault i do not know 
I remember feeling faint and being supported by two court officials. I am unaware of what happened next. It was the only instance in my life in which my system had so entirely given way. A serious illness was apprehended, but my strong constitution won the day. For a long time my mind was in a precarious state. When I had recovered, the king sent for me. Are you still a skeptic? he asked in a grave voice. No, your majesty, I am convinced now. Whereupon the king himself deigned to communicate to me the particulars relating to the golden cross. Princess A was a daughter of one of his cousins, and she was their fifth child. The duchess, a very pious woman, made a vow before the birth of her sixth child, that if it was a boy, her youngest daughter should be dedicated to the service of the church and take the veil. A son was born, and Princess A henceforth was educated for the profession of a nun in becoming retirement and seclusion. Unfortunately, however, the natural traits of the girl seemed to be entirely in opposition to that reverend calling. An irrepressible vivacity of spirit, an intense coveting of worldly joys and pleasures characterized her, and the more she was separated from the world, the more ardent grew her desire to live in it. Heart-rending scenes of resistance and tears were enacted, and the reigning sovereign felt so much pity for the spirited young creature that he attempted to save her from her fate of being immured in convent walls by offering to apply to the pope for a dispensation releasing the mother from her promise but the duchess desperately combated this idea her wild laments that to break her vow would entail her forfeiture of eternal salvation her protestations her tears her entreaties at last prevailed upon the princess to join the order of the grey sisters for a short space all seemed to go well the fervid heart of the royal nun was apparently beating placidly in the quiet claustral surroundings but during the winter the duchess fell sick and the young bride of the church was called to her bedside princess a had remained with her mother for several weeks and about that time the carnival season began masked balls were given in the palace and while the horns and violins were sounding in the ballroom princess a lay on her knees in the throes of dreadful despair tearing her hair in furious longing for that lost paradise she at last succeeded in bribing a chambermaid to secretly procure her a fancy dress if it was to cost her immortal soul once she would dance and be young and happy the plot was betrayed and the angriest reproaches were poured out by her parents upon the perjured rebellious nun princess a was locked up and was to be removed to the convent the next day however as the festivities in the palace were reaching their height that night the unhappy young nun lay expiring in her room she had taken poison although the report was spread in the capital that failure of the heart had caused her death how she came into possession of the poison no one ever discovered while she was writhing in terrible agony her half-crazed mother put a cup of milk to her lips as an antidote she dashed it passionately aside and the spilt milk left stains on her dress how hard it was to die again and again she tore her black hair again and again she uttered the bitterest imprecations and the fiercest cries for a taste of youth and happiness at length she stood up straining her ears for the music in the ballroom and then she screamed aloud oh i must dance once i must kiss once let me be happy once i cannot die before i dance let me go let me dance let me she drew herself up to her full height her eyes glowed like live coals she took a few steps towards the door i must dance let me dance she gasped and fell stiffly forward on the floor dead end of the grey nun by natalie von eschstrup translated from the german by lionel stracci read 
by Lars Rolander. John Bartine's Watch by Ambrose Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Craster. John Bartine's Watch A Story by a Physician. The exact time? Good God, my friend, why do you insist? One would think. But what does it matter? It is easily bedtime. Isn't that near enough? But here, if you must set your watch, take mine and see for yourself. With that he detached his watch, a tremendously heavy old-fashioned one, from the chain, and handed it to me, then turned away, and walking across the room to a shelf of books, began an examination of their backs. His agitation and evident distress surprised me. They appeared reasonless. Having set my watch by his, I stepped over to where he stood and said, Thank you. As he took his timepiece and reattached it to the guard, I observed that his hands were unsteady. With the tact upon which I greatly prided myself, I sauntered carelessly to the sideboard and took some brandy and water. Then, begging his pardon for my thoughtlessness, asked him to have some and went back to my seat by the fire, leaving him to help himself, as was our custom. He did so, and presently joined me at the hearth, as tranquil as ever. This odd little incident occurred in my apartment, where John Bartin was passing an evening. We had dined together at the club, had come home in a cab, and, in short, everything had been done in the most prosaic way and why John Bartine should break in upon the natural and established order of things to make himself spectacular with a display of emotion apparently for his own entertainment, I could nowise understand. The more I thought of it, while his brilliant conversational gifts were commending themselves to my attention, the more curious I grew, and of course had no difficulty in persuading myself that my curiosity was friendly solicitude. That is the disguise that curiosity usually assumes to evade resentment. So I ruined one of the finest sentences of his disregarding monologue by cutting it short without ceremony. John Bartin, I said, you must try to forgive me if I am wrong, but with the light that I have at present, I cannot concede your right to go all to pieces when asked the time of night. I cannot admit that it is proper to experience a mysterious reluctance to look your own watch in the face, and to cherish in my presence, without explanation, painful emotions which are denied to me, and which are none of my business. To this ridiculous speech Bartine made no immediate reply, but sat looking gravely into the fire. Fearing that I had offended, I was about to apologize and beg him to think no more about the matter. When looking me calmly in the eyes, he said, My dear fellow, the levity of your manner does not at all disguise the hideous impudence of your demand. But happily, I had already decided to tell you what you wish to know, and no manifestation of your unworthiness to hear it shall alter my decision. Be good enough to give me your attention, and you shall hear all about the matter. This watch, he said, had been in my family for three generations, before it fell to me. Its original owner, for whom it was made, was my great-grandfather, Bramville Alcott Bartin, a wealthy planter of colonial Virginia, and as staunch a Tory as ever lay awake nights, contriving new kinds of maledictions for the head of Mr. Washington, and new methods of aiding and abetting good King George. One day, this worthy gentleman had the deep misfortune to perform for his cause a service of capital importance which was not recognized as legitimate by those who suffered its disadvantages. It does not matter what it was, but among its minor consequences was my excellent ancestor's arrest one night in his own house by a party of Mr. Washington's rebels. He was permitted to say farewell to his weeping family 
and was then marched away into the darkness which swallowed him up for ever. Not the slenderest clue to his fate was ever found. After the war, the most diligent inquiry and the offer of large rewards failed to turn up any of his captors or any fact concerning his disappearance. He had disappeared, and that was all. Something in Bartine's manner that was not in his words, I hardly knew what it was, prompted me to ask. What is your view of the matter, of the justice of it? My view of it, he flamed out, bringing his clenched hand down upon the table as if he had been in a public house dicing with blackguards. My view of it is that it was a characteristically dastardly assassination by that damned traitor Washington and his ragamuffin rebels. For some minutes nothing was said. Bartine was recovering his temper, and I waited. Then I said, Was it all? No, oh, there was something else. A few weeks after my great-grandfather's arrest, his watch was found lying on the porch at the front door of his dwelling. It was wrapped in a sheet of letter paper bearing the name of Rupert Bartine, his only son, my grandfather. I am wearing that watch. Bartine paused. His usually restless black eyes were staring fixedly into the grate, a point of red light in each reflected from the glowing coals. He seemed to have forgotten me. A sudden threshing of the branches of a tree outside one of the windows, and almost at the same instant a rattle of rain against the glass, recalled him to a sense of his surroundings. A storm had risen, heralded by a single gust of wind, and in a few moments the steady plash of the water on the pavement was directly heard. I hardly know why I relate this incident. It seems somehow to have a certain significance and relevancy, which I am unable now to discern. It at least added an element of seriousness, almost solemnity. Bartine resumed. I have a singular feeling toward this watch, a kind of affection for it. I like to have it about me though partly from its weight, and partly for a reason I shall now explain, I seldom carry it. The reason is this. Every evening, when I have it with me, I feel an unaccountable desire to open and consult it, even if I can think of no reason for wishing to know the time. But if I yield it to it, the moment my eyes rest upon the dial, I am filled with a mysterious apprehension, a sense of imminent calamity. And this is the more insupportable the nearer it is to eleven o'clock, by this watch, no matter what the actual hour may be. After the hands have registered eleven, the desire to look is gone. I am entirely indifferent. Then I can consult the thing as often as I like, with no more emotion than you feel in looking at your own. Naturally, I have trained myself not to look at that watch in the evening before eleven. Nothing could induce me. Your insistence this evening upset me a trifle. I felt very much as I suppose an opium-eater might feel if his yearning for his special and particular kind of hell were reinforced by opportunity and advice. Now that is my story, and I have told it in the interest of your trumpery science. But if on any evening hereafter you observe me wearing this damnable watch, and you have the thoughtfulness to ask me the hour, I shall beg leave to put you to the inconvenience of being knocked down. His humour did not amuse me. I could see that in relating his delusion he was again somewhat disturbed. His concluding smile was positively ghastly, and his eyes had resumed something more than their old restlessness. They shifted hither and thither about the room with apparent aimlessness, and I fancied had taken on a wild expression, such as is sometimes observed in cases of dementia. Perhaps this was my own imagination, but at any rate I was now persuaded that my friend was afflicted with a most singular and interesting monomania. Without, I trust, any abatement of my affectionate solicitude for him as a friend, I began to regard him as a patient, rich in possibilities of profitable study. Why not? Had he not described his delusion in the interest of science? Ah, poor fellow, he was doing more for science than he knew. Not only his story, 
but himself was in evidence. I should cure him if I could, of course, but first I should make a little experiment in psychology. Nay, the experiment itself might be a step in his restoration. That is very frank and friendly of you, Bartine, I said cordially, and I am rather proud of your confidence. It is all very odd, certainly. Do you mind showing me the watch? He detached it from his waistcoat, chain and all, and passed it to me without a word. The case was of gold, very thick and strong, and singularly engraved. After closely examining the dial and observing that it was nearly twelve o'clock, I opened it at the back and was interested to observe an inner case of ivory, upon which was painted a miniature portrait in that exquisite and delicate manner which was in vogue during the eighteenth century. Why, bless my soul, I exclaimed, feeling a sharp artistic delight. How under the sun did you get that done? I thought miniature painting on ivory was a lost art. That, he replied, gravely smiling, is not I. It is my excellent great-grandfather, the late Bramwell Alcott Bartine, Esquire of Virginia. He was younger then than later, about my age, in fact. It is said to resemble me. Do you think so? Resemble you? I should say so. Barring the costume which I supposed you to have assumed out of compliment to the art, or for a resemblance, so to say, and the no moustache, that portrait is you in every feature, line, and expression. No more was said at the time. Bartin took a book from the table and began reading. I heard outside the incessant plash of the rain in the street. There were occasional hurried footfalls on the sidewalks and once a slower, heavier tread seemed to seize at my door. A policeman, I thought, seeking shelter in the doorway. The boughs of the trees tapped significantly on the window panes, as if asking for admittance. I remember it all through these years, and years of a wiser, graver life. Seeing myself unobserved, I took the old-fashioned key that dangled from the chain, and quickly turned back the hands of the watch a full hour. Then, closing the case, I handed Bartin his property, and saw him replace it on his person. I think you said, I began with assumed carelessness, that after eleven the sight of the dial no longer affects you. As it is now nearly twelve, looking at my own timepiece, perhaps if you don't resent my pursuit of proof, you will look at it now. He smiled good-humouredly, pulled out the watch again, opened it, and instantly sprang to his feet with a cry that heaven has not had the mercy to permit me to forget. His eyes, their blackness strikingly intensified by the pallor of his face, were fixed upon the watch, which he clutched in both hands. For some time he remained in that attitude without uttering another sound. Then in a voice I should not have recognized as his, he said, Damn you! It is two minutes to eleven! I was not prepared for some such outbreak, and without rising replied calmly enough, I beg your pardon, I must have misread your watch in setting my own by it. He shut the case with a sharp snap and put the watch in his pocket. He looked at me and made an attempt to smile, but his lower lip quivered and he seemed unable to close his mouth. His hands also were shaking, and he thrust them clenched into the pockets of his sack-coat. The courageous spirit was manifestly endeavouring to subdue the coward body. The effort was too great. He began to sway from side to side, as from vertigo, and before I could spring from my chair to support him, his knees gave way and he pitched awkwardly forward and fell upon his face. I sprang to assist him to rise. But when John Bartine rises, we shall all rise. The post-mortem examination disclosed nothing. Every organ was normal and sound. But when the body had been prepared for burial, a faint dark circle was seen to have developed around the neck. At least I was so assured by several persons who said they saw it. But of my own knowledge, I cannot say if that was true. Nor can I set limitations to the law of heredity. I do not know that in the spiritual world a sentiment or emotion may not survive the heart that held it, and seek expression in a kindred life, ages removed. 
surely if i were to guess at the fate of bramwell orchid bartin i should say that he was hanged at eleven o'clock in the evening and that he had been allowed several hours in which to prepare for the change as for john bartin my friend my patient for five minutes and heaven forgive me my victim for eternity there is no more to say he is buried and his watch with him i saw to that may god rest his soul in paradise and the soul of his virginian ancestor if indeed they are two souls end of john bartin's watch by ambrose bierce read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama the whisperers by algernon blackwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read for you by chiquito crasto the whisperers by algernon blackwood to be too impressionable is as much a source of weakness as to be hypersensitive so many messages come flooding in upon one another that confusion is the result the mind chokes imagination grows congested jones as an imaginative writing man was well aware of this yet could not always prevent it for if he dulled his mind to one impression he ran the risk of blunting it to all to guard his main idea and picket it safe conduct through the seed of additions that instantly flocked to join it was a psychological puzzle that sometimes overtaxed his powers of critical selection he prepared for it however an editor would ask him for a story about five thousand words you know and jones would answer i'll send it to you with pleasure when it comes he knew his difficulty too well to promise more ideas were never lacking but their length of treatment belonged to machinery he could not coerce they were alive they refused to come to heel to suit mere editors midway in a tale that stared crystal clear and definite in its original germ would pour a flood of new impressions that either smothered the first conception or developed it beyond recognition often a short story exfoliated in this bursting way beyond his power to stop it he began one never knowing where it would lead him it was ever an adventure like jack the giant killer's beanstalk it grew secretly in the night fed by everything he read saw felt or heard jones was too impressionable he received too many impressions and too easily for this reason when working at a definite short idea he preferred an empty room without pictures furniture books or anything suggestive and with a skylight that shut out scenery just ink blank paper and a clear picture in his mind his own interior unstimulated by the geysers of external life he made some preference of regulating though even under these favorable conditions the matter was not too easy so prolifically does a sensitive mind engender his experience in the empty room of the carpenter's house was a curious case in point in the little jura village where his cousin lived to educate his children we're all in a pension above the post office here the cousin wrote but just now the house is full and besides it's rather noisy i've taken an attic room for you at the carpenters near the forest some things of mine have been stored there all the winter but i moved the cases out this morning there's a bed writing table washstand sofa and a skylight window otherwise empty as i know you prefer it you can have your meals with us etc and this suited jones who had six weeks work on hand for which he needed empty solitude his idea was slight and very tender accretions would easily smother clear presentment its treatment must be delicate simple unconfused the room really was an attic but large wide high he heard the wind rush past the skylight when he went to bed when the cupboard was open he heard the wind there too washing the outer walls and tiles from his pillow he saw a patch of stars peep down upon him jones knew the mountains and the woods were close but he could not see them better still he could not smell them 
and he went to bed dead tired, full of his theme for work next morning. He saw it to the end. He could almost have promised five thousand words. With the dawn he would be up and at it, for he usually woke very early, his mind surcharged, as though subconsciousness had matured the material in sleep. Cold bath, a cup of tea, and then his writing table. And the quicker he could reach the writing table, the richer was the content of imaginative thought. What had puzzled him the night before was invariably cleared up in the morning. Only illness could interfere with the process and routine of it. But this time it was otherwise. He woke and instantly realized, with a shock of surprise and disappointment, that his mind was groping. It was groping for his little lost idea. There was nothing physically wrong with him. He felt rested, fresh, clear-headed. But his brain was searching, searching, moreover, in a crowd, trying to seize hold of the train it had relinquished several hours ago. It caught at an evasive empty shell. The idea had utterly changed, or rather it seemed smothered by a host of new impressions that came pouring in upon it, new modes of treatment, points of view, in fact development. In the light of these extensions and novel aspects, his original idea had altered beyond recognition. The germ had marvellously exfoliated, so that a whole volume could alone express it. An army of fresh suggestions clamoured for expression. His subconsciousness had grown thick with life. It surged, active, crowded, tumultuous. And the darkness puzzled him. He remembered the absence of accustomed windows. But it was only when the candlelight brought close the face of his watch, with two o'clock upon it, that he heard the sound of confused whispering in the corners of the room, and realized with a little twinge of fear that those who whispered had just been standing beside his very bed. The room was full. Though the candlelight proclaimed it empty, bare walls, bare floors, five pieces of unimaginative furniture, and fifty stars peeping through the skylight, it was undeniably thronged with living people whose minds had called him out of heavy sleep. The whispers, of course, died off into the wind that swept the roof and skylight. But the whisperers remained. They had been trying to get at him. Waking suddenly, he had caught them in the very act. And all had brought new interpretations with them. His thought had fundamentally altered. The original idea was snowed under. New images brimmed his mind. And his brain was working as it worked under the high pressure of creative moments. Joan sat up, trembling a little and stared about him into the empty room that yet was densely packed with these invisible whisperers. And he realized this astonishing thing, that he was the object of their deliberate assault, and that scores of other minds, deep, powerful, very active minds, were thundering and beating upon the doors of his imagination. The onset of them was terrific and bewildering. The attack of aggressive ideas obliterating his original story beneath a flood of new suggestions. Inspiration had become suddenly torrential, yet so vast as to be unwieldy, incoherent, useless. It was like the tempest of images that fever brings. His first conception seemed no longer delicate, but petty. It had turned unreal and tiny, compared with this enormous choice of treatment. Extension development, that now overwhelmed his throbbing brain. Fear caught vividly at him, as he searched the empty attic room, in vain for explanation. There was absolutely nothing to produce this tempest of new impressions. People seemed to be talking to him altogether, jumbled somewhat, but insistently. It was obsession rather than inspiration, and so bitingly dreadfully real. Who are you all? His mind whispered to blank walls and vacant corners. Back from the shouting floor and the ceiling came the chorus of images that stormed and clamoured for expression. Jones lay still and listened. He let them come. There was nothing else to do. He lay fearful, negative, receptive. It was all too big for him to manage, set to some scale of high achievement that submerged his own small powers. 
It came, too, in a series of impressions, all separate, yet all somehow interwoven. In vain he tried to sort them out and sift them, as well sort out waves upon an agitated sea. They were too self-assertive for direction or control. Like wild animals, hungry, thirsty, ravening, they rushed from every side and fastened on his mind. Yet he perceived them in a certain sequence. For first, the unfurnished attic chamber was full of human passion, of love and hate, revenge and wicked cunning, of jealousy, courage, cowardice, of every vital human emotion ever longed for, enjoyed or frustrated, all clamouring for expression. Flaming across and through these, incongruously threaded in and out, ran next a yearning softness of incredible beauty that sighed in the empty spaces of his heart, pleading for impossible fulfilment. And, after these, carrying both one and other upon their surface, huge questions have flashed and dived and thundered in a patterned wild entanglement, calling to be unraveled and made straight. Moreover, with every set came a new suggested treatment of the little clear idea he had taken to bed with him five hours before. Jones adopted each in turn. Imagination writhed and twisted beneath the stress of all these potential modes of expression he must choose between. His small idea exfoliated into many volumes, work enough to fill a dozen lives. It was most gorgeously exhilarating, though so hopelessly unmanageable. He felt like many minds in one. Then came another chain of impressions, violent, yet steady owing to their depth. The voices, questions, pleadings turned to pictures, and he saw, struggling through the deeps of him, enormous quantities of people, passing along like rivers, massed, herded, swayed here and there by some outstanding figure of command who directed them like flowing water. They shrieked and fought and battled, then sank out of sight, huddled and destroyed in blood. And their places were taken instantly by white crowds with shining eyes and yearning in their faces, who climbed precipitous heights towards some radiance that ever kept out of sight, like sunrise behind mountains that clouds then swallow. The pelt and thunder of images was destructive in its torrent. His little first idea was drowned and wrecked. Jones sank back exhausted, utterly dismayed. He gave up all attempt to make selection. The driving storm swept through him, on and on, now waxing, now waning, but never growing less, and apparently endless as the sky. It rushed in circles, like the turning of a giant wheel. All the activities that human minds have ever battled with since thought began came booming, crashing, straining for expression against the imaginative stuff whereof his mind was built. The walls began to yield and settle. It was like the chaos that madness brings. He did not struggle against it. He let it come, lying open and receptive, pliant and plastic to every detail of the vast invasion. And the only time he attempted a complete obedience, reaching out for his pencil and notebook that lay beside his bed, he desisted instantly again, sinking back upon his pillows with a kind of frightened laughter for the tempest seemed then to knock him down and bruise his very brain. Inextricable confusion caught him. He might as well have tried to make notes of the entire Alexandrian library in half an hour. Then, most singular of all, as he felt the sleep of exhaustion fall upon his tired nerves, he heard that deep, prodigious sound. All that had proceeded, it gathered marvellously in mothering it with a sweetness that seemed to his imagination like some harmonious geometrical skein, including all the activities men's minds have ever known. Faintly he realized it only, discerned from infinitely far away. Into the stream of apparent contradiction that roared so strenuously about him, it seemed to bring some hint of unifying harmonious explanation. And, here and there, as sleep buried him, he imagined that chords lay threaded along strings of cadences, breaking sometimes into melody, 
music that rose everywhere from life and wove thought into a homogeneous whole. Sleep well? His cousin inquired when he appeared very late next day for déjeuner. Think you'll be able to work in that room all right? I slept. Yes, thanks, said Jones. No doubt I shall work there right enough when I'm rested. By the by, he asked presently, what has the attic been used for lately? What's been in it, I mean? Books, only books, was the reply. I've stored my library there for months, without a chance of using it. I moved about so much, you see. Five hundred books were taken out just before you came. I often think, he added lightly, that when books are unopened like that for too long, the minds that wrote them must get restless and... What sort of books were they? Jones interrupted. Fiction, poetry, philosophy, history, religion, music. I've got two hundred books on music alone. End of The Whisperers by Algernon Blackwood Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Roll Call of the Reef by Arthur Quiller Couch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Roll Call of the Reef by Arthur Quiller Couch. Yes, sir, said my host, the quarryman, reaching down the relics from their hook in the wall over the chimney piece. They've hung here all my time and most of my father's. The women won't touch em. They're afraid of the story. So here they'll dangle and gather dust and smoke till another tenant comes and tosses em out of doors for rubbish. Phew! Tis coarse weather, surely. He went to the door, opened it, and stood studying the gale that beat upon his cottage front, straight from the manacle reef. The rain drove past him into the kitchen, a slant like threads of gold silk in the shine of the wreckwood fire. Meanwhile, by the same firelight, I examined the relics on my knee. The metal of each was tarnished out of knowledge, but the trumpet was evidently an old cavalry trumpet, and the threads of its party-coloured sling, though fretted and dusty, still hung together. Around the side drum, beneath its cracked brown varnish, I could hardly trace a royal coat of arms and a legend running. Per mar per terrain the motto of the marines. Its parchment, though black and scented with wood smoke, was limp and mildewed, and I began to tighten up the straps, under which the drumsticks had been loosely thrust, with the idle purpose of trying if some music might be got out of the old drum yet. But as I turned it on my knee, I found the drum attached to the trumpet sling by a curious barrel-shaped padlock, and paused to examine this, the body of the lock was composed of half a dozen brass rings set accurately edge to edge, and rubbing the brass with my thumb, I saw that each of the six had a series of letters engraved around it. I knew the tricks of it, I thought. Here was one of those word padlocks, once so common, only to be opened by getting the rings to spell a certain word, which the dealer confides to you. My host shut and barred the door and came back to the hearth. "'Twas just such a wind, east by south, that brought in what you've got between your hands. Back in the year nine, it was, my father has told me the tale a score of times. You're twisting round the rings, I see. But you'll never guess the word. Parson Kendall, he made the word, and he locked down a couple of ghosts in their graves with it. And when his time came, he went to his own grave and took the word with him. Whose ghosts, Matthew? You want the story, I see, sir. My father could tell it better than I can. He was a young man in the year nine, unmarried at the time, and living in this very cottage, just as I be. That's how he came to get mixed up with the tale. He took a chair, lighted a short pipe, and went on with his eyes fixed on the dancing violet flames. 
Yes, he had been about thirty year old in January, eighteen nine. The storm got up in the night of the twenty-first of that month. My father was dressed and out long before daylight. He never was one to bide in bed. Let be that the gale by this time was pretty near lifting the thatch over his head. Besides which, he'd fenced a small tatty patch that winter, down by Lowland Point, and he wanted to see if it stood the night's work. He took the path across Gunner's Meadow, where they buried most of the bodies afterward. The wind was right in his teeth at the time, and once on the way, he told me this often, a great strip of oarweed came flying through the darkness and fetched him a slap on the cheek like a cold hand. But he made shift pretty well till he got to Lowland, and then had to drop down upon hands and knees and crawl, digging his fingers every now and then into the shingle to hold on. For he declared to me that the stones, some of them as big as a man's head, kept rolling and driving past till it seemed the whole foreshore was moving westward under him. The fence was gone, of course, not a stick left to show where it stood so that, when first he came to the place, he thought he must have missed his bearings. My father, sir, was a very religious man, and if he reckoned the end of the world was at hand, there in the great wind and night, among the moving stones, you may believe he was certain of it when he heard a gun fired, and, with the same, saw a flame shoot up out of the darkness to windward, making a sudden fierce light in all the place about. All he could find to think or say was, The second coming, the second coming. The bridegroom cometh, and the wicked he will toss like a ball into a large country. And being already upon his knees, he just bowed his head and bided, saying this over and over. But by and by, between two squalls, he made bold to lift his head and look. And then by the light, a bluish colour it was, he saw all the coast clear way to Manacle Point, and of the Manacles in the thick of the weather, a sloop of war with top gallant's house driving stern foremost toward the reef. It was she, of course, that was burning the flare. My father could see the white streak and the ports of her quite plain as she rose to it, a little outside the breakers and he guessed easy enough that her captain had just managed to wear ship and was trying to force her nose to the sea with the help of her small bower anchor and a scrap or two of canvas that hadn't yet been blown out of her. But while he looked, she fell off, giving her broadside to it foot by foot and drifting back on the breakers around Camp Dew and the Varses. The rocks lie so thick thereabout that twas a toss-up, which she struck first. At any rate, my father couldn't tell at the time, for just then the flare died down and went out. Well, sir, he turned then in the dark and started for Coverock to cry about the dismal tidings, though well-knowing ship and crew to be past any hope and as he turned, the wind lifted him and tossed him forward like a ball, as he'd been saying, and homeward along the foreshore. As you know, tis ugly work, even by daylight, picking your way among the stones there, and my father was prettily knocked about at first in the dark. But by this it was nearer seven than six o'clock, and the day spreading. By the time he reached North Corner, a man could see to read print, Howsoever, he looked neither out to sea nor toward Coverock, but headed straight for the first cottage, the same that stands above North Corner today. A man named Billy Eddy lived there then, and when my father burst into the kitchen bawling, Rack, Rack, he saw Billy Eddy's wife, Anne, standing there in her clogs with a shawl over her head and her clothes wringing wet. Save the chap, says Billy Eddy's wife, Anne. What do you mean by crying stale fish at that rate? But tis a wreck, I tell ye. I was eaten too, and so has every one with an eye in his head. And with that she pointed straight over my father's shoulder, and he turned, and there, close under Dollar Point at the end of Coverock Town, he saw another wreck washing, 
at the point black with people like emmets running to and fro in the morning light while he stood staring at her he heard a trumpet sounded on board the notes coming in little jerks like a bird rising against the wind but faintly of course because of the distance and the gale blowing though this had dropped a little she's a transport said billy eddy's wife anne and full of horse soldiers fine long men when she struck they must have pitched the horses over first to lighten the ship for a score of dead horses had washed in a four i left half an hour back and three or four soldiers too fine long corpses and white breeches and jackets of blue and gold i held a lantern to one such a straight young man my father asked her about the trumpeting that's the queerest bit of all she was burning a light when me and my man joined the crowd down there all her masts had gone whether they carried away or were just cut away to ease her i don't rightly know her keelson was broke under her and her bottom sagged and stove and she had just settled down like a sitting hen just the leastest list to starboard but a man could stand there easy they had rigged up ropes across her from bulwark to bulwark and besides these the men were mustered holding on like grim death whenever the sea made a clean breach over them and standing up like heroes as soon as it passed the captain and the officers were clinging to the rail of the quarter-deck all in their golden uniforms waiting for the end as if twas king george they expected there was no way to help for she lay right beyond cast of line though our folk tried it fifty times and besides them clung a trumpeter a whacking big man and between the heavy seas he would lift his trumpet with one hand and blow a call and every time he blew the men gave a cheer there she says hark ye now there he goes again but ye won't hear no cheering any more for few are left to cheer and their voice is weak bitter cold the wind is and i reckon it numbs their grip o the ropes for they were dropping off fast with every sea when my man sent me home to get his breakfast another wreck you say well there's no hope for the tender dears if tis the manacles you'd better run down and help yonder though tis little help any man can give not one came in alive while i was there the tide's flowing and she won't hold together another hour they say well sure enough the end was coming fast when my father got down to the point six men had been cast up alive or just breathing a seaman and five troopers the seaman was the only one that had breath to speak and while they carried him into the town the word went round that the ship's name was the dispatch transport homeward bound from coruna with a detachment of the seven hushers that had been fighting out there with sir john moore the seas had rolled her further over by this time and given her decks a pretty sharp slope but a dozen men still held on seven by the ropes near the ship's waist a couple near the break of the poop and three on the quarter deck of these three my father made out one to be the skipper close by him clung an officer in full regimentals his name they heard after was captain duncanfield and last came the tall trumpeter and if you'll believe me the fellow was making shift there at the very last to blow god save the king what's more he got to send us victorious before an extra big sea came bursting across and washed them off the deck every man but one of the pair beneath the poop and he dropped his hold before the next wave being stunned i reckon the others went out of sight at once but the trumpeter being as i said a powerful man as well as a tough swimmer rose like a duck rode out a couple of breakers and came in on the crest of the third the folks looked to see him broke like an egg at their very feet but when the smother cleared there he was lying face downward on a ledge below them and one of the men that happened to have a rope round him i forget the fellow's name if i ever heard it jumped down and grabbed him by the ankle as he began to slip back before the next big sea the pair were hauled high enough to be out of harm 
and another heave brought them up to grass. Quick work. But Master Trumpeter wasn't quite dead. Nothing worse than a cracked head and three staved ribs. In twenty minutes or so they had him in bed with the doctor to tend him. Now was the time, nothing being left alive upon the transport, for my father to tell of the sloop he'd seen driving upon the manacles. And when he got a hearing, though the most were set upon salvage, and believed the wreck in the hand, so to say, to be worth half a dozen they couldn't see, a few good volunteers to start off with him and have a look. They crossed Lowland Point. No ship to be seen on the manacles, nor anywhere upon the sea. One or two was for calling my father a liar. "'Wait till we come to Dean Point,' said he. Sure enough, on the far side of Dean Point, they found the sloop's mainmast washing about with half a dozen men lashed to it. Men in red jackets, every mother's son drowned and staring. And a little further on, just under the Dean, three or four bodies cast up on the shore, one of them a small drummer boy, side drum and all, and nearby part of a ship's gig with HMS Primrose cut on the sternboard. From this point on, the shore was littered thick with wreckage and dead bodies, the most of them marines in uniform, and in Godrevy's cove, in particular, a heap of furniture from the captain's cabin, and among it a watertight box, not much damaged and full of papers, by which, when it came to be examined next day, the wreck was easily made out to be the primrose of eighteen guns outward bound from Portsmouth with a fleet of transports for the Spanish War. Thirty sail, I've heard, but I've never heard what became of them. Being handled by merchant skippers, no doubt, they rode out the gale and reached the Tagus safe and sound. Not but what the captain of the Primrose, mine was his name, did quite right to try and club-haul his vessel when he found himself under the land, only he never ought to have got there, if he took proper soundings. But it's easy talking. The Primrose, sir, was a handsome vessel, for her size one of the handsomest in the King's service, and newly fitted out at Plymouth Dock. So the boys had brave pickings from her in the way of brass work, ship's instruments and the like, let alone some barrels of stores not much spoiled. They loaded themselves with as much as they could carry and started for home, meaning to make a second journey before the preventive men got wind of their doings and came to spoil the fun. Hello, says my father, and dropped his gear. I do believe there's a leg moving. And running for, he stooped over the small drummer boy that I told you about. The poor little chap was lying there with his face a mass of bruises and his eyes closed, but he had shifted one leg an inch or two and was still breathing. So my father pulled out a knife and cut him free from his drum that was latched on to him with a double turn of manila rope, and took him up and carried him along there to this very room that we're sitting in. He lost a good deal by this, for when he went back to fetch the bundle he dropped, the preventive men had got hold of it and were thick as thieves along the foreshore, so that twas only by paying one or two to look the other way that he picked up anything worth carrying off which you'll allow to be hard, seeing that he was the first man to give news of the wreck. Well, the inquiry was held, of course, and my father gave evidence, and for the rest they had to trust to the sloop's papers, for not a soul was saved besides the drummer boy, and he was raving in a fever, brought on by the cold and the fright. And the seamen and the five troopers gave evidence about the loss of the dispatch, the tall trumpeter, too, whose ribs were healing, came forward and kissed the book. But somehow his head had been hurt in coming ashore, and he talked foolish-like. And it was easy seen he would never be a proper man again. The others were taken up to Plymouth, and so went their ways. But the trumpeter stayed on in Coverock, and King George, finding he was fit for nothing, sent him down a trifle of a pension after a while, enough to keep him in board and lodging, with a bit of tobacco over. Now, the first time that this man, William Talifer, he called himself, met with the drummer boy, was about a fortnight after the little chap had bettered enough to be allowed a short walk out of doors, which he took, if you please, in full regimentals, 
there never was a soldier so proud of his dress. His own suit had shrunk a brave bit with the salt water, but into ordinary frock and corduroys he declared he would not get, not if he had to go naked the rest of his life. So my father, being a good-natured man, handy with the needle, turned to and repaired damages with a piece or two of scarlet cloth cut from the jacket of one of the drowned marines. Well, the poor little chap chanced to be standing in this rig-out, down by the gate of Gunner's Meadow, where they had buried two score and over of his comrades. The morning was a fine one, early in March month, and along came the cracked trumpeter, likewise taking a stroll. Hello, says he. Good morning, and what might you be doing here? I was a wishing, says the boy. I had a pair of drumsticks. Our lads were buried yonder without so much as a drum tapped or a musket fired. And that's not Christian burial for British soldiers. Foot, <laughs> says the trumpeter and spat on the ground. A parcel of marines. The boy eyed him a second or so and answered up. If I'd a tav of turf handy, I'd bung it at your mouth, you greasy cavalryman, and learn you to speak respectful of your betters. The marines are the handiest body of men in the service. The trumpeter looked down on him from the height of six foot two and asked, Did they die well? They died very well. There was a lot of running to and fro at first, and some of the men began to cry and a few to strip off their clothes. But when the ship fell off for the last time, Captain Mine turned and said something to Major Griffiths, the commanding officer on board, and the Major called out to me to beat to quarters. It might have been for a wedding. He sang it out so cheerful. We'd had word already that twas to be a parade order, and the men fell in as trim and decent as if they were going to church, one or two even trying to shave at the last moment. The Major wore his medals. One of the seeing I had worked to keep the drum steady, the sling being a bit loose for me, and the wind, what you remember, lashed it tight with a piece of rope, and that saved my life afterward, a drum being as good as a cork until it's stove. I kept beating away until every man was on decks, and then the major formed them up and told them to die like British soldiers. And the chaplain was in the middle of a prayer when she struck. In ten minutes she was gone. That was how they died, cavalrymen. And that was very well done, drummer of the marines. What's your name? John Christian. Mine's William George Talifer, trumpeter of the Seventh Light Dragoons, the Queen's Own. I played God Save the King while our men were drowning. Captain Duncanfield told me to sound a call or two, to put them in heart. But that matter of God save the king was a notion of my own. I won't say anything to hurt the feelings of a marine, even if he's not much over five foot tall. But the Queen's own hussars is a tearing fine regiment. As between horse and foot, tis a question of who gets a chance. All the way from Sahagun to Coruna, twas we that took and gave the knocks at Mayorga and Rueda and Benevente. The reason, sir, I can speak the name so pat, is that my father learned him by heart afterward from the trumpeter, who was always talking about Mayorga and Rueda and Benevente. We made the rear guard under gentle Paget, drove the French every time, and all the infantry did was to sit about in wine shops till we whipped him out and steal and straggle and play the tomfool in general. And when it came to a stand-up fight at Coruna, it was we that had to stay seasick aboard the transports and watch the infantry in the thick of the caper. Very well they behaved to, especially the 4th Regiment, and the 42nd Highlanders, and the dirty half-hundred. Oh, aye, they're decent regiments all three, but the Queen's own hushers is a tearing fine regiment. So you played on your drum when the ship was going down. Drummer John Christian, I'll have to get you a new pair of sticks. The very next day the trumpeter marched into Helston and got a carpenter there to turn him a pair of boxwood drumsticks for the boy. And this was the beginning of one of the most curious friendships you ever heard tell of. Nothing delighted the pair more than to borrow a boat of my father and pull out to the rocks where the primrose and the dispatch had struck and sunk. And on still days it was pretty to hear them out there off the manacles, the drummer playing his tattoo for they always took their music with them, 
and the trumpeter practising calls and making his trumpet speak like an angel. But if the weather turned roughish, they'd be walking together and talking. Leastwise the youngster listened while the other discoursed about Sir John's campaign in Spain and Portugal, telling how each little skirmish befell, and of Sir John himself and General Baird and General Paget and Colonel Vivian, his own commanding officer, and what kind of men they were and of the last bloody stand-up at Coruna, and so forth, as if neither could have enough. But all this had to come to an end in the late summer, for the boy, John Christian, being now well and strong again, must go up to Plymouth to report himself. Twas his own wish, for I believe King George had forgotten all about him. But his friend wouldn't hold him back. As for the trumpeter, my father had made an arrangement to take him on as lodger, as soon as the boy left, and on the morning fixed for the start, he was up at the door here by five o'clock, with his trumpet slung by his side, and all the rest of his belongings in a small valise. A Monday morning it was, and after breakfast he had fixed to walk with the boy some way on the road toward Helston, where the coach started. My father left them at breakfast together, and went out to meet the pig, and do a few odd morning jobs of that sort. When he came back, the boy was still at table, and the trumpeter sat with the rings in his hands, hitched together just as they be at this moment. "'Look at this,' he says to my father, showing him the lock. "'I picked it off a starving brass worker in Lisbon, and it is not one of your common locks that one word of six letters will open at any time. There's genius in this lock, for you only to make the rings spell any six-letter word you please and snap down the lock upon that.' and never a soul can open it, not the maker even, until somebody comes along that knows the word you snapped it on. Now Johnny here's going, and he leaves his drum behind him, for though he can make pretty music on it, the parchment sags in wet weather, by reason of the sea water getting at it, and if he carries it to Plymouth, they'll only condemn it and give him another. And as for me, I shan't have the heart to put lip to the trumpet any more when Johnny's gone, so we've chosen a word together and locked him together upon that, and by your leave, I'll hang him here together on the hook over your fireplace. Maybe Johnny'll come back, maybe not. Maybe if he comes, I'll be dead and gone, and he'll take em apart and try their music for old sake's sake. But if he never comes, nobody can separate them, for nobody besides knows the word." And if you marry and have sons, you can tell them that here are tied together the souls of Johnny Christian, drummer of the Marines, and William George Talifer, once trumpeter of the Queen's own hussars, amen. With that, he hung the two instruments upon the hook there, and the boy stood up and thanked my father and shook hands, and the pair went out of the door toward Helston. Somewhere on the road, they took leave of one another. Nobody saw the parting, nor heard what was said between them. About three in the afternoon the trumpeter came walking back over the hill, and by the time my father came home from the fishing, the cottage was tidied up and the tea ready and the whole place shining like a new pin. From that time, for five years, he lodged here with my father, looking after the house and tilling the garden, and all the while he was steadily failing, the hurt in his head spreading in a manner to his limbs. My father watched the feebleness growing on him, but said nothing, and from first to last neither spake a word about the drummer John Christian, nor did any letter reach them, nor word of his doings. The rest of the tale you're free to believe, sir, or not, as you please. It stands upon my father's words, and he always declared he was ready to kiss the book upon it, before judge and jury. He said, too, that he never had the wit to make up such a yarn and he defied any one to explain about the lock in particular by any other tale. But you shall judge for yourself. My father said that about three o'clock in the morning, April 14th of the year 14, he and William Talifer were sitting here, just as you and I, sir, are sitting now. My father had put on his clothes a few minutes before, and was mending his pillar by the light of the horn lantern meaning to set off before daylight to haul the trammel. The trumpeter hadn't been to bed at all. 
Toward the last, he mostly spent his nights and his days to dozing in the elbow chair where you sit at this minute. He was dozing then, my father said, with his chin dropped forward on his chest, when a knock sounded upon the door, and the door opened, and in walked an upright young man in scarlet regimentals. He had grown a brave bit, and his face the colour of wood ashes. But it was the drummer, John Christian. Only his uniform was different from the one he used to wear, and the figures, thirty-eight, shone in brass upon his collar. The drummer walked past my father, as if he never saw him, and stood by the elbow chair and said, Trumpeter, trumpeter, are you one with me? And the trumpeter just lifted the lids of his eyes and answered, How should I not be one with you, drummer Johnny? Johnny, boy, if you come, I count. If you march, I mark time, until the discharge comes. The discharge has come tonight, said the drummer, and the word is Coruna no longer. And stepping to the chimney place, he unhooked the drum and trumpet and began to twist the brass rings of the lock, spelling the word aloud, so, C-O-R-U-N-A. When he had fixed the last letter, the padlock opened in his hand. Did you know, trumpeter, that when I came to Plymouth, they put me into a line regiment? The 38th is a good regiment, answered the old hussar, still in his dull voice. I went back with them from Sahagun to Coruna. At Coruna they stood in General Fraser's division, on the right. They behaved well. But I'd fain see the Marines again, says the drummer, handing him the trumpet. And you, you shall call once more for the Queen's own. Matthew, he says, suddenly, turning on my father. And when he turned, my father saw, for the first time, that his scarlet jacket had a round hole by the breastbone, and that the blood was welling there. Matthew, we shall want your boat. Then my father rose on his legs like a man in a dream, while they two slung on, the one his drum and the other his trumpet. He took the lantern and went quaking before them down to the shore, and they breathed heavily behind him, and they stepped into his boat, and my father pushed off. Row you first for Dollar Point, says the drummer. So my father rode them past the white houses of Coverock to Dollar Point, and there, at a word, lay on his oars. And the trumpeter, William Talifer, put his trumpet to his mouth and sounded the reveille. The music of it was like rivers running. They will follow, said the drummer. Matthew, pull you now for the manacles. So my father pulled for the manacles and came to an easy close outside Carn Dew. And the drummer took his sticks and beat a tattoo, there by the edge of the reef, and the music of it was like a rolling chariot. That will do, says he, breaking off. They will follow. Pull now for the shore under Gunner's Meadow. Then my father pulled for the shore and ran his boat in under Gunner's Meadow. And they stepped out, all three, and walked up to the meadow. By the gate, the drummer halted and began his tattoo again, looking out toward the darkness over the sea. And while the drum beat and my father held his breath, there came up out of the sea and the darkness a troop of many men, horse and foot, and formed up among the graves, and others rose out of the graves and formed up, drowned marines with bleached faces and pale hussars riding their horses, all lean and shadowy. There was no clatter of hoofs or accoutrements, my father said, but a soft sound all the while, like the beating of a bird's wing, and a black shadow lay like a pool about the feet of all. The drummer stood upon a little knoll just inside the gate, and beside him the tall trumpeter with hand on hip watching them gather, and behind them both my father clinging to the gate. When no more came, the drummer stopped playing and said, Call the roll. Then the trumpeter stepped forward toward the end man of the rank and called, Troop Sergeant Major Thomas Irons. And the man answered in a thin voice, Here, Troop Sergeant Major Thomas Irons. How is it with you? The man answered, How should it be with me? When I was young, I betrayed a girl, and when I was grown, I betrayed a friend, and for these I must pay. But I died as a man ought, God save the king. The trumpeter called to the next man. Trooper Henry Buckingham. 
The next man answered, Here. Trooper Henry Buckingham, how is it with you? How should it be with me? I was a drunkard, and I stole, and in Lugo, in a wine shop, I killed a man. But I died as a man should God save the king. So the trumpeter went down the line, and when he had finished, the drummer took it up, hailing the dead marines in their order. Each man answered to his name, and each man ended with, God save the king. When all were hailed, the drummer stepped back to his mound and called, It is well, you are content, and we are content to join you. Wait now a little while. With this he turned and ordered my father to pick up the lantern and lead the way back. As my father picked it up, he heard the ranks of the dead men cheer and call, God save the king, all together, and saw them waver and fade back into the dark like a breath fading off a pane. But when they came back here to the kitchen, and my father set the lantern down, it seemed they both forgot about him. But the drummer turned in the lantern light, and my father could see the blood still welling out of the hole in his breast, and took the trumpet sling from around the other's neck, and locked drum and trumpet together again, choosing the letters on the lock very carefully. While he did this, he said, The word is no more Corona, but Bayon. As you left out an N in Corona, so must I leave out an N in Bayon. And before snapping the padlock, he spelt out the word slowly, B. A. Y. O. N. E. After that, he used no more speech, but turned and hung the two instruments back on the hook, and then took the trumpeter by the arm, and the pair walked out into the darkness, glancing neither to right nor left. My father was on the point of following when he heard a sort of sigh behind him, and there, sitting in the elbow chair, was the very trumpeter he had just seen walk out by the door. If my father's heart jumped before, you may believe it jumped quicker now. But after a bit, he went up to the man asleep in the chair and put a hand upon him. It was the trumpeter in flesh and blood that he touched. But though the flesh was warm, the trumpeter was dead. Well, sir, they buried him three days after. And at first my father was minded to say nothing about his dream, as he thought it. But the day after the funeral he met Parson Kendall coming from Helston Market, and the parson called out, "'Have ye heard the news the coach brought down this morning?' "'What news?' says my father. "'Why, that peace is agreed upon.' "'None too soon,' says my father. "'Not soon enough for our poor lads at Bayonne,' the parson answered. By own, cries my father with a jump. Why, yes, and the parson told him all about a great sally the French had made on the night of April 13th. Do you happen to know if the 38th Regiment was engaged? My father asked. Come now, said Parson Kendall. I didn't know you were so well up in the campaign. But as it happens, I do know that the 38th was engaged. If it was they that held the cottage and stopped the French advance. Still my father held his tongue, and when a week later he walked in Helston and bought a mercury of the Sherburn rider, and got the landlord of the Angel to spell out the list of killed and wounded, sure enough, there among the killed was drummer John Christian of the 38th foot. After this there was nothing for a religious man but to make a clean breast. So my father went up to Parson Kendall and told the whole story. The parson listened and put a question or two and then asked, Have you tried to open the lock since that night? I haven't dared to touch it, says my father. Then come along and try. When the parson came to the cottage here, he took the things off the hook and tried the lock. Did he say by own? The word has seven letters. Not if you spell it with one N, as he did, says my father. Parson spelt it out. B-A-Y-O-N-E. Phew, says he, for the lock had fallen open in his hand. He stood, considering it a moment, and then he says, I tell you what, 
I shouldn't blab this all round the parish if I was you. You'd get no credit for truth-telling, and a miracle's wasted on a set of fools. But if you like, I'll shut down the lock again upon a holy word that no one but me shall know, and neither drummer nor trumpeter, dead or alive, shall frighten the secret out of me. I wish to heaven you would, parson, says my father. Parson chose the holy word there and then, and shut the lock back upon it, and hung the drum and trumpet back in their place. He is gone long since, taking the word with him. And till the lock is broken by force, nobody will ever separate those two. End of The Roll Call of the Reef by Arthur Quiller Couch Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Mundina by Lafcadio Hearn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eleanor Sakamoto. Mujina by Lafcadio Hearn. On the Akasaka Road in Tokyo, there is a slope called Kino Kunizaka, which means the slope of the province of Ki. I do not know why it is called the slope of the province of Ki. On one side of this slope, you see an ancient moat, deep and very wide, with high green banks rising up to some place of gardens, and on the other side of the road extend the long and lofty walls of an imperial palace. Before the era of street lamps and jin rikshas, this neighborhood was very lonesome after dark, and belated pedestrians would go miles out of their way rather than mount the Kino Kunizaka alone after sunset all because of a mujina that used to walk there. The last man who saw the mujina was an old merchant of the Kyobashi quarter who died about thirty years ago. This is the story as he told it. One night, at a late hour, he was hurrying up the Kino Kunizaka when he perceived a woman crouching by the moat all alone and weeping bitterly. Fearing that she intended to drown herself, he stopped to offer her any assistance or consolation in his power. She appeared to be a slight and graceful person, handsomely dressed, and her hair was arranged like that of a young girl of good family. O oh, Joju, he exclaimed, approaching her, O oh, Joju, do not cry like that. Tell me what the trouble is, and if there be any way to help you, I shall be glad to help you. He really meant what he said, for he was a very kind man. But she continued to weep, hiding her face from him with one of her long sleeves. O oh, Joju, he said again, as gently as he could, Please, please listen to me. This is no place for a young lady at night. Do not cry, I implore you. Only tell me how I may be of some help to you. Slowly she rose up, but turned her back to him, and continued to moan and sob behind her sleeve. He laid his hand lightly upon her shoulder and pleaded, O oh, Joju, O oh, Joju, O oh, Joju, listen to me, just for one little moment. O oh, Joju, O oh, Joju. Then that Ojoji turned around and dropped her sleeve and stroked her face with her hand, and the man saw that she had no eyes or nose or mouth, and he screamed and ran away. Up Kino Kunizaka he ran and ran, and all was black and empty before him. On and on he ran, never daring to look back, and at last he saw a lantern, so far away that it looked like the gleam of a firefly, and he made for it. It proved to be only the lantern of an itinerant soba seller, who had set down his stand by the roadside, but any light and any human companionship was good after that experience, and he flung himself down at the feet of the soba seller, crying out, Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, ah! Oh. Kore, kore! roughly exclaimed the soba man. Here, what is the matter with you? Anybody hurt you? No, nobody hurt me, panted the other, only, ah! Oh, ah! Oh. Only scared you? queried the peddler unsympathetically. Robbers? Not robbers. Not robbers, gasped the terrified man. I saw, I saw a woman by the moat, and she showed me, I cannot tell you what she showed me. Heh, was it anything like this that she showed you? cried the soba man, stroking his own face, which therewith become like unto an egg, and simultaneously the light went out. End of Mujina
There is a Reaper by Charles V. Devet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eleanor Sakamoto. There is a Reaper by Charles V. Devet. The amber brown of the liquor disguised the poison it held, and I watched with a smile on my lips as he drank it. There was no pity in my heart for him. He was a jackal in the jungle of life, and I, I was one of the carnivores. It is the lot of the jackals of life to be devoured by the carnivore. Suddenly, the contented look on his face froze into a startled stillness. I knew he was feeling the first savage twinge of the agony that was to come. He turned his head and looked at me, and I saw suddenly that he knew what I had done. You murderer, he cursed me and then his body arched in the middle and his voice choked off deep in his throat. For a short minute he sat, tense, his body stiffened by the agony that rode it, unable to move a muscle. I watched the torment in his eyes build up to a crescendo of pain until the suffering became so great that it filmed his eyes, and I knew that, though he still stared directly at me, he no longer saw me. Then, as suddenly as the spasm had come, the starch went out of his body, and his back slid slowly down the chair edge. He landed heavily, with his head resting limply against the seat of the chair, his right leg doubled up in a kind of jerk before he was still. I knew the time had come. "'Where are you?' I asked. This moment had cost me sixty thousand dollars. Three weeks ago, the best doctors in the state had given me a month to live, and with seven million dollars in the bank, I couldn't buy a minute more. I accepted the doctor's decision philosophically, like the gambler that I am, but I had a plan, one which necessity had never forced me to use until now. Several years before, I had read an article about the medicine men of a certain tribe of aborigines living in the jungles at the source of the Amazon River. They had discovered a process in which the juice of a certain bush, known only to them, could be used to poison a man. Anyone subjected to this poison died, but for a few moments after the life left his body, the medicine men could still converse with him. The subject, though ostensibly and actually dead, answered the medicine men's every question. This was their primitive, though reportedly effective, method of catching glimpses of what lay in the world of death. I had conceived my idea at the time I read the article, but I had never had the need to use it, until the doctors gave me a month to live. Then I spent my sixty thousand dollars, and three weeks later I held in my hands a small bottle of the witch doctor's fluid. The next step was to secure my victim, my collaborator, I preferred to call him. The man I chose was nobody, a homeless, friendless, non-entity, picked up off the street. He had once been an educated man, but now he was only a bum, and when he died he'd never be missed a perfect man for my experiment. I am a rich man because I have a system. The system is simple. I never make a move until I know exactly where that move will lead me. My field of operations is the stock market. I spend money unstintingly to secure the information I need before I take each step. I hire the best investigators, bribe employees and persons in position to give me the information I want, and only when I am as certain as humanly possible that I cannot be wrong, do I move, and the system never fails. Seven million dollars in the bank is proof of that. Now, knowing that I could not live, I intended to make the system work for me one last time before I died. I am a firm believer in the adage that any situation can be whipped, given prior knowledge of its coming, and, of course, its attendant circumstances. For a moment he did not answer, and I began to fear that my experiment had failed. Where are you? I repeated louder and sharper this time. The small muscles about his eyes puckered with an unnormal tension, while the rest of his face held its death frost. Slowly, slowly, unnaturally, as though energized by some hyper-rational power, his lips and tongue moved. The words he spoke were clear. I am in a... a tunnel, he said. It is lighted, dimly, but there is nothing for me to see. 
blue vein showed through the flesh of his cheeks like watermarks on translucent paper. He paused, and I urged, Go on. I am alone, he said. The realities I knew no longer exist, and I am damp and cold. All about me is a sense of gloom and dejection. It is an apprehension, an emanation, so deep and real as to be almost a tangible thing. The walls to either side of me seem to be formed not of substance, but rather of the soundless cries of melancholy spirits I cannot see. I am waiting, waiting in the gloom for something which will come to me. That need to wait is an innate part of my being, and I have no thought of questioning it. His voice died again. What are you waiting for? I asked. I do not know, he said, his voice dreary with the despair of centuries of hopelessness. I only know that I must wait. That compulsion is greater than my strength to combat. The tone of his voice changed slightly. The tunnel about me is widening, and now the walls have receded into invisibility. The tunnel has become a plain but the plain is as desolate, as forlorn and dreary as was the tunnel, and still I stand and wait. How long must this go on? He fell silent again, and I was about to prompt him with another question. I could not afford to let the time run out in long sentences. But abruptly the muscles about his eyes tightened, and suddenly a new aspect replaced their hopeless dejection. Now they expressed a black, bottomless terror. For a moment, I marveled that so small a portion of the facial anatomy could express such horror. There is something coming toward me, he said. A beast of brutish foulness. Beast is too inadequate a term to describe it, but I know no words to tell its form. It is an intangible and evasive thing, but very real. And it is coming closer. It has no organs of sight as I know them, but I feel that it can see me, or rather that it is aware of me with a sense sharper than vision itself. It is very near now. Oh God, the malevolence, the hate, the potentiality of awful, fearsome destructiveness that is its very essence. And still I cannot move. The expression of terrified anticipation centered in his eyes lessened slightly and was replaced instantly by its former deep, deep despair. I am no longer afraid, he said. Why? I interjected. Why? I was impatient to learn all that I could before the end came. Because, he paused because it holds no threat for me. Somehow, some day, I understand, I know, that it too is seeking that for which I wait. What is it doing now? I asked. It has stopped beside me, and we stand together, gazing across the stark, empty plain. Now a second, awful entity with the same leashed virulence about it moves up and stands at my other side we all three wait myself with a dark fear of this dismal universe my unnatural companions with patient malicious menace bits of he faltered of i can name it only aura go out from the beasts like an acid stream, and touch me, and the hate and the venom chill my body like a wave of intense cold. Now there are others of the awful breed behind me. We stand, waiting, waiting for that which will come. What it is, I do not know. I could see the pallor of death creeping steadily into the last corners of his lips, and I knew that the end was not far away. Suddenly a black frustration built up within me. 
What are you waiting for? I screamed, the tenseness and the importance of this moment forcing me to lose the iron self-control upon which I have always prided myself. I knew that the answer held the secret of what I must know. If I could learn that, my experiment would not be in vain, and I could make whatever preparations were necessary for my own death. I had to know that answer. Think, think, I pleaded. What are you waiting for? I do not know. The dreary despair in his eyes, sightless as they met mine, chilled me with a coldness that I felt in the marrow of my being. I do not know, he repeated. I... Yes, I do know. Abruptly, the plasmatic film cleared from his eyes, and I knew that for the first time since the poison struck, he was seeing me clearly. I sensed that this was the last moment before he left for good. It had to be now. Tell me. I command you, I cried. What are you waiting for? His voice was quiet as he murmured softly, implacably, before he was gone. We are waiting, he said, for you. End of There is a Reaper The Three Brides by Francis A. Durivage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Three Brides by Francis A. Durivage. Toward the close of a chilly afternoon, in the latter part of last November, I was travelling in New Hampshire on horseback. The road was solitary and rugged, and wound along through gloomy pine forests and over abrupt and stony hills. Several circumstances conduced to my discomfort. I was not sure of my way. I had a hurt in my bridal hand, and evening was approaching, heralded by an icy rain and a cold, searching wind. I felt a sinking of spirits, which I could not dispel by rapid riding, for my horse, fatigued by a long day's journey, refused to answer spur and whip with his usual animation. In an hour after, I was convinced that I had mistaken my road, and night surprised me in the forest. I had been in more unpleasant situations, so I adopted my usual expedient of letting the reins fall upon my courser's neck. He, however, blundered on, with his nose drooping to the ground, stumbling every moment, though ordinarily as sure-footed as a roebuck. So we plodded on for a mile, while the landscape grew darker and darker. At length, finding my horse less intelligent or more despairing than myself, I resumed the rein and endeavoured to cheer my brute companion. To tell the truth, I stood in need of something exhilarating myself. The sombre air of the eternal pines struck a deathly gloom to my heart, as one by one they seemed to rise on my path, like threatening genie extending their scathed limbs to meet me. The rain, fine and cold, bedewed me from head to foot, and I question if a more miserable pair of animals ever threaded their way through the mazes of an enchanted forest. I thought of the comfortable home I had left for my forlorn pleasure excursion, of that cheerful hearth around which my family were gathered, of wine, music, love, and the thousand endearments I had left behind. And then I gazed into the recesses of the shadowy wood that closed about me, almost in despair. I began to dread the apparition of some giant intruder, and was seriously meditating the production of a pair of pistols, when my quick glance caught the glimmer of distant lights, twinkling through some opening in the trees, and darting a beam of hope upon the wanderer's soul. My reins were instantly grasped, and my rowels were struck into the sides of my charger. He snorted, pricked up his ears, erected his head, and sprang forth in an uncontrollable gallop. Uphill and downhill I pricked my gallant grey, and when the forest was passed and his hoofs glinted on the stones of a street leading through a small village, I felt an animation I cannot well describe. A creaking signboard swinging in the wind on rusty irons directed me to the only inn of the village. It was a two-story brick building, standing a little back from the road. 
I drew rein at the door and dismounted my weary nag. My loud vociferations summoned to my side a bulldog, cursed with a most unhappy disposition, and a hostler whose temper was hardly more amiable. He took my horse with an air of surly indifference and gruffly directed me to the bar-room. The apartment was tenanted by half a dozen rough farmers, rendered savage and morose by incessantly imbibing alcohol, and by the proprietor of the tavern, a bluff man with a portly paunch, a hard grey eye, and a stern Caledonian lip. He welcomed me without much frankness or cordiality, and I sank into a wooden settle, eyed by the surly guests of mine host, and the subject of sundry muttered remarks. The group, as it was lighted up by the strong red glare of the fire, had certainly a bandit appearance, which, however delightful to a Salvatore Rosa, was by no means inviting to a traveller who had sought the bosom of the hills for pleasure. After making a few remarks which elicited only monosyllables in answer, I relapsed into silence, from which, however, I was soon aroused by the entrance of the surly hostler who in no very gracious manner informed me that my horse was lame and likely to be sick. This intelligence produced a visit to the stable, and the conviction that I could not possibly resume my journey on the ensuing day, which was somewhat disagreeable to a man who had taken up a decided prejudice against the inn and all its inmates. Having succeeded in procuring a private room and a fire, I ignited an execrable cigar. Ah! How unlike thy principles, dear S, and endeavour to lose myself in the agreeable occupation of castle building while supper was preparing. Alas, my fancy came not at my call. I had lost my power of abstraction. The realities around me were too engrossing. Ere the dying shriek of a majestic rooster had ceased to sound in my ear, his remains were served upon my table, together with a cup or two of very villainous gunpowder tea, and a pitcher of cider, with coarse bread and butter ad libitum. Supper was soon dispatched, and in answer to a bell lightly touched, a vinegar-visaged waiting-maid of the interesting age of forty-five entered and removed the scarcely touched viands, the rudis indigestake molis. I ventured to address her with a request that I might be supplied with a few books, to enable me to while away the evening. I anticipated a literary feast from the readiness with which she rushed from the room, but she reappeared bringing only Young's Night Thoughts, very greasy, a volume of tales with the catastrophes torn out, a set of plays consisting only of first acts, and an odd number of the eclectic magazine. This was sufficiently provoking, but I read a few pages and tried a second cigar, and made the tour of the apartment, examining a family morning piece worked in satin, a genealogical tree done in worsted, and a portrait of the mutton-headed landlord and his snappish wife. I counted the ticks of the clock for half an hour, and was finally reduced to the forlorn expedient of seeing likenesses in the burning embers, when the clock struck nine. I rang for slippers and a guide to my bedroom, and the landlord appeared, candle in hand, to usher me to my sleeping apartment. As I followed him up the creaking staircase, and along the dark upper entry, I could not help regretting that fancy was unable to convert him into the seneschal of a baronial mansion, and the room to which I was going a haunted chamber. It seemed as if my surly host had the power of divining what was passing in my mind, for whom he had ushered me into the room, and placed the candle on the light-stand. He said, I hope you sleep comfortable, for there ain't many rats here, sir. And as for the ghost, they say frequents this chamber. I believe that's all in my eye. Though, to be sure, the window does look out on the burial ground. Umph! A comfortable prospect. Very, sir. You have a fine view of the squire's new tomb and the poorhouse, with a wing of the jail behind the trees. And I've stuck my second-best hat in that broken pane of glass. And there's a chest of drawers to set against the door so you'll be warm and free from intrusion. I wish you good night, sir. All that night, I was troubled with strange dreams, peopled by phantoms from the neighbouring churchyard, but a bona fide ghost I cannot say I saw. 
In the morning I rose very early, and took a look from the window, but the prospect was uninviting. The churchyard was a bleak, desolate place, overgrown with weeds and studded with slate stones, bounded by a ruinous brick wall, and having an entrance through a dilapidated gateway. One or two melancholy-looking cows were feeding on the rank herbage that sprang from the unctuous soil, spurning many a hick jacket with cloven hoofs. But afar, in the most distant part of the field, I espied the figure of a man who was busily occupied in digging a grave. There was something within that impelled me to stroll forth and accost him. I dressed, descended, and having ordered breakfast, left the inn, clambered over the ruinous wall, and stood within the precincts of the burial place. The spot had evidently been used for the purpose of sepulture for a number of years, for the ground rose into numerous hillocks, and I could hardly walk a step without stumbling upon some grassy mound. Even when the perishable gravestones had been shattered by the hand of time, the length of the elevations enabled me to judge of the age of the deceased. This slight swell rose over the remains of some beloved child, who had been committed to the dust with only the simple ceremonies of the Protestant faith, bedewed by the tears of parents, and blessed by the broken voice of farewell affection. This mound, of larger dimension, was heaped above the giant frame of manhood. Some sturdy tiller of the soil or rough dweller in the forest, perhaps cut off by a sudden casualty, had been laid here in his last leaden sleep, no more to start at the rising beam of the sun, no more to rush to the glorious excitement of the hunt, no more to paint in noonday toil. Over the whole field of the dead there seemed to brood the spirit of desolation. Stern heads, rudely chiselled from the gravestones, and frightful emblems met the eye at every turn. Here was none of that simple elegance with which modern taste loves to invest the memorials of the departed. No graceful acacias, no nodding elms or sorrowing willows shed their dews upon the turf. Everything spoke of the bitterness of parting, of the agony of the last hour, of the passing away from earth nothing of the reunion in heaven. I passed on to where the grave-digger was pursuing his occupation. He answered my morning salutation civilly enough, but continued intent upon his work. He was a man of about fifty years of age, spare but strong, with grey hair and sunken cheeks, and certain lines about the mouth which augured a propensity to indulge in dry jest, though the sternness of his grey eye seemed to contradict the tacit assertion. A pleasant morning, sir, to work in the open air, said I. He that regarded the clouds shall not reap, replied the grave digger, still plying his spade. Dead stalks abhorred fair day and foul day, and we that follow in his footsteps must prepare for the dead, rain or shine. A melancholy occupation. A fit one for a moralist. Some would find a pleasure in it. Deacon Giles. I am sure would willingly be in my place now. And why so? This grave is for his wife, replied the grave digger, looking up from his occupation with a dry smile that wrinkled his sallow cheek and distorted his shrunken lips. Perceiving that his merriment was not in infectious, he resumed his employment, and that so assiduously, that in a very short time he had hollowed the last resting place of Deacon Giles's consort, this done, he ascended from the trench with a lightness that surprised me, and walking a few paces from the new-made grave, sat down upon a tombstone and beckoned me to approach. I did so. "'Young man,' said he, "'a sexton and a grave-digger, if he is one who has a zeal for his calling, becomes something of a historian, amassing many a curious tale and strange legend concerning the people with whom he has to do, living and dead. For a man with a taste for his profession cannot provide for the last repose of his fellows without taking an interest in their story, the manner of their death, and the concern of the relatives who follow their remains so tearfully to the grave. Then, replied I, taking a seat beside the sexton, methinks you could relate some interesting tales. Again the withering smile that I had before observed passed over the face of the sexton as he answered, I am no story-teller, sir. 
I deal in fact, not fiction. Yes, yes, I could chronicle some strange events. But of all things I know, there is nothing stranger than the melancholy history of the three brides. The three brides? Aye. Do you see three hillocks yonder, side by side? There they sleep, and will till the last trumpet comes wailing and wailing through the heart of these lone hills, with a tone so strange and stirring that the dead will start from their graves at its first awful note. Then will come the judgment and the retribution. But to my tale, look here, sir, on yonder hill you may observe a little isolated house, with a straggling fence in front and a few stunted apple trees on the ascent behind it. It is sadly out of repair now, and the garden is all overgrown with weeds and brambles, and the whole place has a desolate appearance. If the wind were high now, you might hear the old crazy shutters flapping against the sides, and the wind tearing the grey shingles off the roof. Many years ago, there lived in that house an old man and his son, who cultivated the few acres of arable land which belonged to it. The father was a self-taught man, deeply versed in the mysteries of science, and, as he could tell the name of every flower that blossomed in the wood and grew in the garden, and used to sit up late of nights at his books, or reading the mystic story of the starry heavens, men thought he was crazed or bewitched and avoided him, and even hailed him as the ignorant ever shun and dread the gifted and enlightened. A few there were among others the minister and lawyer and physician of the place, who showed some willingness to afford him countenance, but they soon dropped his acquaintance for they found the old man somewhat reserved and morose, and moreover, their vanity was wounded by discovering the extent of his knowledge. To the minister he would quote the father and the scriptures in the original tongues, and showed himself well armed with the weapons of polemical controversy. He astonished the lawyers by his profound acquaintance with jurisprudence, and the physician was surprised at the extent of his medical knowledge. So they all deserted him, and the minister, from whom the old man differed in some trifling points of doctrine, spoke very slightingly of him, and by and by all, looked upon the self-educated farmer with eyes of aversion. But he cared little for that, for he derived his consolation from loftier resources, and in the untracked paths of science found a pleasure as in the pathless woods. He instructed his son in all his lore, the languages, literature, history, philosophy, science, were unfolded one by one to the enthusiastic son of the solitary. Years rolled by, and the old man died. He died when the storm convulsed the face of nature, when the winds howled around his shattered dwelling, and the lightning played above the roof. And though he went to heaven in faith and purity, the vulgar thought and said, that the evil one had claimed his own in the thunder and commotion of the elements. I cannot paint to you the grief of the son at his bereavement. He was, for a time, as one distracted. The minister came and muttered a few cold and hollow phrases in his ear, and a few neighbours, impelled by curiosity to see the interior of the old man's dwelling, came to his funeral. With a proud and lofty look, the son stood beside the departed in the midst of the band of hypocritical mourners, with a pang at his heart, but a serenity on his brow. He thanked his friends for their kindness, acknowledged their courtesy, and then strode away from the grave to bury his grief in the privacy of his deserted dwelling. He found at first the solitude of the mansion almost insupportable, and he paced the echoing floors from morning till night, in all the agony of woe and desolation, vainly imploring heaven for relief, it came to him first in the guise of poetic inspiration. He wrote with a wonderful ease and power. Page after page came from his prolific pen, almost without an effort, and there was a time when he dreamed, vain fool, of immortality. Some of his productions came before the world. They were praised and circulated, and inquiries were set on foot in the hope of discovering the author. He 
wrapped in the veil of impenetrable obscurity listened to the voice of applause more delicious because it was obtained by stealth from the obscurity of yonder lone mansion and from his remote region to send forth lays which astonished the world was indeed a triumph to the visionary bard his thirst for fame was gratified and now he began to yearn for the companionship of some sweet being of the other sex to share the laurels he had won to whisper consolation in his ear in moments of despondency and to supply the void which the death of his old father had occasioned he would picture to himself the felicity of a refined intercourse with a highly intellectual and beautiful woman and as he had chosen for his motto what has been done may still be done he did not despair of success in his village lived three sisters all beautiful and all accomplished their names were mary adelaide and madeline i am far enough past the age of enthusiasm but never can i forget the beauty of those young girls mary was the youngest and a fairer haired more laughing damsel never danced upon a green adelaide who was a few years older was dark-haired and pensive but of the three madeline the eldest possessed the most fire spirit cultivation and intellectuality their father was a man of taste and education and being somewhat above vulgar prejudices permitted the visits of the hero of my story still he did not altogether encourage the affection which he found springing up between mary and the poet when however he found that her affections were engaged he did not withhold his consent from her marriage and the recluse bore to his solitary mansion the young bride of his affections oh sir the house assumed a new appearance within and without roses bloomed in the gardens jessamines peeped through its lattices and the fields about it smiled with the effects of careful cultivation lights were seen in the little parlor in the evening and many a time would the passenger pause by the garden gate to listen to strains of the sweetest music breathed by choral voices from the cottage if the mysterious student and his wife were neglected by their neighbors what cared they their endearing and mutual affection made their home a little paradise but death came to eden mary fell suddenly sick and after a few hours illness died in the arms of her husband and her sister madeline this was the student's second heavy affliction days months rolled on and the only solace of the bereaved was to sit with the sisters of the deceased and talk of the lost one to adelaide at length he offered his widowed heart she came to his lone house like the dove bearing the olive branch of peace and consolation yet they lived happily the husband again smiled and with a new spring the roses blossomed in their garden but it seemed as if a fatality pursued this singular man when the rose withered and the leaf fell in the mellow autumn of the year adelaide too sickened and died like a younger sister in the arms of her husband and of madeline perhaps you will think it strange young man that after all the wretched survivor stood again at the altar but he was a mysterious being whose ways were inscrutable who thirsting for domestic bliss was doomed ever to seek and never to find it his third bride was madeline i well remember she was a beauty in the true sense of the word it may seem strange to you to hear the praise of beauty from such lips as mine but i cannot help expatiating upon hers she might have sat upon a throne and the most loyal subject the proudest peer would have sworn the blood within her veins had descended from a hundred kings she was a proud creature with a tall commanding form and raven tresses that floated dark and cloud-like over her shoulders she was a singularly gifted woman and possessed of rare inspiration she loved the widower for his power and his fame and she wedded him they were married in that church it was on a summer afternoon i recollect it well during the ceremony blackest cloud i ever saw overspread the heavens like a pall and at the moment when the third bride pronounced her vow a clap of thunder shook the building to the center all the females shrieked but the bride herself made the response with a steady voice and her eyes glittered with wild fire as she gazed upon her bridegroom 
he remarked a kind of incoherence in her expressions as they rode homeward, which surprised him at the time. Arrived at his house, she shrunk upon the threshold, but this was the timidity of a maiden. When they were alone, he clasped her hand. It was as cold as ice. He looked into her face. Madeline, said he, what means this? Your cheeks are as pale as your wedding gown. The bride uttered a frantic shriek. My wedding gown, exclaimed she. No, no, this, this is my sister's shroud. The hour for confession has arrived. It is God that impels me to speak. To win you, I have lost my soul. Yes, yes, I am a murderess. She smiled upon me in the joyous affection of her young heart. But I gave her the fatal drug. Adelaide twinned her white arms about my neck, but I administered the poison. Take me to your arms. I have lost my soul for you, and mine you must be. She spread her long white arms and stood like a maniac before him, said the sexton, rising, in the excitement of the moment, and assuming the attitude he described. And then, continued he, in a low voice, at that moment came the thunder and the flash, and the guilty woman fell dead upon the floor. The countenance of the narrator expressed all the horror that he felt. And the bridegroom, asked I, the husband of the destroyer and the victims, what became of him? He stands before you, was the thrilling answer. End of The Three Brides by Francis A. Durivage Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Trist by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Trist by Algernon Blackwood. Je suis la première au rendez-vous. Je vois autant. As he got out of the train at the little wayside station, he remembered the conversation as if it had been yesterday instead of fifteen years ago, and his heart went thumping against his ribs so violently that he almost heard it. The original thrill came over him again with all its infinite yearning. He felt as if he had felt it then, not with that tragic lessening the interval had brought to each repetition of its memory. Here, in the familiar scenery of its birth, he realized with mingled pain and wonder that the subsequent years had not destroyed, but only dimmed it. The forgotten rapture flamed back with all the fierce beauty of its genesis, desire at white heat, and the shock of the abrupt discovery shattered time. Fifteen years became a negligible moment. The crowded experiences that had intervened seemed but a dream. The farewell scene, the conversation on the steamer's deck, were clear as of the day before. He saw the hand holding her big hat that fluttered in the wind, saw the flowers on the dress where the long coat was blown open a moment, recalled the face of a hurrying steward who had jostled them. He even heard the voices, his own and hers. Yes, she said simply. I promise you, you have my word. I'll wait. Till I come back to find you, he interrupted. Steadfastly, she repeated his actual words, then added, Here, at home, that is. I'll come to the garden gate as usual, he told her, trying to smile. I'll knock. You'll open the gate as usual and come out to me. These words, too, she attempted to repeat, but her voice failed. Her eyes filled suddenly with tears. She looked into his face and nodded. It was just then that her little hand went up to hold the hat on. He saw the very gesture still. He remembered that he was vehemently tempted to tear his ticket up there and then, to go ashore with her, to stay in England. 
to brave all opposition when the siren roared its third horrible warning, and the ship put out to sea. Fifteen years, thick with various incident, had passed between them since that moment. His life had risen, fallen, crashed, then risen again. He had come back at last, fortune won by a lucky coup at thirty-five, had come back to find her, come back, above all, to keep his word. Once every three months they had exchanged the brief letter agreed upon. I am well. I am waiting. I am unhappy. I am unmarried. Yours. For his youthful wisdom had insisted that no man had the right to keep any woman too long waiting, and she, thinking that letter brave and splendid, had insisted likewise that he was free if freedom called him. They had laughed over this last phrase in their agreement. They put five years as the possible limit of separation. By then he would have won success, and obstinate parents would have nothing more to say. But when the five years ended, he was on his uppers in a western mining town, and with the end of ten in sight, those uppers, though changed, were little better, apparently, than patched and mended. It was just then, too, that the change which had been stealing over him betrayed itself. He realized it abruptly, a sense of shame and horror in him. The discovery was made unconsciously. It disclosed itself. He was reading her letter as a laborer on a Californian fruit farm. Funny she doesn't marry someone else, he heard himself say. The words were out before he knew it, and certainly before he could suppress them. They just slipped out, startling him to the truth, and he knew instantly that the thought was fathered in him by a hidden wish. He was older. He had lived. It was a memory he loved. Despising himself in a contradictory fashion, both vaguely and fiercely, he yet held true to his boyhood promise. He did not write and offer to release her as he knew they did in stories. He persuaded himself that he meant to keep his word. There was this fine, stupid, selfish obstinacy in his character. In any case, she would misunderstand and think he wanted to set free himself. Besides, I'm still awfully fond of her, he asserted. And it was true. Only the love, it seemed, had gone its way. Not that another woman took it. He kept himself clean, held firm as steel. The love apparently just faded of its own accord. Her image dimmed, her letter ceased to thrill, then ceased to interest him. Subsequent reflection made him realize other details about himself. In the interval he had suffered hardships, had learned the uncertainty of life that depends for its continuance on a little food, but that food often hard to come by, and had seen so many others go under that he held it more cheaply than of old. The wandering instinct, too, had caught him slowly killing the domestic impulse. He lost his desire for a settled place of abode, the desire for children of his own, lost the desire to marry at all. Also, he reminded himself with a smile he had lost other things, the expression of youth she was accustomed to and held always in her thoughts of him, two fingers of one hand, his hair. He wore glasses too. The gentlemen adventurers of life get scarred in those wild places where he lived. He saw himself a rather battered specimen well on the way to middle age. There was confusion in his mind, however, and in his heart a struggling complex of emotions that made it difficult to know exactly what he did feel. The dominant clue concealed itself. Feelings shifted. A single clear determinant did not offer. He was an honest fellow. I can't quite make it out, he said. What is it I really feel, and why? His motive seemed confused. To keep the flame alight for ten long buffeting years was no small achievement. 
better men had succumbed in half the time. Yet something in him still held fast to the girl, as with a band of steel, that would not let her go entirely. Occasionally there came strong reversions, when he ached with longing, yearning, hope, when he loved her again, remembered passionately each detail of the far-off courtship days in the forbidden rectory garden beyond the small white garden gate. Or was it merely the image and the memory he loved again? He hardly knew himself. He could not tell. That again puzzled him. It was the wrong word, surely. He still wrote the promised letter. However, it was so easy. Three short sentences could not betray the dead or dying fires. One day, besides, he would return and claim her. He meant to keep his word. And he had kept it. Here he was, this calm September afternoon, within three miles of the village where he first had kissed her, where the marvel of first love had come to both. Three short miles between him and the little white garden gate of which at this very moment she was intently thinking, and behind which some fifty minutes later she would be standing, waiting for him. He had purposely left the train at an earlier station. He would walk over in the dusk, climb the familiar steps, knock at the white gate in the wall as of old, utter the promised words, I have come back to find you, enter and keep his word. He had ridden from Mexico a week before he sailed. He had made careful, even accurate calculations. In the dusk, on the 16th of September, I shall come and knock. He added to the usual sentences. The knowledge of his coming, therefore, had been in her possession seven days. Just before sailing, moreover, he had heard from her, though not in answer, naturally. She was well. She was happy. She was unmarried. She was waiting. And now, as by some magical process of restoration possible to deep hearts only, perhaps, though even by them quite inexplicable, the state of first love had blazed up again in him. In all its radiant beauty it lit his heart, burned unextinguished in his soul, set body and mind on fire. The years had merely veiled it. It burst upon him captured, overwhelmed him with the suddenness of a dream. He stepped from the train. He met it in the face. It took him prisoner. The familiar trees and hedges, the unchanged countryside, the field smells known in infancy, all these, with something subtly added to them, rolled back the passion of his youth upon him in a flood. No longer was he bound upon what he deemed, perhaps, an act of honourable duty. It was love that drove him, as it drove him fifteen years before. And it drove him with the accumulated passion of desire, long forcibly repressed, almost as if, out of some fancied notion of fairness to the girl, he had deliberately, yet still unconsciously said no to it, that she had not faded, but that he had decided, I must forget her. That sentence, why doesn't she marry someone else? had not betrayed the change in himself. It surprised another motive. It's not fair to her. His mind worked with a curious rapidity, but worked within one circle only. The stress of sudden emotion was extraordinary. He remembered a thousand things. Yet chief among them, those occasional reversions when he had felt he loved her again. Had he not after all deceived himself? Had she ever really faded at all? Had he not felt he ought to let her fade, release her that way? And the change in himself? That sentence on the Californian fruit farm? What did they mean? Which had been true? The fading or the love? The confusion in his mind was hopeless. But, as a matter of fact, he did not think at all. He only felt... The momentum, besides, was irresistible, and before the shattering onset of the sweet revival, he did not stop to analyse the strange result. He knew certain things, and cared to know no others, that his heart was leaping. 
his blood running with the heat of twenty. That joy recaptured him, that he must see, hear, touch her, hold her in his arms, and marry her. For the fifteen years had crumbled to a little thing, and at thirty-five he felt himself but twenty, rapturously, deliciously in love. He went quickly, eagerly, down the little street to the inn, still feeling only, not thinking anything. The vehement uprush of the old emotion made reflection of any kind impossible. He gave no further thought to those long years out there, when her name, her letters, the very image of her in his mind had found him, if not cold, at least without keen response. All that was forgotten as though it had not been. The steadfast thing in him, the strong holding to a promise which had never wilted, ousted the recollection of fading and decay that, whatever caused them, certainly had existed. And this steadfast thing now took command. This enduring quality in his character led him. It was only towards the end of the hurried tea he first received the singular impression, vague indeed, but undeniably persistent, the strange impression that he was being led. Yet, though aware of this, he did not pause to argue or reflect. The emotional displacement in him, of course, had been more than considerable. There had been upheaval, a change whose abruptness was even dislocating, fundamental in a sense he could not estimate shock. Yet he took no count of anything but the one mastering desire to get to her as soon as possible, knock at the small white garden gate, hear her answering voice, see the low wooden door swing open, take her. There was joy and glory in his heart, and a yearning sweet delight. At this very moment she was expecting him, and he had come. Behind these positive emotions, however, there lay concealed all the time others that were of a negative character. Consciously, he was not aware of them, but they were there. They revealed their presence in various little ways that puzzled him. He recognized them absent-mindedly, as it were, did not analyze or investigate them. For through the confusion upon his faculties rose also a certain hint of insecurity that betrayed itself by a slight hesitancy or miscalculation in one or two unimportant actions. There was a touch of melancholy, too, a sense of something lost. It lay perhaps in that tinge of sadness which accompanies the twilight of an autumn day, when a gentler, mournful beauty veils a greater beauty that is past. Some trick of memory connected it with a scene of early boyhood, when, meaning to see the sunrise, he overslept, and by a brief half-hour was just too late. He noted it merely, then passed on. He did not understand it. He hurried all the more. This hurry, the only sign that it was noted. I must be quick, flashed up across his strongly positive emotions. And due to this hurry, possibly, were the slight miscalculations that he made. They were very trivial. He rang for sugar, though the bowl stood just before his eyes. Yet when the girl came in, he forgot completely what he rang for, and inquired instead about the evening trains to London. And when the timetable was laid before him, he examined it without intelligence, then looked up suddenly into the maid's face with a question about flowers. Were there flowers to be had in the village anywhere? What kind of flowers? Oh, a bouquet or a... He hesitated, searching for a word that tried to present itself, yet was not the word he wanted to make use of or a wreath of some sort. He finished. He took the very word he did not want to take. In several things he did and said, this hesitancy and miscalculation betrayed themselves such trivial things, yet significant in an elusive way that he disliked. There was sadness, insecurity somewhere in them, and he resented them aware of their existence only because they qualified his joy. There was a whispered, 
No, floating somewhere in the dusk. Almost he felt disquiet. He hurried, more and more eager to be off upon his journey, the final part of it. Moreover, there were other signs of an odd miscalculation. Dislocation, perhaps, properly speaking, in him. Though the inn was familiar from his boyhood days, kept by the same old couple too, he volunteered no information about himself, nor asked a single question about the village he was bound for. He did not even inquire if the rector, her father, still were living. And when he left, he entirely neglected the gilt-framed mirror about the mantelpiece, of plush, dusty pampas grass and waterless vases on either side. It did not matter, apparently, whether he looked well or ill, tidy or untidy. He forgot that when his cap was off, the absence of thick, accustomed hair must alter him considerably. Forgot also that two fingers were missing from one hand, the right hand, the hand that she would presently clasp. Nor did it occur to him that he wore glasses, which must change his expression and add to the appearance of the years he bore. None of these obvious and natural things seemed to come into his thoughts at all. He was in a hurry to be off. He did not think. But though his mind may not have noted these slight betrayals with actual sentences, his attitude nevertheless expressed them. This was, it seemed, the feeling in him. What could such details matter to her now? Why, indeed, should he give to them a single thought? It was himself she loved and waited for, not separate items of his external physical image, as well as think of the fact that she too must have altered outwardly. It never once occurred to him. Such details were off today. He was only impatient to come to her quickly, very quickly, instantly, if possible. He hurried. There was a flood of boyhood's joy in him. He paid for the tea, giving a tip that was twice the price of the meal, and set out gaily and impetuously along the winding lane, charged to the brim with a sweet picture of a small white garden gate, the loved face close behind it. He went forward at a headlong pace, singing Nancy Lee, as he used to sing it fifteen years before. With action, then, the negative sensations hid themselves, obliterated by the positive ones that took command. The former, however, merely lay concealed. They waited. Thus perhaps does vital emotion, overlong restrained, denied, indeed, of its blossoming, altogether take revenge. Repressed elements in his psychic life asserted themselves, selecting, as though naturally, a dramatic form. The dusk fell rapidly. Mist rose in floating strips across the meadows by the stream. The old, familiar details beckoned him forwards, then drove him from behind, as he went swiftly past them. He recognized others rising through the thickening air beyond. They nodded, peered and whispered. Sometimes they almost sang. And each added to his inner happiness. Each brought its sweet and precious contribution and built it into the reconstructed picture of the earlier, long-forgotten rapture. It was an enticing and enchanted journey that he made, something impossibly blissful in it, something, too, that seemed curiously inevitable. For the scenery had not altered all these years. The details of the country were unchanged. Everything he saw was rich with dear and precious association, increasing the momentum of the tide that carried him along. Yonder was the stile over whose broken step he had helped her yesterday, and there the slippery plank across the stream, where she looked above her shoulder to ask for his support. He saw the very bramble bushes where she scratched her hand, a black burying the day before, and finally, the weather-stained signpost, to the rectory. It pointed to the path through the dangerous field where Farmer Sparrow's bull provided such a sweet excuse for holding, leading, protecting her. From the entire landscape rose a steam of recent memory, each incident alive, 
each little detail brimmed with its cargo of fond association. He read the rough black lettering on the crooked arm. It was rather faded. But he knew it too well to miss a single letter and hurried forward along the muddy track. He looked about him for a sign of Farmer Sparrow's bow. He even felt in the misty air for the little hand that he might take and lead her into safety. The thought of her drew him on with such irresistible anticipation that it seemed as if the cumulative drive of vanished and unsated years evoked the tangible phantom almost. He actually felt it, soft and warm and clinging in his own, that was no longer incomplete and mutilated. Yet it was not he who led and guided now, but more and more, he who was being led. The hint had first betrayed its presence at the inn. It now openly declared itself. It had crossed the frontier into a positive sensation. Its growth, swiftly increasing all this time, had accomplished itself. He had ignored, somehow, both its genesis and quick development, the result he plainly recognized. She was expecting him, indeed, but it was more than expectation. There was calling in it. She summoned him. Her thought and longing reached him along that old, invisible track love builds so easily between true, faithful hearts. All the forces of her being, her very voice, came towards him through the deepening autumn twilight. He had not noticed the curious physical restoration in his hand, but he was vividly aware of this more magical alteration that she led and guided him, drawing him ever more swiftly towards the little white garden gate where she stood at this very moment, waiting. Her sweet strength compelled him. There was this new touch of something irresistible about the familiar journey, where formerly had been delicious yielding only, shy, tentative advance. He realized it inevitable. His footsteps hurried, faster and ever faster. So deep was the allurement in his blood, he almost ran. He reached the narrow winding lane and raced along it. He knew each bend, each angle of the holly hedge, each separate incident of ditch and stone. He could have plunged blindfold down it at top speed. The familiar perfumes rushed at him, dead leaves and mossy earth and ferns and dock leaves, bringing the bewildering currents of strong emotion in him altogether as in a rising wave. He saw then the crumbling wall, the cedars topping it with spreading branches, the chimneys of the rectory. On his right bulk the outline of the old grey church, the twisted ancient yews, the company of gravestones, upright and leaning, dotting the ground like listening figures. But he looked at none of these, for on his left he already saw the five rough steps of stone that led from the lane towards a small white garden gate. That gate at last shone before him, rising through the misty air. He reached it. He stopped dead a moment. His heart, it seemed, stopped too, then took to violent hammering in his brain. There was a roaring in his mind, and yet a marvellous silence just behind it. Then the roar of emotion died away. There was utter stillness. This stillness, silence, was all about him. The world seemed preternaturally quiet. But the pause was too brief to measure, for the tide of emotion had receded only to come on again with redoubled power. He turned, leaped forward, clambered impetuously up the rough stone steps, and flung himself breathless and exhausted against the trivial barrier that stood between his eyes and hers. In his wild, half-violent impatience, however, he stumbled. That roaring too confused him. He fell forward, it seemed, for twilight had merged in darkness, and he misjudged the steps. 
the distances he yet knew so well. For a moment, certainly, he lay at full length upon the uneven ground against the wall. The steps had tripped him, and then he raised himself and knocked. His right hand struck upon the small, white garden gate. Upon the two lost fingers he felt the impact. "'I am here!' he cried, with a deep sound in his throat, as though utterance was choked and difficult. "'I have come back to find you!' For a fraction of a second he waited, while the world stood still and waited with him. But there was no delay. Her answer came at once. "'I am well. I am happy. I am waiting.' and the voice was clear and marvellous as of old, though the words were strange, reminding him of something dreamed, forgotten, lost, it seemed. He did not take special note of them. He only wondered that she did not open instantly, that he might see her. Speech could follow, but sight came surely first. There was this lightning flash of disappointment in him, Ah, she was lengthening out the marvellous moment as often and often she had done before. It was to tease him that she made him wait. He knocked again. He pushed against the unyielding surface, for he noticed that it was unyielding, and there was a depth in the tender voice that he could not understand. Open! he cried again, but louder than before. I have come back to find you. And as he said it, the mist struck cold and thick against his face. But her answer froze his blood. I cannot open. And a sudden anguish of despair rose over him. The sound of her voice was strange. In it was faintness, distance as well as depth. It seemed to echo. Something frantic seized him, then the panic sense. "'Open, open, come to me!' he tried to shout. His voice failed oddly. There was no power in it. Something appalling struck him between the eyes. "'For God's sake, open! I am waiting here! Open and come out to me!' The reply was muffled by distance that already seemed increasing. He was conscious of freezing cold about him in his heart. I cannot open. You must come in to me. I am here and waiting always. He knew not exactly then what happened, for the cold grew deeper and the icy mist was in his throat. No words would come. He rose to his knees and from his knees to his feet. He stooped. With all his force he knocked again. In a blind frenzy of despair, he hammered and beat against the unyielding barrier of the small white garden gate. He battered it till the skin of his knuckles was torn and bleeding, the first two fingers of a hand already mutilated. He remembers the torn and broken skin, for he noticed in the gloom that stains upon the gate bore witness to his violence. It was not till afterwards that he remembered the other fact, that the hand had already suffered mutilation long, long years ago. The power of sound was feebly in him. He called aloud. There was no answer. He tried to scream, but the scream was muffled in his throat before it issued properly. It was a nightmare scream. As a last resort, he flung himself boldly upon the unyielding gate with such precipitate violence, moreover, that his face struck against its surface. From the friction, then, along the whole length of his cheek, he knew that the surface was not smooth. Cold and rough that surface was. But also, it was not of wood. Moreover, there was writing on it he had not seen before. How he deciphered it in the gloom, he never knew. The lettering was deeply cut. Perhaps he traced it with his fingers. His right hand certainly lay stretched upon it. He made out a name, a date, a broken verse from the Bible, and the words, Tide P. 
peacefully. The lettering was sharply cut with edges that were new. For the date was off a week ago. The broken verse ran, When the shadows flee away. And the small white garden gate was unyielding, because it was of stone. At the inn he found himself staring at a table, from which the tea-things had not been cleared away. There was a railway timetable in his hands, and his head was bent forwards over it, trying to decipher the lettering in the growing twilight. Beside him, still fingering a shilling, stood the serving girl. Her other hand held a brown tray with a running dog painted upon its dented surface. It swung to and fro a little as she spoke, evidently continuing a conversation her customer had begun, for she was giving information in the colourless, disinterested voice such persons use. "'We all went to the funeral, sir. All the country people went. The grave was her father's, the family grave.' Then, seeing that her customer was too absorbed in the timetable to listen further, she said no more, but began to pile the tea-things on to the tray with noisy clatter. Ten minutes later, in the road, he stood hesitating. The signal at the station just opposite was already down. The autumn mist was rising. He looked along the winding road that melted away into the distance, then slowly turned and reached the platform just as the London train came in. He felt very old, too old to walk six miles. End of The Tryst by Algernon Blackwood Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Crossroads by Amy Lowell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Crossroads by Amy Lowell. A bullet through his heart at dawn. On the table, a letter signed with a woman's name. A wind that goes howling round the house and weeping as is shame. Cold November dawn peeping through the windows. Cold dawn creeping over the floor, creeping up his cold legs, creeping over his cold body, creeping across his cold face. A glaze of thin yellow sunlight on the staring eyes. Wind howling through bent branches. A wind which never dies. Howling, wailing. The gazing eyes glitter in the sunlight. The lids are frozen open, and the eyes glitter. The thudding of a pick on hard earth, a space grinding and crunching. Overhead, branches writhing, winding, interlacing, unwinding, scattering. Tortured twinings, tossings, creakings. Wind flinging branches apart drawing them together, whispering and whining among them, a waning, lob-sided moon cutting through black clouds, a stream of pebbles and earth, and the empty spade gleams clear in the moonlight, then is rammed again into the black earth, tramping of feet, men and horses, squeaking of wheels. Whoa! Ready, Jim! All ready! Something falls, settles, is still. Suicides have no coffin. Give us a stake, Jim. Now. Pound. Pound. He'll never walk. Nailed to the ground. An ash stick pierces his heart. If it buds, the roots will hold him. He is a part of the earth. Now. Clay to clay. Overhead, the branches sway and writhe and twist in the wind. He'll never walk with a bullet in his heart and an ash stick nailing him to the cold black ground. Six months he lay still, six months, and the water welled up in his body and soft blue spots checkered it. He lay still, 
for the ash stick held him in place. Six months. Then her face came out of a mist of green, pink and white and frail, like Dresden china, lilies of the valley at her breast, puce-colored silk sheening about her, under the young green leaves, the horse at a foot pace, the high yellow wheels of the chaise scarcely turning, her face rippling like grain of blowing under her puce-colored bonnet and burning beside her, flaming within its correct blue coat and brass buttons, is someone. What has dimmed the sun? The horse steps on a rolling stone. A wind in the branches makes a moan. The little leaves tremble and shake, turn and quake, over and over, tearing their stems. There is a shower of young leaves, and a sudden sprung gale wails in the trees. The yellow wheel chase is rocking, rocking, and all the branches are knocking, knocking. The sun in the sky is a flat red plate. The branches creak and grate. She screams and cowers, for the green foliage is a lowering wave surging to smother her. But she sees nothing. The stake holds firm. The body rides, the body squirms, the blue spots widen, the flesh tears, but the stake wears well in the deep black ground. It holds the body in the still black ground. Two years. The body has been in the ground two years. It is worn away. It is clay to clay, where the heart moulders a greenish dust. The stake is thrust. Late August it is, and night, a night flauntingly jeweled with stars, a night of shooting stars, and loud insect noises. Down the road to Tilbury, silence, and the slow flapping of large leaves. Down the road to Sutton, silence, and the darkness of heavy foliage trees. Down the road to Wayfleet, silence and the whirring scrape of insects in the branches, down the road to Edgarstown, silence, and stars like stepping stones in a pathway overhead. It is very quiet at the crossroads, and the signboards point the way down the four roads, endlessly points the way where nobody wishes to go. A horse is galloping, galloping up from Sutton, shaking the wide, still leaves as he goes under them, striking sparks with his iron shoes, silencing the katydids. Dr. Morgan riding to a childbirth over Tilbury Way, riding to deliver a woman of her first-born son. One o'clock from Wayfleet Bell Tower. What a shower of shooting stars, and a breeze, all of a sudden, jarring the big leaves and making them jerk up and down. Dr. Morgan's hat is blown from his head. The horse swerves and curves away from the signpost. An oath spurs, a blurring of grey mist, a quick left twist, and the gelding is snorting and racing down the Tilbury Road, with the wind dropping away behind him. The stake has wrenched. The stake has started. The body Flesh from flesh has parted, but the bones hold tight, socket and ball, and clamping them down in the hard black ground is a stake, wedged through ribs and spine. The bones may twist and heave and twine, but the stake holds them still in line. The breeze goes down, and the round stars shine, for the stake holds the fleshless bones in line. Twenty years now, twenty long years, the body has powdered itself away. It is clay to clay. It is brown earth mingled with brown earth. Only flaky bones remain, laying together so long they fit, although not one bone is knit to another. The stake is there, too, rotted through, but upright still and still piercing down between ribs and spine in a straight line. Yellow stillness 
is on the crossroads. The yellow stillness is on the trees. The leaves hang drooping wan. The four roads point four yellow ways. Saffron and gamboge ribbons to the gaze. A little swirl of dust blows up Tilbury Road. The wind, which fans it, has not strength to do more. It ceases, and the dust settles down. A little whirl of wind comes up Tilbury Road. It brings a sound of wheels and feet. The wind reels a moment, and faints to nothing under the signpost. Wind again, wheels and feet louder. Wind again, again, again. A drop of rain flat into the dust. Drop, drop, thick, heavy raindrops, and a shrieking wind bending the great trees and wrenching off their leaves under the black sky, bowed and dripping with rain. Up Tilbury Road comes the procession, a funeral procession, bound for the graveyard at Wayfleet. Feet and wheels, feet and wheels, and among them one who is carried. The bones in the deep still earth shiver and pull. There is a quiver through the rotted stake. Then stake and bones fall together in a little puffing of dust. Like meshes of linked steel, the rain shuts down behind the procession, now well along the way fleet road. He wavers like smoke in the buffeting wind. His fingers blow out like smoke. His head ripples in the gale. Under the signpost, in the pouring rain, he stands and watches. Another quavering figure drifting down the Wayfleet Road. Then swiftly, he streams after it. It flickers among the trees. He licks out and winds about them, over, under, blown, contorted. Spindrift after spindrift, smoke following smoke. There is a wailing through the trees, a wailing of fear, and after it, laughter, 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 scurling up to the black sky. Lightning jags over the funeral procession, a heavy clap of thunder, then darkness and rain, and the sound of feet and wheels. End of The Crossroads by Amy Lowell. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Share and Share Alike by Robert Barr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Share and Share Alike by Robert Barr. The quick must haste to vengeance taste, for time is on his head, but he can wait at the door of fate, though the stay be long and the hour be late. The Dead Melville Hardlock stood in the centre of the room, with his feet wide apart and his hands in his trousers' pockets, a characteristic attitude of his. He gave a quick glance at the door, and saw with relief that the key was in the lock and the bolt prevented anybody coming in unexpectedly. Then he gazed once more at the body of his friend, which lay in such a helpless-looking attitude upon the floor. He looked at the body with a feeling of mild curiosity, and wondered what there was about the lines of the figure on the floor that so certainly betokened death rather than sleep even though the face was turned away from him. He thought, perhaps, it might be the hand with its back to the floor and its palm towards the ceiling. There was a certain look of hopelessness about that. He resolved to investigate the subject some time when he had leisure. Then his thoughts turned towards the subject of murder. It was so easy to kill. He felt no pride in having been able to accomplish that much. 
but it was not everybody who could escape the consequences of his crime. It required an acute brain to plan after events so that shrewd detectives would be baffled. There was a complacent conceit about Melville Hardlock, which was as much a part of him as his intense selfishness, and this conceit led him to believe that the future path he had outlined for himself would not be followed by justice. With a sigh, Melville suddenly seemed to realize that while there was no necessity for undue haste, yet it was not wise to be too leisurely in some things. So he took his hands from his pockets and drew to the middle of the floor a large Saratoga trunk. He threw the heavy lid open, and in doing so showed that the trunk was empty. Picking up the body of his friend, which he was surprised to note was so heavy and troublesome to handle, he, with some difficulty, doubled it up so that it slipped into the trunk. He piled on top of it some old coats, vests, newspapers, and other miscellaneous articles until the space above the body was filled. Then he pressed down the lid and locked it, fastening the catches at each end. Two stout straps were now placed around the trunk and firmly buckled after he had drawn them as tight as possible. Finally, he damped the gum side of a paper label and when he had pasted it on the end of the trunk, it showed the words in red letters, S.S. Platonic, Cabin, Wanted. This done, Melville threw open the window to allow the fumes of chloroform to dissipate themselves in the outside air. He placed a close, packed and labelled portmanteau beside the trunk, and a valise beside that again, which, with a couple of handbags, made up his luggage. Then he unlocked the door, threw back the bolt, and, having turned the key again from the outside, strode down the thickly carpeted stairs of the hotel into the large pillared and marble-floored vestibule where the clerk's office was. Strolling up to the counter behind which stood the clerk of the hotel, he shoved his key across to that functionary who placed it in the pigeonhole marked by the number of his room. Did my friend leave for the West last night, do you know? Yes, answered the clerk. He paid his bill and left. Haven't you seen him since? No, replied Haddock. Well, he'll be disappointed about that, because he told me he expected to see you before he left, and would call up at your room later. I suppose he didn't have time. By the way, he said you were going back to England tomorrow. Is that so? Yes, I sail on the platonic. I suppose I can have my luggage sent to the steamer from here without further trouble. Oh, certainly, answered the clerk. How many pieces are there? It will be fifty cents each. Very well. Just put that down in my bill with the rest of the expenses and let me have it tonight. I will settle when I come in. Five pieces of luggage altogether. Very good. You'll have breakfast tomorrow, I suppose. Yes. The boat doesn't leave till nine o'clock. Very well. Better call you about seven, Mr. Hardlock. Will you have a carriage? No, I shall walk down to the boat. You will be sure, of course, to have my things there in time. Oh, no fear of that. They will be on the steamer by half-past eight. Thank you. As Mr. Hardlock walked down to the boat next morning, he thought he had done rather a clever thing in sending his trunk in the ordinary way to the steamer. Most people, he said to himself, would have made the mistake of being too careful about it. It goes along in the ordinary course of business. If anything should go wrong, it will seem incredible that a sane man would send such a package in an ordinary express wagon to be dumped about as they do dump luggage about in New York. He stood by the gangway on the steamer, watching the trunks, valises, and portmanteaus come on board. Stop! he cried to the man. That is not to go down in the hold. I want it. Don't you see it's marked wanted? It's very large, sir, said the man. It will fill up a stateroom by itself. I have the captain's room, was the answer. So the man flung the trunk down on the deck with a crash 
that made even the cool Mr. Hardlock shudder. "'Did you say you had the captain's room, sir?' asked the steward standing near. "'Yes.' "'Then I am your bedroom steward,' was the answer. "'I will see that the trunk is put in all right.' The first day out was rainy, but not rough. The second day was fair, and the sea smooth. The second night Hardlock remained in the smoking-room, until the last man had left. Then, when the lights were extinguished, he went out on the upper deck, where his room was, and walked up and down, smoking his cigar. There was another man also walking the deck, and the red glow of his cigar, dim and bright alternately, shone in the darkness like a glowworm. Hardlock wished that he would turn in, whoever he was. Finally, the man flung his cigar overboard and went down the stairway. Hardlock had now the dark deck to himself. He pushed open the door of his room and turned out the electric light. It was only a few steps from his door to the rail of the vessel, high above the water. Dimly on the bridge, he saw the shadowy figure of an officer walking back and forth. Hardlock looked over the side at the phosphorescent glitter of the water, which made the black ocean seem blacker still. The sharp ring of the bell betokening midnight made Melville start, as if a hand had touched him, and the quick beating of his heart took some moments to subside. "'I've been smoking too much today,' he said to himself. Then, looking quickly up and down the deck, he walked on tiptoe to his room, took the trunk by its stout leather handle, and pulled it over the ledge in the doorway. There were small wheels at the bottom of the trunk, but although they made the pulling of it easy, they seemed to creak with appalling loudness. He realized the fearful weight of the trunk as he lifted the end of it up on the rail. He balanced it there for a moment and glanced sharply around him, but there was nothing to alarm him. In spite of his natural coolness, he felt a strange, haunting dread of some undefinable disaster, a dread which had been completely absent from him at the time he committed the murder. He shoved off the trunk before he had quite intended to do so, and the next instant he nearly bit through his tongue to suppress a groan of agony. There passed half a dozen moments of supreme pain and fear before he realized what had happened. His wrist had caught in the strap handle of the trunk, and his shoulder was dislocated. His right arm was stretched taut and helpless, like a rope holding up the frightful and ever-increasing weight that hung between him and the sea. His breast was pressed against the rail, and his left hand gripped the iron stanchion to keep himself from going over. He felt that his feet were slipping, and he set his teeth and gripped the iron with a grasp that was itself like iron. He hoped the trunk would slip from his useless wrist, but it rested against the side of the vessel, and the longer it hung, the more it pressed the hard strap handle into his nerveless flesh. He had realized from the first that he dare not cry for help, and his breath came hard through his clenched teeth as the weight grew heavier and heavier. Then, with his eyes strained by the fearful pressure, and perhaps dazzled by the glittering phosphorescence running so swiftly by the side of the steamer far below, he seemed to see from out the trunk something in the form and semblance of his dead friend quivering like summer heat below him. Sometimes it was the shimmering phosphorescence, then again it was the wraith hovering over the trunk. Hardlock in spite of his agony, wondered which it really was. But he wondered no longer when it spoke to him. Old friend, it said, you remember our compact when we left England. It was to be share and share alike. My boy, share and share alike. I have had my share. Come. Then, on the still night air, came the belated cry for help. But it was after the foot had slipped and the hand had been wrenched from the iron stanchion. End of Share and Share Alike by Robert Barr Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, 
Birmingham, Alabama. The Man Who Was Dead by Thomas H. Knight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut The Man Who Was Dead by Thomas H. Knight Twas a wicked night, the night I met the man who had died. A bitter, heart-numbing night of weird, shrieking wind and flying snow. A few black hours I will never forget. "'Well, Jerry, lad,' my mother said to me as I pushed back from the table and started for my sheepskin coat and the lantern in the corner of the room. "'Surely you're not going out on a night like this. Goodness gracious, Jerry, it's not fit.' "'Can't help it, mother,' I replied. "'Got to go.' You've never seen me miss a Saturday night yet, have you, now? No, but then I've never seen a night like this for years, either. Jerry, I'm really afraid. You may freeze before you even get as far as— Ah, come now, mother, I argued. They'd guy me to death if I didn't sit in with the gang tonight. They'd chaff me because it was too cold for me to get out. But I'm no pampered sissy, you know, and I want to see— Yes, she retorted bitingly. I know, you want to go and bask in that elegant company. Our stove's just as good as the one down at that dirty old store, continued my persistent and anxious parent. And it's certainly not very flattering to think that you'll leave us on a night like this to— Who'll be there, anyway? Oh, the usual five or six, I suppose, I answered as I adjusted the wick of the lantern, hearing as I did the snarl and cut of the wind through the evergreens in the yard. That black-whistered sphinx, Hammersley, will he be there? Yes, he'll be there, I'm pretty sure. Hmm, she exclaimed, her expression now carrying all the contempt for my judgment and taste she intended it should. Button your coat up good around your neck, then, if you must go to see your precious Hammersley and the rest of them. Have you ever heard that man say anything yet? Does he speak at all, Jerry? Then her gentle mind, not at all accustomed to hard thoughts or contemptuous remarks, quickly changed. "'Funny thing about that fellow,' she mused. "'He's got something on his mind. Don't you think so, Jerry?' "'Yes. Yes, I do. And I've often wondered what it could be. He's certainly a queer stick. Got to admit that. Always brooding. Good fellow, all right, and for a sphinx, as you call him, likable. "'But I wonder what's eating him.' "'What do you suppose it could be, Jerry boy?' questioned Mother, following me to the door. The woman of her now completely forgetting her recent criticisms and perhaps the rough night her son was about to step into. "'Do you think the poor chap has a—a a broken heart or something like that? A girl somewhere who jilted him? Or maybe he loves someone he has no right to?' she finished excitedly, the plates in her hand rattling. "'Maybe it's worse than that,' I adventured. "'Perhaps. I've no right to say it. But perhaps, and I've often thought it, there's a killing he wants to forget, and can't.' I heard my mother's sharp little, "'Oh!' as I shut the door behind me in the warmth and comfort of the room away. Outside it was worse than the whistle of the wind through the trees had led me to expect. Black as pitch it was, and as cold as blazes. For the first moment or two, though, I liked the feel of the challenge of the night and the racing elements, was even a little glad I had added to the dare of the blackness the thought of Hammersley and his killing. But I had not gone far before I was wishing I did not have to save face by putting in an appearance at the store that night. Every Saturday night, with the cows comfortable in their warm barn and my own supper over, I was in the habit of taking my place on the keg or box behind the red-hot stove in Pruitt's store. Tonight, all the snow was being hurled clear of the fields to block the roads full between the old zigzag fences. The wind met me in great pushing gusts, and while it flung itself at me, I would hang against it, snow to my knees, until the blow had gone along when I could plunge forward again. I was glad when I saw the lights of the store glad when I was inside. They met me with mock applause for my pluck in facing the night, but for all their sham flattery, I was pleased I had come, 
proud, I must admit, that I had been able to plow my heavy way through the drifts to reach them. I saw at a glance that my friends were all there, and I saw, too, that there was a strange man present. A very tall man he was, gaunt and awkward as he leaned into the angle of the two counters, his back to a dusty showcase. He attracted my attention at once, not merely because he appeared so long and pointed and skinny, but because of all the ridiculous things in that frozen country, he wore a hard derby hat. If he had not been such a queer character, it would have been laughable, but as it was, it was creepy. For the man beneath that hard hat was about as queer-looking a character as I had ever seen. I suppose he was a visitor at the store, or a friend of one of my friends, and that in a little while I would be introduced. But I was not. I took my place in behind the stove, feeling at once, though I am far from being unsociable usually, that the man was an intruder and would spoil the evening. But despite his cold, dampening presence, we were soon at it, hammer and tongs, discussing the things that are discussed behind hospitable stoves in country stores on bad nights. But I can never lose sight of the fact that the stranger standing there, silent as the grave, was, to say the least, a queer one. Before long I was sure he was no friend or guest of anyone there, and that he not only cast a pall over me, but over all of us. I did not like it, nor did I like him. Perhaps it would have been just as well, after all, I thought, had I heeded my mother and stayed home. Jed Council was the one who, innocently enough, started the thing that changed the evening that had begun so badly into a nightmare. Jerry, he said, leaning across to me, thinking of you this afternoon, reading an article about reincarnation. Remember we were arguing about it last week? Well, this guy, whoever he was, I forgot, believes in it. Says it so, that people do come back. With this opening shot, Jed set back to await my answer. I like these arguments, and I like to bear my share in them, but now, instead of immediately answering the challenge, I looked around to see if any of our other circle were going to answer Jed. Then, deciding that it was up to me, I shrugged off the strange feeling the man in the corner had cast over me and prepared to view my opinions. "'Ah, uh, that's just that fellow's belief, Jed,' I said. "'And just as he's got his, so have I mine. And on this subject, at least, I claim my opinion is as good as anybody's.' I was just getting nicely started, and a little forgetting my distaste for the man in the corner, when the fellow himself interrupted. He left his leaning place and came creaking across the floor to our circle around the store. I say he came creaking, for as he came he did creak. Shoes, I naturally, almost unconsciously decided, though the crazy notion was in my mind that the cracking I heard did sound like bones and joints and sinews badly in need of oil. The stranger sat his groaning self down among us, on a board lying across a nail keg and an old chair. Only from the corner of my eye did I see his movement being friendly enough, despite my dislike, not to allow too marked notice of his attempt to be sociable seem inhospitable on my part. I was about to start again with my argument when Seth Spears, sitting closest to the newcomer, deliberately got up from the bench and went to the counter, telling Pruitt as he went that he had to have some sugar. It was all a farce, a pretext I knew. I've known Seth for years, and had never known him before to take upon himself the buying for his wife's kitchen. Seth simply would not sit beside the man. At that I could keep my eyes from the stranger no longer, and the next moment I felt my heart turn over within me, then lie still. I have seen walking skeletons in circuses, but never such a man as the one who is then sitting at my right hand. Those sideshow men were just lean in comparison to the fellow who had invaded our Saturday night club, his thighs and his legs and his knees sticking sharply into his trousers looked like pieces of inch board, his shoulders and his chest seemed as flat and sharp as his legs. The sight of the man shocked me. I sprang to my feet thoroughly frightened. 
I could not see much of his face sitting there in the dark as he was with his back to the yellow light, but I could make it out to know that it was in keeping with the rest of him. In a moment or two, realizing my childishness, I had fought down my fear, and pretending that a scorching of my leg had caused my hurried movement, I sat down again. None of the others said a word, each waiting for me to continue and break the embarrassing silence. Hammersley, black-whiskered, the Sphinx, as my mother had called him, watched me closely. Hating myself not a little bit, for actually being the sissy I had boasted I was not, I spoke hurriedly, loudly, to cover my confusion. "'No, sir, Jed,' I said, taking up my argument. "'When a man's dead, he's dead. There's no bringing him back like that highbrow claimed. The old heart may be only hitting about once in every hundred times, and if they catch it right at the last stroke they may bring it back then. But once she stopped, Jed, she stopped for good. Once the pulse is gone and the life has flickered out, it's out. And it doesn't come back in any form at all, not in this world. I was glad when I had said it, thereby asserting myself and drowning my foolish fear of the man whose eyes I felt burning into me. I did not turn to look at him, but all the while I felt his gimlety eyes digging into my brain. Then he spoke, and though he sat right next to me his voice sounded like a moan from afar off. It was the first time we had heard this thing that once may have been a voice, and that now sounded like a groan from a closely nailed coffin. He reached a hand toward my knee to enforce his words, but I jerked away. "'So you don't believe a man can come back from the grave, eh?' he grated. "'Believe that once a man's heart is stilled, it stopped for good, eh? "'Well, you're all wrong, Sonny, all wrong. "'You believe these things. I know them.' His interference, his condescension, his whole hatefulness angered me. I could now no longer control my feeling. Oh, you know, do you? I sneered. On such a subject as this, you're entitled to know, are you? Don't make me laugh. I finished insultingly. I was aroused, and I'm a big fellow with no reason to fear ordinary men. Yes, I know, came back his echoing, scratching voice. How do you know? Maybe you've been... Yes, I have he answered, his voice breaking to a squeak. "'Take a good look at me, gentlemen, a good look.' He knew now that he held the center of the stage, that the moment was his. Slowly he raised an arm to remove that ridiculous hat. Again I jumped to my feet, for as his coat sleeve slipped down his forearm, I saw nothing but bone supporting his hand and the hand that bared his head was a skeleton hand. Slowly the hat was lifted, but as quickly as light, six able-bodied men were on their feet and halfway to the door before we realized the cowardliness of it. We forced ourselves back inside the store very slowly, all of us rather ashamed of our ridiculous and childlike fear. But it was all enough to make the blood curdle, with that live dead thing sitting there by the fire. His face and skull were nothing but bone, the eyes deeply sunk into their sockets, the dull brown skin like parchment in its tautness, drawn and shriveled down onto the nose and jaw. There were no cheeks, just hollows. The mouth was a sharp slit beneath the flat nose. He was hideous. "'Come back, and I'll tell you my yarn,' he mocked the slit that was his mouth opening a little to show us the empty, blackened gums. "'I've been dead once,' he went on, getting a lot of satisfaction from the weirdness of the lie and from our fear. "'And I came back. Come and sit down, and I'll explain why I'm this living skeleton.' We came back slowly, and as I did I slipped my hand into my outside pocket where I had a revolver. I put my finger in on the trigger and got ready to use the vicious little thing. I was on edge and torn to pieces completely by the sight of the man, and I doubt not that he had made a move towards me, my frayed nerves would have plugged him full of lead. I eyed my friends, 
they were in no better way than I was. Fright and horror stood on each face. Hammersley was the worst. His hands were twitching, his eyes like bright glass, his face bleached and drawn. "'I've quite a yarn to tell,' went on the skeleton in his awful voice. "'I've had quite a life, a full life. I've taken my fun and my pleasure wherever I could. Maybe you'll call me selfish and greedy, but I always used to believe that a man only passed this way once. Just like you believe, he nodded to me, his neck muscles and jaws creaking. Six years ago I came up into this country and got a job on a farm, he went on, settling into his story. Just an ordinary job, but I liked it because the farmer had a pretty little daughter of about sixteen or seventeen, and as easy as could be. You may not believe it, but you can still find dames green enough to fall for the right story. This one did. I told her I was only out there for a time for my health, that I was rich back in the city with a fine home and everything. She believed me, little fool. He chuckled as he said it and my anger, mounting with his every devilish word, made the finger on the trigger in my pocket take a tighter crook to itself. I asked her to skip with me, the droning went on, made her a lot of great promises, and she fell for it. His dry jawbones clanked and chattered, as if he enjoyed the beastly recital of his achievement, while we sat gaping at him, believing either that the man must be mad or that we were the mad ones, or dreaming. "'We slipped away one night,' continued the beast. "'Went to the city, to a punk hotel. For three weeks we stayed there. Then one morning I told her I was going out for a shave. I was. I got the shave. But I hadn't thought it worth while to tell her I wouldn't be back. Well, she got back to the farm some way, though I don't know. What? I shouted, springing before him. What? You mean you left her there? After you'd taken her, you left her? And here you sit crowing over it, gloating, boasting. Why, you... I lived in a rough country, associated with rough men, heard their vicious language, but seldom used a strong word myself. But as I stood over that monster, utterly hating the beastly thing, all the vile oaths and prickly language of the countryside, no doubt buried in some unused cell in my brain, spilled from my tongue upon him. When I had lashed him as fiercely as I was able, I cried, "'Why don't you come at me? Didn't you hear what I called you? You beast! I'd like to riddle you!' I shouted, drawing my gun. "'Ah, sit down!' he jeered, waving his rattling hand at me. "'You ain't heard a thing yet!' let me finish. Well, she got back to the farm some way or another, and some time over a year later I wandered into this country again, too. I never could explain just why I came back. It was not altogether to see the girl. Her father was a little bit of a man, and I begin to remember what a meek and weak sheep he was. I got it into my head that it would be fun to go back to his farm and rub in it. So I came. Her father was trying out a new corn planter right at the back door when I rounded the house and walked towards him. Then I saw at once that I had made a mistake. When he put his eyes on me his face went white and hard. He came down from the sheet of that machine like a flash and took hurried steps in the direction of a double-barreled gun leaning against the woodshed. They always were troubled with hawks and kept a gun handy but there was an axe nearer to me than the gun was to him. I had to work fast, but I made it all right. I grabbed that axe, jumped at him as he reached for the gun, and swung once. His wife and the girl, too, saw it. Then I turned and ran. The gaunt brute before us slowly crossed one groaning knee above the other. We were all sitting again now. The perspiration rolled down my face. I held my gun trained upon him, and though I now believed he was totally mad, 
because of a certain ring of truth in that empty voice i sat fascinated i looked at seth his jaw was hanging loose his eyes bulging hammersley's mouth was set in a tight clenched line his eyes like fire in his blue drawn face i could not see the others the telephone caught me continued our ghastly storyteller and in no time at all i was convicted and the date set for the hanging when my time was pretty close a doctor or scientist fellow came to see me who said blaggett you're slated to die how much will you sell me your body for if he didn't say it that way he meant just that and i said nothing i've no one to leave money to what do you want with my body and he told me i believe i can bring you back to life and health provided they don't snap your neck when they drop you oh you're one of those guys are you i said then all right hop to it if you can do it i'll be much obliged then i can go back on that farm and do a little more axe swinging again came his horrible chuckle again i mopped my brow so we made our plans he went on pleased with our discomfiture and our despising of him next day some chap came to see me pretending he was my brother and i carried out my part of it by cursing him at first and then begging him to give me decent burial so he went away and i suppose received permission to get me right after i was cut down there was a fence built around the scaffold they had ready for me and the party i was about to fling and they had some militia there too the crowd seemed quiet enough till they led me out then their buzzing sounded like a hive of bees getting all stirred up then a few loud voices then shouts some rocks came flying at me after that and it looked to me as though the hanging would not be so gentle a party after all i tell you i was afraid i wished it was over the mob pushed against the fence and flattened it out coming over it like waves over a beach the soldiers fired into the air but still they came and i i ran up onto the scaffold it was safer <laughs> as he said this he chuckled loudly i'll bet he laughed that it's the first time a guy ever ran into the noose for the safety of it the mob came only to the foot of the scaffold though from where they seemed satisfied to see the law take its course the sheriff was nervous so cut up that he only made a fling at tying my ankles just dropped a rope around my wrists he was like me he wanted to get it over and the crowd on its way then he put the rope around my neck stepped back and shot the trap zam no time for a prayer or for me to laugh at the offer or a last word or anything i felt the floor give felt myself shoot through smack my weight on the end of the rope hit me behind the ears like a mallet everything went black of course it would have been just my luck to get a broken neck out of it and give the scientist no chance to revive me but after a second or two or a minute or it could have been an hour the blackness went away enough to allow me to know i was hanging on the end of my rope kicking fighting choking to death my tongue swelled my face and head and heart and body seemed ready to burst slowly i went into a deep mist that i knew was the mist then then i was off floating in the air over the heads of the crowd watching my own hanging i saw them give that slowly swinging carcass on the end of its rope enough time to thoroughly die them from my aerial unseen watching place i saw them cut it me down they tried the pulse of the body that had been mine they examined my staring eyes then i heard them pronounce me dead the fools i had known i was dead for a minute or two by that time else how could my spirit have been gone from the shell and be out floating around over their heads he paused here as he asked his question his head turning on its dry and creaking neck to include us all in his query but none of us spoke we were dreaming it all of course or were mad we thought 
in just a short while went on the skeleton my brother came driving slowly in for my body with no special hurry he loaded me onto his little truck and drove easily away but once clear of the crowd he pushed his foot down on the gas and in five more minutes with me hovering all the while alongside of him mind you floating along as though i had been a bird all my life we turned into the driveway of a summer house the scientific guy met him they carried me into the house into a fine fitted laboratory my dead body was placed on a table a huge knife ripped my clothes from me quickly the loads from ten or a dozen hypodermic syringes were shot into different parts of my naked body then it was carried across the room to what looked like a large glass bottle or vase with an opening in the top through this door i was lowered my body being held upright by straps in there for that purpose the door to the opening was then placed in position and, and by means of an acetylene torch and some easily melting glass the door was sealed tight so there stood my poor old body ready for the experiment to bring it back to life and as my new self floated around above the scientist and his helper I smiled to myself, for I was sure the experiment would prove a failure, even though I now knew that the sheriff's haste had kept him from placing the rope right at my throat and had saved me from a broken neck. I was dead. All that was left of me now was my spirit or soul, and that was swimming and floating about above their heads with not an inclination in the world to have a thing to do with the husk of a man I could clearly see through the glass of the bell. They turned on a huge battery of ultraviolet rays then, continued the hollow droning of the man who had been hanged, which, as the scientist had explained to me while in prison, acting upon the contents of the syringes by that time scattered throughout my whole body, was to renew the spark of life within the dead thing hanging there through a tube and by means of a valve entering the glass vase in the top the scientist then admitted a dense white gas so thick it was that in a moment or two my body's transparent coffin appeared to be full of a liquid as white as milk electricity then revolved my cage around so that my body was ensured a complete and even exposure to the rays of the green and violet lamps and while all this silly stuff was going on around and around the laboratory i floated confident of the complete failure of the whole thing yet determined to see it through if for no other reason than to see the discomfiture and disappointment that this mere man was bound to experience you see i was already looking back upon earthly mortals as being inferior and now i waited for this proof I was all the while fighting off a new urge to be going elsewhere. Something was calling me, beckoning me to be coming into the full spirit world. But I wanted to see this wise earth guy fail. For a little while conditions stayed the same within that glass. So thick was the liquid gas in there at first that I could see nothing. Then it began to clear and I saw to my surprise that the milky gas was disappearing because it was being forced in by the rays from the lights in through the pores into the body itself as though my form was sucking it in like a sponge the scientist and his helper were tense and taut with excitement and suddenly my comfortable feeling left me until then it had seemed so smooth and velvety and peaceful drifting around over their heads as though lying on a soft fleecy cloud but now I felt a sudden squeezing of my spirit body. Then I was in agony. Before I knew what I was doing, my spirit was clinging to the outside of that twisting glass bell, clawing to get into the body that was coming back to life. The glass now was perfectly clear of the gas, though as yet there was no sign of life in the body inside to hint to the scientist that he would to be successful. But I knew it for I fought desperately to break in through the glass to get back into my discarded shell of a body again, 
knowing I must get in or die a worse death than I had before. Then my sharper eyes noted a slight shiver passing over the white thing before me, and the scientist must have seen it in the next second, for he sprang forward with a choking cry of delight. Then the lolling head inside lifted a bit. I, still desperately clinging with my spirit hands to the outside, and all the time growing weaker and weaker, I saw the breast of my body rise and fall. The assistant picked up a heavy steel hammer and stood ready to crash open the glass at the right moment. Then my once dead eyes opened in there to look around, while I, clinging and gasping outside, just as I had on the scaffold, went into a deeper, darkener blackness than ever. Just before my spirit life died utterly, I saw the eyes of my body realize completely what was going on. Then, from the inside now, I saw the scientist give the signal that caused the assistant to crash away the glass shell with one blow of the hammer. They reached in for me, and I fainted. When I came back to consciousness, I was being carefully, slowly revived, and nursed back to life by oxygen and a pulmotor. The terrible creature, telling us this tale, paused again to look around. My knees were weak, my clothes wet with sweat. "'Is that all?' I asked in a piping, strange voice, half sarcastic, half unbelieving, and wholly spellbound. "'Just about,' he answered. "'But what do you expect? I left my friend the scientist at once, even though he did hate to see me go. It had been all right while he was so keen on the experiment himself, and while he only half believed his ability to bring me back.' But now that he had done it, it kind of worried him to think what sort of a man he was turning loose of the world again. I could see how he was figuring, and because I had no idea of letting him try another experiment on me, perhaps of putting me away again, I beat it in a hurry. That was five years ago. For five years I've lived with only just part of me here. Whatever it was trying to get back into that glass just before my body came to life, my spirit, I've been calling it, I've been without. It never did get back. You see, the scientist brought me back inside a shell that kept my spirit out. That's why I am the skeleton you see I am. Something vital is missing. He stood up cracking and creaking before us buttoning his loose coat about his angular body. "'Well, boys,' he asked lightly, "'what do you think of that?' "'I think you're a liar, a damn liar,' I cried. "'And now, if you don't want me to fill you full of lead, get out of here and get out now. If I have to do it to you, there's no scientist this time to bring you back. When you go out, you'll stay out.' "'Don't worry.' He grimaced back to me, waving a mass of bones that should have been a hand contemptuously at me. I'm going. I'm heading for Shelton. He stalked the length of the floor and shut the door behind him. The beast had gone. The dirty liar! I cried. I wish, yes, I wish I had an excuse to kill him. Just think of being that loose, will you? A brute who would think up such a yarn? Of course it's all absurd, all crazy, all a lie. No, it's not a lie. I turned to see who had spoken. Hammersley's voice was so unfamiliar, and now so torn in addition that I could not have thought he had spoken, had he not been looking right at me, his glittering eyes challenging my assertion. Would wonders never cease? I asked myself. First this outrageous yarn, now Hammersley the Sphinx expressing an opinion looking for an argument. Of course it must be that his susceptible and brooding brain had been turned a bit by the evening we had just experienced. "'Why, Hammersley, you don't believe it?' I asked. "'I not only believe it, Jerry, but now it's my turn to say, as he did, I know it. "'Jerry, old friend,' he went on, "'that devil told the truth. He was hanged. He was brought back to life, and Jerry... I was that scientist. Whew! I fell back to a box again. My knees seemed to forsake me. Then I heard Hammersley talking to himself. 
Five years it's been, he muttered. Five years since I turned him loose again. Five years of agony for me, wondering what new devilish crimes he was perpetrating, wondering when he would turn to that little farm to swing his axe again. Five years! Five years! He came over to me, and without a word of explanation or to ask my permission, he reached his hand into my pocket and drew out my revolver, and I did not protest. He said he was headed for Shelton, went on Hammerly's spoken thoughts. If I slip across the ice, I can intercept him at Black's Woods. Buttoning his coat closely, he followed the stranger out into the night. I was glad that the moon had come up for my walk home. Glad, too, when I had the door locked and propped with a chair behind me. I undressed in the dark, not wanting any grisly, sunken-eyed monster to be looking in through the window at me. For maybe, so I thought, maybe he was, after all, not headed for Shelton, but perhaps planning on another of his ghastly tricks. But in the morning we knew he had been going towards Shelton. Scientists, doctors, and learned men of all descriptions came out to our village to see the thing the papers said Cy Waters had stumbled upon when on his way to the creamery that next morning. It was a skeleton, they said, only that it had a dry skin all over it. A mummy. Could not have been considered capable of containing life, only that the snow around it was lightly blotched with a pale smear that proved to be blood that had oozed out from the six bullet holes in the horrid chest. They never did solve it. There were five of us in the store that night, five of us who know. Hammersley did what we all wanted to do. Of course his name is not really Hammersley, but it has done here as well as another. He is black-whiskered, though, and he is still very much of a sphinx, but he'll never have to answer for having killed the man he once brought back to life. Hammersley's secret will go into five other graves beside his own. End of The Man Who Was Dead Recording by Jeff Chestnut The Adventure of the German Student by Washington Irving This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Adventure of the German Student by Washington Irving In a stormy night, in the tempestuous times of the French Revolution, a young German was returning to his lodgings at a late hour across the old part of Paris. The lightning gleamed and the loud claps of thunder rattled through the lofty narrow streets. But I should first tell you something about this young German. Gottfried Wolfgang was a young man of good family. He had studied for some time at Göttingen, but being of a visionary and enthusiastic character, he had wandered into those wild and speculative doctrines which have so often bewildered German students. His secluded life, his intense application, and the singular nature of his studies, had an effect on both mind and body. His imagination diseased. He had been indulging in fanciful speculations on spiritual essences. Until, like Swedenborg, he had an ideal world of his own around him. He took up a notion, I do not know from what cause, that there was an evil influence hanging over him an evil genius or spirit seeking to ensnare him and ensure his perdition. Such an idea, working on his melancholy temperament, produced the most gloomy effects. He became haggard and desponding. His friends discovered the mental malady preying upon him and determined that the best cure was a change of scene. He was sent, therefore, to finish his studies amidst the splendors and gaieties of Paris. Wolfgang arrived at Paris at the breaking out of the revolution. The popular delirium at first caught his enthusiastic mind, and he was captivated by the political and philosophical theories of the day. But the scenes of blood which followed shocked his sensitive nature, disgusted him with society and the world 
and made him more than ever a recluse. He shut himself up in a solitary apartment in the Pie Latin, the quarter of students. There, in a gloomy street, not far from the monastic walls of the Sorbonne, he pursued his favorite speculations. Sometimes he spent hours together in the great libraries of Paris, those catacombs of departed authors, rummaging among their hordes of dusty and obsolete works in quest of food for his unhealthy appetite. He was, in a manner, a literary ghoul, feeding in the charnel house of decayed literature. Wolfgang, though solitary and recluse, was of an ardent temperament, but for a time it operated merely upon his imagination. He was too shy and ignorant of the world to make any advances to the fair, but he was a passionate admirer of female beauty, and in his lonely chamber would often lose himself in reveries on forms and faces which he had seen, and his fancy would deck out images of loveliness far surpassing the reality. While his mind was in this excited and sublimated state, a dream produced an extraordinary effect upon him. It was of a female face of transcendent beauty. So strong was the impression made that he dreamt of it again and again. It haunted his thoughts by day, his slumbers by night. In fine, he became passionately enamored of this shadow of a dream. This lasted so long that it became one of those fixed ideas which haunt the minds of melancholy men and are at times mistaken for madness. Such was Gottfried Wolfgang, and such his situation at the time I mentioned. He was returning home late on stormy night, through some of the old and gloomy streets of the Marais, the ancient part of Paris. The loud claps of thunder rattled among the high houses of the narrow streets. He came to the Place de Greve, the square where public executions are performed. The lightning quivered about the pinnacles of the ancient Hôtel de Ville and shed flickering gleams over the open space in front. As Wolfgang was crossing the square, he shrank back with horror at finding himself close by the guillotine. It was the height of the reign of terror when this dreadful instrument of death stood ever ready, and its scaffold was continually running with the blood of the virtuous and the brave. It had that very day been actively employed in the work of carnage, and there it stood, in grim array, amidst a silent and sleeping city, waiting for fresh victims. Wolfgang's heart sickened within him, and he was turning, shuddering from the horrible engine, when he beheld a shadowy form, cowering, as it were, at the foot of the steps which led up to the scaffold. A succession of vivid flashes of lightning revealed it more distinctly. It was a female figure, dressed in black. She was seated on one of the lower steps of the scaffold, leaning forward, her face hid in her lap, and her long disheveled tresses hanging to the ground, streaming with the rain which fell in torrents. Wolfgang paused. There was something awful in this solitary monument of woe. The female had the appearance of being above the common order. He knew the times to be full of vicissitude, and that many a fair head, which had once been pillowed on down, now wandered houseless. Perhaps this was some poor mourner whom the dreadful axe had rendered desolate and who sat here heartbroken on the strand of existence from which all that was dear to her had been launched into eternity. He approached and addressed her in the accents of sympathy. She raised her head and gazed wildly at him. What was his astonishment at beholding, by the bright glare of the lighting, the very face which had haunted him in his dreams? It was pale and disconsolate but ravishingly beautiful. Trembling with violent and conflicting emotions, Wolfgang again accosted her. He spoke something of her being exposed at such an hour of the night, and to the fury of such a storm, and offered to conduct her to her friends. She pointed to the guillotine with a gesture of dreadful signification. I have no friend on earth, said she. But you have a home, said Wolfgang. 
Yes, in the grave. The heart of the student melted at the words. If a stranger dare make an offer, said he, without danger of being misunderstood, I would offer my humble dwelling as a shelter, myself as a devoted friend. I am friendless myself in Paris, and a stranger in the land. But if my life could be of service, it is at your disposal, and should be sacrificed before harm or indignity should come to you. There was an honest earnestness in the young man's manner that had its effect. His foreign accent, too, was in his favour. It showed him not to be a hackneyed inhabitant of Paris. Indeed, there is an eloquence in true enthusiasm that is not to be doubted. The homeless stranger confided herself implicitly to the protection of the student. He supported her faltering steps across the Pont and by the place where the statue of Henry the Fourth had been overthrown by the populace. The storm had abated, and a thunder rumbled at a distance. All Paris was quiet. That great volcano of human passion slumbered for a while, to gather fresh strength for the next day's eruption. The student conducted his charge through the ancient streets of the Pie Latin, and by the dusky walls of the Sorbonne, to the great dingy hotel which he inhabited. The old portress who admitted them stared with surprise at the unusual sight of the melancholy Wolfgang with a female companion. On entering his apartment, the student, for the first time, blushed at the scantiness and indifference of his dwelling. He had but one chamber, an old-fashioned saloon, heavily carved and fantastically furnished with the remains of former magnificence for it was one of those hotels in the quarter of the Luxembourg Palace which had once belonged to nobility. It was lumbered with books and papers, and all the usual apparatus of a student, and his bed stood in a recess at one end. When lights were brought, and Wolfgang had a better opportunity of contemplating the stranger, he was more than ever intoxicated by her beauty. Her face was pale, but of a dazzling fairness, set off by a profusion of raven hair that hung clustering about it. Her eyes were large and brilliant, with a singular expression approaching almost to wildness. As far as her black dress permitted her shape to be seen, it was of perfect symmetry. Her whole appearance was highly striking, though she was dressed in the simplest style. The only thing approaching to an ornament which she wore was a broad black band round her neck clasped by diamonds. The perplexity now commenced with the student how to dispose of the helpless being thus thrown upon his protection. He thought of abandoning his chamber to her, and seeking shelter for himself elsewhere. Still, he was so fascinated by her charms, they seemed to be such a spell upon his thoughts and senses, that he could not tear himself from her presence. Her manner, too, was singular and unaccountable. She spoke no more of the guillotine. Her grief had abated. The attentions of the student had first won her confidence, and then, apparently, her heart. She was evidently an enthusiast like himself, and enthusiasts soon understand each other. In the infatuation of the moment, Wolfgang avowed his passion for her. He told her the story of his mysterious dream, and how she had possessed his heart before he had even seen her. She was strangely affected by his recital, and acknowledged to have felt an impulse towards him equally unaccountable. It was the time for wild theory and wild actions. Old prejudices and superstitions were done away. Everything was under the sway of the goddess of reason. Among other rubbish of the old times, the forms and ceremonies of marriage began to be considered superfluous bonds for honourable minds. Social compacts were the vogue. Wolfgang was too much of theorist not to be tainted by the liberal doctrines of the day. Why should we separate? said he. Our hearts are united. In the eye of reason and honour we are as one. What need is there of sordid forms to bind high souls together? The stranger listened with emotion. She had evidently received illumination at the same school. You have no home or family, continued he. 
let me be everything to you, or rather, let us be everything to one another. If form is necessary, form shall be observed. There is my hand. I pledge myself to you for ever. For ever, said the stranger solemnly. For ever, repeated Wolfgang. The stranger clasped the hand extended to her. Then I am yours, murmured she, and she sank upon his bosom. The next morning the student left his bride sleeping, and sallied forth at an early hour to seek more spacious apartments suitable to the change in his situation. When he returned, he found the stranger lying with her head hanging over the bed and one arm thrown over it. He spoke to her, but received no reply. He advanced to awaken her from her uneasy posture. On taking her hand, it was cold. There was no pulsation. Her face was pallid and ghastly. In a word, she was a corpse. Horrid and frantic, he alarmed the house. A scene of confusion ensued. The police was summoned. As the officer of police entered the room, he started back on beholding the corpse. Great heavens, cried he, how did the woman come here? Do you know anything about her? said Wolfgang eagerly. Do I? exclaimed the officer. She was guillotined yesterday. He stepped forward, undid the black collar round the neck of the corpse, and the head rolled on the floor. The student burst into a frenzy. The fiend, the fiend has gained possession of me, shrieked he. I am lost forever. They tried to soothe him, but in vain. He was possessed with the frightful belief that an evil spirit had reanimated the dead body to ensnare him. He went distracted and died in a madhouse. Here the old gentleman with the haunted head finished the narrative. And is this really a fact? said the inquisitive gentleman. A fact not to be doubted, replied the other. I had it from the best authority. The student told it me himself. I saw him in a madhouse in Paris. End of The Adventure of the German Student by Washington Irving Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Rip Van Winkle by Washington Irving This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The following tale was found among the papers of the late Diedrich Knickerbocker, an old gentleman of New York, who was very curious in the Dutch history of the province and the manners of the descendants from its primitive settlers. His historical researches, however, did not lie so much among books as among men for the former are lamentably scanty on his favorite topics, whereas he found the old burghers, and still more their wives, rich in that legendary lore so invaluable to true history. Whenever, therefore, he happened upon a genuine Dutch family snugly shut up in its low-roofed farmhouse under a spreading sycamore, he looked upon it as a little clasped volume of black letter, and studied it with the zeal of a bookworm. The result of all these researches was a history of the province during the reign of the Dutch governors, which was published some years since. There have been various opinions as to the literary character of his work, and, to tell the truth, it is not a whit better than it should be. Its chief merit is its scrupulous accuracy, which indeed was a little questioned on its first appearance, but has since been completely established, and is now admitted into all historical collections as a book of unquestionable authority. The old gentleman died shortly after the publication of his work, and now that he is dead and gone it cannot do much harm to his memory to say that his time might have been better employed in weightier labors. He, however, was apt to ride his hobby his own way, and though it did now and then kick up the dust a little in the eyes of his neighbors, and grieve the spirit of some friends for whom he felt the truest deference and affection, yet his errors and follies are remembered more in sorrow and than in anger and it begins to be suspected that he never intended to injure or offend. But, however his memory may be appreciated by critics, it is still held dear by many folks whose good opinion is well worth having, particularly by certain biscuit-bakers, who have gone so far as to imprint his likeness on their New Year cakes, 
and have thus given him a chance for immortality almost equal to the being stamped on a Waterloo medal or a Queen Anne's farthing. Rip Van Winkle by Washington Irving Whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachian family, and are seen away to the west of the river, swelling up to a noble height, and lording it over the surrounding country. Every change of season, every change of weather, indeed every hour of the day, produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains, and they are regarded by all the good wives far and near as perfect barometers. When the weather is fair and settled, they are clothed in blue and purple, and print their bold outlines on the clear evening sky. But sometimes, when the rest of the landscape is cloudless, they will gather a hood of gray vapors about their summits, which in the last rays of the setting sun will glow and light up like a crown of glory. At the foot of these fairy mountains, the voyager may have decried the light smoke curling up from a village, whose shingle roofs gleam among the trees, just where the blue tints of the upland melt away into the fresh green of the nearer landscape. It is a little village of great antiquity, having been founded by some of the Dutch colonists in the early times of the province, just about the beginning of the government of the good Peter Stuyvesant. May he rest in peace. And there were some of the houses of the original settlers, standing within a few years, built of small yellow bricks brought from Holland, having latticed windows and gable fronts surmounted with weathercocks. In that same village, in one of these very houses, which, to tell the precise truth, was sadly time-worn and weather-beaten, there lived many years since, while the country was yet a province of Great Britain, a simple, good-natured fellow of the name of Rip Van Winkle. He was a descendant of the Van Winkles, who figured so gallantly in the chivalrous days of Peter Stuyvesant, and accompanied him to the siege of Fort Christina. He inherited, however, but little of the martial character of his ancestors. I have observed that he was a simple, good-natured man. He was, moreover, a kind neighbor, and an obedient, henpecked husband. Indeed, to the latter circumstance might be owing that meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity. For those men are most apt to be obsequious and conciliating abroad who are under the discipline of shrews at home. Their tempers, doubtless, are rendered pliant and malleable in the fiery furnace of domestic tribulation, and a curtain lecture is worth all the sermons in the world for teaching the virtues of patience and long-suffering. A termagant wife may therefore in some respects be considered a tolerable blessing, and if so, Rip Van Winkle was thrice blessed. Certain it is that he was a great favorite among all the good wives of the village, who, as usual with the amiable sex, took his part in all family squabbles, and never failed, whenever they talked those matters over in their evening gossipings, to lay all the blame on Dame Van Winkle. The children of the village, too, would shout with joy whenever he approached. He assisted at their sports, made their playthings, taught them to fly kites and shoot marbles, and told them long stories of ghosts, witches, and Indians. Whenever he went dodging about the village, he was surrounded by a troop of them hanging on his skirts, clambering on his back, and playing a thousand tricks on him with impunity, and not a dog would bark at him throughout the neighborhood. The great error in Rip's composition was an insuperable aversion to all kinds of profitable labor. It could not be from the want of assiduity or perseverance, for he would sit on a wet rock and with a rod as long and heavy as a tartar's lance, and fish all day without a murmur, even though he should not be encouraged by a single nibble. He would carry a fowling piece on his shoulder for hours together, trudging through woods and swamps and uphill and down dale to shoot a few squirrels or wild pigeons. He would never refuse to assist a neighbor even in the roughest toil, and was a foremost man at all country frolics for husking Indian corn or building stone fences. The women of the village, too, used to employ him to run their errands, and do such little odd jobs that as their less obliging husbands would not do for them. In a word, Rip was ready to attend to anybody's business but his own. But as to doing family duty and keeping his farm in order, he found it impossible. In fact, he declared it was of no use to work on his farm. It was the most pestilent little piece of ground in the whole country. Everything about it went wrong, and would go wrong in spite of him. His fences were continually falling to pieces. His cow would either go astray or get among the cabbages. 
Weeds were sure to grow quicker in his fields than anywhere else. The rain always made a point of setting in just as he had some outdoor work to do, so that though his patrimonial estate had dwindled away under his management, acre by acre, until there was little more than left than a mere patch of Indian corn and potatoes, yet it was the worst conditioned farm in the neighborhood. His children, too, were as ragged and wild as if they belonged to nobody. His son, Rip, an urchin begotten in his own likeness, promised to inherit the inhabitants with the old clothes of his father. He was generally seen trooping like a colt at his mother's heels, equipped in a pair of his father's cast-off galligaskins, which he had much ado to hold up with one hand, as a fine lady does her train in bad weather. Rip Van Winkle, however, was one of those happy mortals, of foolish, well-oiled dispositions, who take the world easy, eat white bread or brown, whichever he can be got with least thought or trouble, and he would rather starve on a penny than work on a, for a pound. If left to himself, he would have whistled life away in perfect contentment. But his wife kept continually dinning in his ears about his carelessness and the ruin he was bringing on his family. Morning, noon, and night her tongue was incessantly going, and everything he said or did was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence. Rip had but one way of replying to all lectures of the kind, and that by frequent use had grown into a habit. He shrugged his shoulders, shook his head, cast up his eyes, but said nothing. This, however, always provoked a fresh volley from his wife, so that he was fain to draw off his forces and take to the outside of the house, the only side in which in truth belongs to a hen-pecked husband. Rip's sole domestic adherent was his dog Wolf, who was as much hen-pecked as his master, for Dame Van Winkle regarded them as companions in idleness, and even looked upon Wolf with an evil eye as the cause of his master's going so often astray. True it is, in all points of spirit befitting an honorable dog, he was as courageous an animal as ever scoured the woods. But what courage can withstand the ever-during and all-besetting terrors of a woman's tongue? The moment Wolf entered the house, his crest fell, his tail drooped to the ground or curled between his legs. He sneaked about with a gallows air, casting many a sidelong glance at Dame Van Winkle, and at the least flourish of a broomstick or ladle, he would fly to the door with yelping precipitation. Times grew worse and worse for Rip Van Winkle, as years of matrimony rolled on. A tart temper never mellows with age, and a sharp tongue is the only edged tool that grows keener with constant use. For a long while he used to console himself when driven from home by frequenting a kind of perpetual club of the sages, philosophers, and other idle personages of the village, which held its sessions on a bench before a small inn designated by a rubicund portrait of His Majesty, George the Third. Here they used to sit in the shade through a long, lazy summer's day, talking listlessly over village gossip, or telling endless sleepy stories about nothing. But it would have been worth any statesman's money to have heard the profound discussions that sometimes took place, when by chance an old newspaper fell into their hands from some passing traveler. How solemnly they would listen to the contents, as drawled out by Derek Van Bummel, the schoolmaster, a dapper, learned little man, who was not to be daunted by the most gigantic word in the dictionary, and how sagely they would deliberate upon public events some months after they had taken place. The opinions of this junta were completely controlled by Nicholas Vedder, a patriarch of the village and landlord of the inn, at the door of which he took his seat from morning till night just moving sufficiently to avoid the sun and keep in the shade of a large tree, so that the neighbors could tell the hour by his movements as accurately as by a sundial. It is true he was rarely heard to speak, but smoked his pipe incessantly. His adherents, however, for every great man has his adherents, perfectly understood him, and knew how to gather his opinions. When anything that was read or related displeased him, he was observed to smoke his pipe vehemently and to send forth short, frequent, and angry puffs. When pleased, he would inhale the smoke slowly and tranquilly, and emit it in light and placid clouds, and sometimes, taking the pipe from his mouth and letting the fragrant vapor curl about his nose, would gravely nod his head in token of perfect approbation. From even this stronghold the unlucky Rip was at length routed by his termagant wife, who would suddenly break in upon the tranquility of the assemblage and call the members all to naught. Nor was that august personage, Nicholas Vetter himself, sacred from the daring tongue of this terrible Virgo, who charged him outright with encouraging her husband in habits of idleness. Poor Rip was at last reduced almost to despair. 
and his only alternative to escape from the labor of the farm and clamor of his wife was to take gun in hand and stroll away into the woods. Here he would sometimes seat himself at the foot of a tree and share the contents of his wallet with Wolf, with whom he sympathized as a fellow sufferer in persecution. Poor Wolf, he would say, thy mistress leads thee a dog's life of it. But never mind, my lad, whilst I live thou shalt never want a friend to stand by thee. Wolf would wag his tail, look wistfully in his master's face, and if dogs can feel pity, I verily believe he reciprocated the sentiment with all his heart. In a long ramble of the kind, on a fine autumnal day, Rip had unconsciously scrambled to one of the highest parts of the Catskill Mountains. He was after his favorite sport of squirrel shooting, and the still solitudes had echoed and re-echoed with the reports of his gun. Panting and fatigued, he threw himself late in the afternoon on a green knoll, covered with mountain herbage that crowned the brow of a precipice. From an opening between the trees he could overlook all the lower country from many a mile of rich woodland. He saw at a distance the lordly Hudson, far, far below him, moving on its silent but majestic course with the reflection of a purple cloud or the sail of a lagging bark, here and there sleeping on its glassy bosom, and at last losing itself in the blue highlands. On the other side he looked down into a deep mountain glen, wild, lonely, and shagged, the bottom filled with fragments from the impending cliffs, and scarcely lighted by the reflected rays of the setting sun. For some time Rip lay musing on this scene. Evening was gradually advancing. The mountains began to throw their long blue shadows over the valleys. He saw that it would be dark long before he could reach the village, and he heaved a heavy sigh when he thought of encountering the terrors of Dame Van Winkle. As he was about to descend, he heard a voice from the distance hallowing, Rip Van Winkle! Rip Van Winkle! He looked round but could see nothing but a crow winging its solitary flight across the mountain. He thought his fancy must have deceived him, and turned again to descend when he heard the same cry ringing through the still evening air, Rip Van Winkle! Rip Van Winkle! At the same time, Wolf bristled up his neck, and giving a low growl, skulked to his master's side, looking fearfully down into the glen. Rip now felt a vague apprehension stealing over him. He looked anxiously in the same direction, and perceived a strange figure slowly toiling up the rocks and bending under the weight of something he carried on his back. He was surprised to see any human being in this lonely and unfrequented place, but supposing it to be someone of the neighborhood in need of his assistance, he hastened down to yield it. On nearer approach he was still more surprised at the singularity of the stranger's appearance. He was a short, square-built old fellow with thick bushy hair and a grizzled beard. His dress was of the antique Dutch fashion, a cloth jerkin strapped round the waist, several pair of breeches, the outer one of ample volume, decorated with rows of buttons down the sides and bunches at the knees. He bore on his shoulder a stout keg, and that seemed full of liquor, and made signs for Rip to approach and assist him with the load. Though rather shy and distrustful of this new acquaintance, Rip complied with his usual alacrity, and, mutually relieving one another, they clambered up a narrow gully, apparently the dry bed of a mountain torrent. As they ascended, Rip every now and then heard long, rolling peals, like distant thunder, that seemed to issue out of a deep ravine, or rather cleft between lofty rocks toward which their rugged path conducted. He paused for an instant, but supposing it to be the muttering of one of those transient thunder showers which often take place in mountain heights, he proceeded. Passing through the ravine, they came to a hollow, like a small amphitheater, surrounded by perpendicular precipices, over the brinks of which impending trees shot their branches, so that you only caught glimpses of the azure sky and the bright evening cloud. During the whole time, Rip and his companion had labored on in silence, for though the former marveled greatly what could be the object of carrying a keg of liquor up this wild mountain, yet there was something strange and incomprehensible about the unknown that inspired awe and checked familiarity. On entering the amphitheater, new objects of wonder presented themselves. On a level spot in the center was a company of odd-looking personages, playing at ninepins. They were dressed in a quaint, outlandish fashion. Some wore short doublets, others jerkins with long knives in their belts, and most of them had enormous breeches of similar style with that of the guides. Their visages, too, were peculiar. 
One had a large beard, broad face, and small piggish eyes. The face of another seemed to consist entirely of nose, and was surmounted by a white sugar-loaf hat, set off with a little red cock's tail. They all had beards, of various shapes and colors. There was one who seemed to be the commander. He was a stout old gentleman, with a weather-beaten countenance. He wore a laced doublet, broad belt and hanger, high-crowned hat and feather, red stockings and high-heeled shoes with roses in them. The whole group reminded Rip of the figures in an old Flemish painting in the parmer of Dominie van Schaik, the village parson, and which had been brought over from Holland at the time of the settlement. What seemed particularly odd to Rip was that, though these folks were evidently amusing themselves, yet they maintained the gravest faces, the most mysterious silence, and were with over a most melancholy party of pleasure he had ever witnessed. Nothing interrupted the stillness of the scene but the noise of the balls, which, whenever they were rolled, echoed along the mountains like rumbling peals of thunder. As Rip and his companion approached them, they suddenly desisted from their play, and stared at him with such fixed statue-like gaze, and such strange, uncouth, black-luster countenances, that his heart turned within him, and his knees smoked together. His companion now emptied the contents of the keg into large flagons, and made signs to him to wait upon the company. He obeyed with fear and trembling. They quaffed the liquor in profound silence, and then returned to their game. By degrees, Rip's awe and apprehension subsided. He even adventured, when no eye was fixed upon him, to taste the beverage, which he found had much of the flavor of excellent Hollands. He was naturally a thirsty soul, and was soon tempted to repeat the draught. One taste provoked another, and he reiterated his visits to the flagon so often that at length his senses were overpowered. His eyes swam in his head, his head gradually declined, and he fell into a deep sleep. On waking, he found himself on the green knoll whence he had first seen the man of the glen. He rubbed his eyes. It was a bright, sunny morning. The birds were hopping and twittering among the bushes, and the eagle was wheeling aloft and breasting the pure mountain breeze. Surely, thought Rip, I have not slept here all night. He recalled the occurrences before he fell asleep. The strange man with a keg of liquor, the mountain ravine, the wild retreat among the rocks, the woe-begone party at ninepins, the flag at... Oh, that flagon, that wicked flagon, thought Rip. What excuse shall I make to Dame Van Winkle? He looked round for his gun, but in place of the clean, well-oiled fowling piece, he found an old firelock lying by him, the barrel encrusted with rust, the lock falling off, and the stock worm-eaten. He now suspected that the grave roisterers in the mountain had put a trick upon him, and having dosed him with liquor, had robbed him of his gun. Wolf, too, had disappeared but he might have strayed away after a squirrel or partridge. He whistled after him and shouted his name, but all in vain. The echoes repeated his whistle and shout, but no dog was to be seen. He determined to revisit the scene of the last evening's gamble, and if he met with any of the party, to demand his dog and gun. As he rose to walk, he found himself stiff in the joints and wanting in his usual activity. These mountain beds do not agree with me, thought Rip and if this frolic should lay me up with a fit of the rheumatism, I shall have a blessed time with Dame Van Winkle. With some difficulty he got down into the glen. He found the gully up which he and his companion had ascended the preceding evening, but to his astonishment a mountain stream was now foaming down it, leaping from rock to rock, and filling the glen with babbling murmurs. He, however, made shift to scramble up its sides, working his toilsome way through thickets of birch, sassafras, and witch hazel, and sometimes tripped up or entangled by the wild grapevines that twisted their coils or tendrils from tree to tree, and spread a kind of network in his path. At length he reached to where the ravine had opened through the cliffs to the amphitheatre, but no traces of such opening remained. The rocks presented a high, impenetrable wall over which the torrent came tumbling in a sheet of feathery foam and fell into a broad, deep basin, black from the shadows of the surrounding forest. Here, then, poor Rip was brought to a stand. He again called and whistled after his dog. He was only answered by the cawing of a flock of idle crows, sporting high in air about a dry tree that overhung a sunny precipice, and who, secure in their elevation, seemed to look down and scoff at the poor man's perplexities. What was to be done? 
the morning was passing away, and Rip felt famished for want of his breakfast. He grieved to give up his dog and gun. He dreaded to meet his wife, but it would not do to starve among the mountains. He shook his head, shouldered the rusty firelock, and with a heart full of trouble and anxiety turned his steps homeward. As he approached the village, he met a number of people, but none whom he knew, which somewhat surprised him, for he had thought himself acquainted with every one in the country round. Their dress, too, was of different fashion from that to which he was accustomed. They all stared at him with equal marks of surprise, and whenever they cast their eyes upon him, invariably stroked their chins. The constant recurrence of this gesture induced Rip, involuntarily, to do the same, when to his astonishment he found his beard had grown a foot long. He had now entered the skirts of the village. A troop of strange children ran at his heels, hooting after him and pointing at his gray beard. The dogs, too, not one of which he recognized for an old acquaintance, barked at him as he passed. The very village was altered. It was larger and more populous. There were rows of houses which he had never seen before, and those which had been his familiar haunts had disappeared. Strange names were over the doors. Strange faces at the windows. Everything was strange. His mind now misgave him. He began to doubt whether both he and the world around him were not bewitched. Surely this was his native village, which he had left but the day before. There stood the Catskill Mountains. There ran the Silver Hudson at a distance. There was every hill and dale, precisely as it has always been. Rip was sorely perplexed. That flagon last night, thought he, has addled my poor head sadly. It was with some difficulty that he found his way to his own house, which he approached with silent awe, expecting every moment to hear the shrill voice of Dame Van Winkle. He found the house gone to decay, the roof fallen in, the windows shattered, and the doors off the hinges. A half-starved dog that looked like Roof was skulking about it. Rip called him by name, but the girl snarled, showed his teeth, and passed on. This was an unkind cut indeed. "'My very dog,' sighed poor Rip, "'has forgotten me.' He entered the house, which, to tell the truth, Dame Van Winkle had always kept in neat order. It was empty, forlorn, and apparently abandoned. This desolateness overcame all his connubial fears. He called loudly for his wife and children. The lonely chambers rang for a moment with his voice, and then all again was silence. He now hurried forth and hastened to his old resort, the village inn, but it too was gone. A large rickety wooden building stood in its place, with great gaping windows, some of them broken and mended with old hats and petticoats, and over the door was painted, The Union Hotel, by Jonathan Doolittle. Instead of the great tree that used to shelter the quiet little Dutch inn of yore, there now was reared a tall, naked pole, with something on the top that looked like a red nightcap, and from it was fluttering a flag, on which was a singular assemblage of stars and stripes. All this was strange and incomprehensible. He recognized on the sign, however, the ruby face of King George, under which he had smoked so many a peaceful pipe. But even this was singularly metamorphosed. The red coat was changed for one of blue and buff. A sword was held in the hand instead of a scepter. The head was decorated with a cocked hat, and underneath was painted in large characters, General George Washington. There was, as usual, a crowd of folk about the door, but none that Rip recollected. The very character of the people seemed changed. There was a busy, buzzling, disputatious tone about it, instead of the accustomed phlegm and drowsy tranquillity. He looked in vain for the sage Nicholas Vetter with his broad face, double chin, and fair long pipe, uttering clouds of tobacco smoke instead of idle speeches, or Van Bummel, the schoolmaster, doling forth the contents of an ancient newspaper, in place, in place of these a lean, bilious-looking fellow with his pockets full of handbills, was haranguing vehemently about rights of citizens, elections, members of Congress, liberty, Bunker's Hill, heroes of seventy-six and other words which were a perfect Babylonish jargon to the bewildered Van Winkle. The appearance of Rip, with his wrong, grizzled beard, his rusty fowling piece, his uncouth dress, and an army of women and children at his heels, soon attracted the attention of the tavern politicians. They crowded round him, eyeing him from head to foot with great curiosity. The orator bustled up to him, and drawing him partly aside, inquired, On which side he voted? Rip stared in vacant stupidity. Another short but busy little fellow pulled him by the arm, and rising on tiptoe, inquired in his ear, 
whether he was federal or democrat. Rip was equally at a loss to comprehend the question, when a knowing, self-important old gentleman, in a sharp cocked hat, made his way through the crowd, putting them to the right and left with his elbows as he passed, and planting himself before Van Winkle with one arm akimbo, the other resting on his cane, his keen eyes and sharp hat penetrating, as it were, into his very soul, demanded, in an austere tone, what brought him to the election with a gun on his shoulder and a mob at his heels, and whether he meant to breed a riot in the village? Alas, gentlemen, cried Rip, somewhat dismayed, I am a poor, quiet man, a native of the place, and a loyal subject of the king. God bless him! Here a general shout burst from the bystanders. A Tory! A Tory! A spy! A refugee! Hustle him! Away with him! It was with great difficulty that the self-important man in the cocked hat restored order, and having assumed a tenfold austerity of brow, demanded again of the unknown culprit what he came there for and whom he was seeking. The poor man humbly assured him that he meant no harm, but merely came there in search of some of his neighbors who used to keep about the tavern. Well, who are they? Name them. Rip bethought himself a moment and inquired, Where's Nicholas Vetter? There was a silence for a little while, when an old man replied in a thin, piping voice, "'Nicholas Vetter? Why, he's dead and gone these eighteen years. There was a wooden tombstone in the churchyard that used to tell all about him, but that's rotten and gone, too. "'Where's Brom Dutcher? "'Oh, he went off to the army in the beginning of the war. Some say he was killed at the storming of Stony Point. Others say he was drowned in a squall at the foot of Anthony's nose. I don't know. He never came back again.' "'Where's Van Bummel, the schoolmaster?' "'He went off to the wars, too, was a great militia general, and is now in Congress.' Rip's heart died away at hearing of these sad changes in his home and friends, and finding himself thus alone in the world. Every answer puzzled him, too, by treating of such enormous lapses of time, and of matters which he could not understand. War? Congress? Stony Point? He had no courage to ask after any more friends, but cried out in despair, "'Does anybody here know Rip Van Winkle?' "'Oh, Rip Van Winkle,' exclaimed two or three. "'Oh, to be sure, that's Rip Van Winkle yonder, leaning against the tree.' Rip looked, and beheld a precise counterpart of himself as he went up the mountain, apparently as lazy and certainly as ragged. The poor fellow was now completely confounded. He doubted his own identity, and whether he was himself or another man. In the midst of his bewilderment, the man in the cocked hat demanded who he was, and what was his name. "'God knows!' exclaimed he, at his wit's end. "'I'm not myself. I'm somebody else. That's me yonder. No, that's somebody else come into my shoes. I was myself last night, but I fell asleep on the mountain, and they've changed my gun, and everything's changed, and I'm changed, and I can't tell what's my name or who I am.' The bystanders began now to look at each other, nod, wink significantly, and tap their fingers against their foreheads. There was a whisper also about securing the gun and keeping the old fellow from doing mischief, at the very suggestion of which the self-important man in the cocked hat retired with some precipitation. At this critical moment a fresh, comely woman pressed through the throng to get a peep at the grey-bearded man. She had a chubby child in her arms, which, frightened at his looks, began to cry. "'Hush, Rip,' cried she. "'Hush, you little fool. The old man won't hurt you.' The name of the child, the air of the mother, the tone of her voice all awakened a train of recollections in his mind. "'What is your name, my good woman?' asked he. "'Judith Gardenier. "'And your father's name?' "'Ah, poor man. Rip Van Winkle was his name, but it's twenty years since he went away from home with his gun, and never has been heard of since. His dog came home without him, but whether he shot himself or was carried away by the Indians, nobody can tell. I was then but a little girl.' Rip had but one question more to ask, but he put it with a faltering voice. "'Where's your mother?' Oh, she too had died, but a short time since. She broke a blood vessel in a fit of passion at a New England peddler. There was a drop of comfort, at least in this intelligence. The honest man could contain himself no longer. He caught his daughter and her child in his arms. "'I am your father,' cried he. "'Young Rip Van Winkle once.' old Rip Van Winkle now. Does nobody know poor Rip Van Winkle? All stood amazed, until an old woman, tottering out from among the crowd, put her hand to her brow, and peering under it in his face for a moment, exclaimed, Sure enough, it is Rip Van Winkle. It is himself. 
Welcome home again, old neighbor. Why, where have you been these twenty long years? Rip's story was soon told, for the whole twenty years had been to him but as one night. The neighbors stared when they heard it. Some were seen to wink at each other and put their tongues in their cheeks, and the self-important man in the cocked hat, who when the alarm was over had returned to the field, screwed down the corners of his mouth and shook his head, upon which there was a general shaking of the head throughout the assemblage. It was determined, however, to take the opinion of old Peter Vanderdonk, who was seen slowly advancing up the road. He was a descendant of a historian of that name, who wrote one of the earliest accounts of the province. Peter was the most ancient inhabitant of the village, and well versed in all the wonderful events and traditions of the neighborhood. He recollected Rip at once, and corroborated his story in the most satisfactory manner. He assured the company that was a fact, handed down from his ancestor the historian, that the Catskill Mountains had always been haunted by strange beings that it was affirmed that the great Hendrick Hudson, the first discoverer of the river and country, kept a kind of vigil there every twenty years with his crew of the half-moon, being permitted in this way to revisit the scenes of his enterprise and keep a guardian eye upon the river, and the great city called by his name, that his father had once seen them in their old Dutch dresses playing at nine pins in a hollow of the mountain, and that he himself had heard one summer afternoon the sound of their balls like distant peals of thunder. To make a long story short, the company broke up and returned to the more important concerns of the election. Rip's daughter took him home to live with her. She had a snug, well-furnished house, and a stout, cheery farmer for a husband, whom Rip recollected for one of the urchins that used to climb upon his back. As to Rip's son and heir, who was the ditto of himself seen leaning against the tree, he was employed to work on the farm, but evinced an hereditary disposition to attend to anything but his business. Rip now resumed his old walks and habits. He soon found many of his former cronies, though all rather the worse for wear and tear of time, and preferred making friends among the rising generation, with whom he soon grew into great favor. Having nothing to do at home, and being arrived at that happy age, when a man can be idle with impunity, he took his place once more on the bench at the inn door, and was reverenced as one of the patriarchs of the village, and a chronicle of the old times, before the war. It was some time before he could get into the regular track of gossip, or could be made to comprehend the strange events that had taken place during his torpor, how that there had been a revolutionary war, that the country had thrown off the yoke of old England, and that instead of being a subject of His Majesty George the Third, he was now a free citizen of the United States. Rip, in fact, was no politician. The changes of states and empires made but little impression on him. But there was one species of despotism under which he had long groaned, and that was petticoat government. Happily, that was at an end. He had got his neck out of the yoke of matrimony, and could go in and out whenever he pleased, without dreading the tyranny of Dame Van Winkle. Whenever her name was mentioned, however, he shook his head, shrugged his shoulders, and cast up his eyes, which might pass either for an expression of resignation to his fate, or joy at his deliverance. He used to tell his story to every stranger that arrived at Mr. Doolittle's hotel, he was observed at first to vary on some points every time he told it, which was doubtless owing to his having so recently awaked. It at last settled down to precisely the tale I have related, and not a man, woman, or child in the neighborhood but knew it by heart. Some always pretended to doubt the reality of it, and insisted that Rip had been out of his head, and that this was one point on which he always remained flighty. The old Dutch inhabitants, however, almost universally gave it full credit. Even to this day, may they never hear a thunderstorm on a summer afternoon about the Catskill, but they say Hendrick Hudson and his crew are at their game of ninepins, and it is a common wish of all hempecked husbands in the neighborhood, when life hangs heavy on their hands, that they might have a quieting draft out of Rip Van Winkle's flagon. Note. The foregoing tale, one would but suspect, had been suggested to Mr. Not Knickerbocker by a little German superstition about the Emperor Frederick de Rothbart and the Kaifhauser Mountain. The subjoined note, however, which he had appended to the tale, shows that it is an absolute fact narrated with his usual fidelity. The story of Rip Van Winkle may seem incredible to many, but nevertheless I give it my full belief, for I know the vicinity of our old Dutch settlements to have been very subject to marvelous events and appearances. Indeed, I have heard many stranger stories than this in the villages along the Hudson, all of which were too well authenticated to admit of a doubt. I have even talked with Rip Van Winkle myself, 
who, when last I saw him, was a venerable old man, and so perfectly rational and consistent on every other point, that I think no conscientious person could refuse to take this into the bargain. Nigh, I have seen a certificate on the subject taken before a country justice and signed with a cross in the justice's own handwriting. The story, therefore, is beyond the possibility of a doubt. End of recording. Rip Van Winkle. Uh, read by Alex Lella. Nerves by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lewis Richardson. Nerves by Anton Chekhov. Dmitri Osipovich Vaksin, the architect, returned from town to his holiday cottage greatly impressed by the spiritualistic seance at which he had been present. As he undressed and got into his solitary bed, Madame Vaxin had gone to an all-night service. He could not help remembering all he had seen and heard. It had not, properly speaking, been a séance at all, but the whole evening had been spent in terrifying conversation. A young lady had begun it by talking, apropos of nothing, about thought-reading. From thought-reading they had passed imperceptibly to spirits, and from spirits to ghosts, from ghosts to people buried alive. A gentleman had read a horrible story of a corpse turning round in the coffin. Vaxin himself had asked for a saucer and shown the young ladies how to converse with spirits. He had called up, among others, the spirit of his deceased uncle, Klavdi Mironich, and had mentally asked him, Has not the time come for me to transfer the ownership of our house to my wife? To which his uncle's spirit had replied, All things are good in their season. There is a great deal in nature that is mysterious and terrible, thought Vaxin as he got into bed. It's not the dead, but the unknown that's so horrible. It struck one o'clock. Vaxin turned over on the other side and peeped out from beneath the bedclothes at the blue light of the lamp burning before the holy icon. The flame flickered and cast a faint light on the icon stand and the big portrait of Uncle Clafty that hung facing his bed. And what if the ghost of Uncle Clavdy should appear this minute? Flashed through Vaxin's mind. But of course that's impossible. Ghosts are, we all know, a superstition, the offspring of undeveloped intelligence. But Vaxin, nevertheless, pulled the bedclothes over his head and shut his eyes very tight. The corpse that turned round in its coffin came back to his mind, and the figures of his deceased mother-in-law, of a colleague who had hanged himself, and of a girl who had drowned herself rose before his imagination. Vaxin began trying to dispel these gloomy ideas, but the more he tried to drive them away, the more haunting the figures and the fearful fancies became. He began to feel frightened. Hang it all, he thought. Here I am, afraid of the dark like a child, idiotic. Tick, tick, tick. He heard the clock in the next room. The church bell chimed the hour in the graveyard close by. The bell tolled slowly, depressingly, mournfully. A cold chill ran down Vaxin's neck and spine. He fancied he heard someone breathing heavily over his head, as though Uncle Clafty had stepped out of his frame and was bending over his nephew. Vaxin felt unbearably frightened. He clenched his teeth and held his breath in terror. At last, when a cockchafer flew in at the open window and began buzzing over his head, he could bear it no longer and gave a violent tug at the bell-rope. Dmitri Osipich, was fallen Sie? He heard the voice of the German governess at his door a moment later. Ah, it's you, Rosalia Kolovna, Vaxin cried, delighted. Why do you trouble? Gavrila might just... Yourself, Gavrila, to the town sent. And Glyphira is all the evening gone. There's nobody in the house. Was wollen Sie doch? Well, what I wanted, it's... But please, come in. You needn't mind, it, it's dark. Rosalia Kolovna, a stout, red-cheeked person, came into the bedroom and stood in an expectant attitude at the door. Sit down, please. 
You see, it's like this. What on earth am I to ask her for? He wondered, stealing a glance at Uncle Clavdy's portrait and feeling his soul gradually returning to tranquility. What I really want to ask you was... Oh, when the man goes to town, don't forget to tell him to... Uh, uh, to get some cigarette papers. But do, please, sit down. Cigarette papers. Good. Was wollen Sie noch? Ich will. Uh, there's, there's nothing I will, but do sit down. I shall think of something else in a minute. It is shocking for a maiden in a man's room to remain. Mr. Vaxen, you are, I see, a naughty man. I understand. To order cigarette papers when does not a person wake? I understand you. Rosalia Kolovna turned and went out of the room. Somewhat reassured by his conversation with her and ashamed of his cowardice, Vaxen pulled the bedclothes over his head and shut his eyes. For about ten minutes he felt fairly comfortable. Then the same nonsense came creeping back into his mind. He swore to himself, felt for the matches, and without opening his eyes lighted a candle. But even the light was no use. To Vaxen's excited imagination it seemed as though someone were peeping round the corner and that his uncle's eyes were moving. I'll ring her up again. Damn the woman, he decided. I'll tell her I'm unwell and ask for some drops. Vaxen rang. There was no response. He rang again. As though answering his ring, he heard the church bell toll the hour. Overcome with terror, cold all over, he jumped out of bed, ran headlong out of his bedroom, and making the sign of the cross and cursing himself for his cowardice, he fled barefoot in his nightshirt to the governess's room. Rosalia Kolovna, he began in a shaking voice as he knocked at her door. Rosalia Kolovna, are you asleep? I feel so, uh, uh, unwell. Drops. There was no answer. Silence reigned. I beg you, do you understand? I beg you. Why this squeamishness I can't understand, especially when a man is ill. How absurdly zealic, manialic, you are really, at your age. I to your wife shall tell, will not leave an honest maiden in peace. When I was at Baron Anzix, and the Baron tried to come to me for matches, I understand at once what his matches mean, and tell to the Baroness, I am an honest maiden. Hang your honesty, I am ill, I tell you, and asking you for drops. Do you understand? I am ill. Your wife is an honest good woman, and you ought her to love. Yeah, she is noble. I will not be her foe. You are a fool, simply a fool. Do you understand? A fool. Vaxen leaned against the doorpost, folded his arms, and waited for his panic to pass off. To return to his room, where the lamp flickered and his uncle stirred at him from his frame, was more than he could face, and to stand at the governess's door in nothing but his nightshirt was inconvenient from every point of view. What could he do? It struck two o'clock, and his terror had not left him. There was no light in the passage, and something dark seemed to be peeping out from every corner. Vaxen turned so as to face the doorpost, but at that instant it seemed as though somebody tweaked his nightshirt from behind and touched him on the shoulder. Damnation! Rosalia Karlovna! No answer. Vaxen hesitantly opened the door and peeped into the room. The virtuous German was sweetly slumbering. The tiny flame of a nightlight threw her solid buxom person into relief. Vaxen stepped into the room and sat down on a wickerwork trunk near the door. He felt better in the presence of a living creature, even though that creature was asleep. Let the German idiot sleep, he thought. I'll sit here, and when it gets light I'll go back. It's daylight early now. Vaxen curled up on the trunk and put his arm under his head to await the coming of dawn. What a thing it is to have nerves, he reflected. An educated, intelligent man, hang it all, it's a perfect disgrace. As he listened to the gentle, even breathing of Rosalia Kolovna, he soon recovered himself completely. At six o'clock, Vaxin's wife returned from the all-night service, and, not finding her husband in their bedroom, went to the governess to ask her for some change for the cabman. On entering the German's room, a strange sight met her eyes. On the bed lay stretched Rosalia Kolovna, fast asleep, and a couple of yards from her was her husband, curled up on the trunk, sleeping the sleep of the just and snoring loudly. 
what she said to her husband, and how he looked when he awoke, I leave to others to describe. It is beyond my powers. End of Nerves by Anton Chekhov Recording by David Lewis Richardson Doom of the House of Durye by Earl Pierce, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson Doom of the House of Durye Arthur Durye, a young, handsome man, came to meet his father for the first time in twenty years. As he strode into the hotel lobby, long strides which had the spring of elastic in them, idle eyes lifted to appraise him, for he was an impressive figure, somehow grim with exultation. The desk clerk looked up with his habitual smile of expectation. "'How do you do, Mr. So-and-so?' and his finger strayed to the green fountain pen which stood in a holder on the desk. Arthur Durye cleared his throat, but still his voice was clogged and unsteady. To the clerk he said, "'I'm looking for my father, Dr. Henry Durye. I understand he is registered here. He has recently arrived from Paris.' The clerk lowered his glance to a list of names. "'Dr. Durye is in Suite 600, sixth floor.' He looked up, his eyebrows arched questioningly. "'Are you staying too, sir, Mr. Durier?' Arthur took the pen and scribbled his name rapidly. Without a further word, neglecting even to get his key and own room number, he turned and walked to the elevators. Not until he reached his father's suite on the sixth floor did he make an audible noise, and this was a mere sigh which fell from his lips like a prayer. The man who opened the door was unusually tall his slender frame clothed in tight-fitting black. He hardly dared to smile. His clean-shaven face was pale, an almost livid whiteness against the sparkle in his eyes. His jaw had a bluish luster. Arthur! The word was scarcely a whisper. It seemed choked up quietly, as if it had been repeated time and again on his thin lips. Arthur Durye felt the kindliness of those eyes go through him and then he was in his father's embrace. Later, when these two grown men had regained their outer calm, they closed the door and went into the drawing-room. The elder Durier held out a humidor of fine cigars, and his hand shook so hard when he held the match that his son was forced to cup his own hands about the flame. They both had tears in their eyes, but their eyes were smiling. Henry Durier placed a hand on his son's shoulder. This is the happiest day of my life," he said. You can never know how much I have longed for this moment. Arthur, looking into that glance, realized with growing pride that he had loved his father all his life, despite any of those things which had been cursed against him. He sat down on the edge of a chair. I... I don't know how to act, he confessed. You surprise me, Dad. You're so different from what I had expected." A cloud came over Dr. Durier's features. "'What did you expect, Arthur?' he demanded quickly. "'An evil eye? A shaven head and knotted jowls?' "'Please, Dad, no!' Arthur's words clipped short. "'I don't think I ever really visualized you. I knew you would be a splendid man. But I thought you'd look older, like a man who has really suffered. I have suffered more than I can ever describe. But seeing you again, and the prospect of spending the rest of my life with you, has more than compensated for my sorrows. Even during the twenty years we were apart, I found an ironic joy in learning of your progress in college, and in your American game of football. Then you've been following my work? Yes, Arthur. I've received monthly reports ever since you left me. From my study in Paris I have been really close to you, working out your problems as if they were my own. And now that the twenty years are completed, the ban which kept us apart is lifted forever. From now on, son, we shall be the closest of companions, unless your Aunt Cecilia has succeeded in her terrible mission." 
The mention of that name caused an unfamiliar chill to come between the two men. It stood for something, in each of them, which gnawed their minds like a malignancy. But to the younger Durier, in his intense effort to forget the awful past, her name as well as her madness must be forgotten. They had no wish to carry on this subject of conversation, for it betrayed an internal weakness which he hated. With forced determination and a ludicrous lift of his eyebrows, he said, "'Cecilia is dead, and her silly superstition is dead also. From now on, Dad, we're going to enjoy life as we should. Bygones are really bygones in this case.' Dr. Duryea closed his eyes slowly, as though an exquisite pain had gone through him. "'Then you have no indignation?' he questioned. You have none of your aunt's hatred?" "'Indignation? Hatred?' Arthur laughed aloud. "'Ever since I was twelve years old I have disbelieved Cecilia's stories. I have known that those horrible things were impossible, that they belonged to the ancient category of mythology and tradition. How then can I be indignant, and how can I hate you? How can I do anything but recognize Cecilia for what she was? a mean, frustrated woman, cursed with an insane grudge against you and your family. I tell you, Dad, that nothing she has ever said can possibly come between us again." Henry Durier nodded his head. His lips were tight together, and the muscles in his throat held back a cry. In that same soft tone of defense he spoke further doubting words. "'Are you so sure of your subconscious mind, Arthur?' Can you be so certain that you are free from all suspicion, however vague? Is there not a lingering premonition, a premonition which warns of peril?" "'No, Dad, no!' Arthur shot to his feet. "'I don't believe it! I've never believed it! I know, as any sane man would know, that you are neither a vampire nor a murderer. You know it, too, and Cecilia knew it, only she was mad. That family rot is dispelled, father. This is a civilized century. Belief in vampirism is sheer lunacy. Why, why, it's too absurd even to think about." "'You have the enthusiasm of youth,' said his father in a rather tired voice. "'But have you not heard the legend?' Arthur stepped back instinctively. He moistened his lips, for their dryness might crack them. The legend? He said the word in a curious hush of awed softness, as he had heard his Aunt Cecilia say it many times before. That awful legend that you. that I eat my children? Oh, God, father! Arthur went to his knees as a cry burst through his lips. Dad, that's. that's ghastly! We must forget Cecilia's ravings! "'You are affected, then?' asked Dr. Duryea bitterly. "'Affected? Certainly I'm affected, but only as I should be at such an accusation. Cecilia was mad, I tell you. Those books she showed me years ago, and those folk-tales of vampires and ghouls, they burned into my infantile mind like acid. They haunted me day and night in my youth, and caused me to hate you worse than death itself. But in heaven's name, father, I have outgrown those things as I have outgrown my clothes. I am a man now. Do you understand that? A man with a man's sense of logic." "'Yes, I understand.' Henry Durier threw his cigar into the fireplace and placed a hand on his son's shoulder. "'We shall forget Cecilia,' he said. As I told you in my letter, I have rented a lodge in Maine where we can go to be alone for the rest of the summer. We'll get in some fishing and hiking and perhaps some hunting. But first, Arthur, I must be sure in my own mind that you are sure in yours. I must be sure you won't bar your door against me at night and sleep with a loaded revolver at your elbow. I must be sure that you're not afraid of going up there alone with me and dying." His voice ended abruptly, as if an age-long dread had taken hold of it. His son's face was waxen with sweat standing out like pearls on his brow. 
He said nothing, but his eyes were filled with questions which his lips could not put into words. His own hand touched his father's and tightened over it. Henry Durier drew his hand away. "'I'm sorry,' he said, and his eyes looked straight over Arthur's lowered head. "'This thing must be thrashed out now. I believe you when you say that you discredit Cecilia's stories. But for a sake greater than sanity, I must tell you the truth behind the legend. And believe me, Arthur, there is a truth." He climbed to his feet and walked to the window which looked out over the street below. For a moment he gazed into space, silent. Then he turned and looked down at his son. "'You have heard only your aunt's version of the legend, Arthur. Doubtless it was warped into a thing far more hideous than it actually was, if that is possible. Doubtless she spoke to you of the inquisitorial stake in Carcassonne, where one of my ancestors perished. Also she may have mentioned that book, Vampires, which a former Durier is supposed to have written. Then certainly she told you about your two younger brothers, my own poor motherless children, who were sucked bloodless in their cradles. Arthur Durier passed a hand over his aching eyes. Those words, so often repeated by that witch of an aunt, stirred up the same visions which had made his childhood night sleepless with terror. He could hardly bear to hear them again, and from the very man to whom they were accredited. "'Listen, Arthur,' the elder Durier went on quickly, his voice low with the pain it gave him. You must know that true basis to your aunt's hatred. You must know of that curse, that curse of vampirism, which is supposed to have followed the Duriers through five centuries of French history, but which we can dispel as pure superstition, so often connected with ancient families. But I must tell you that this part of the legend is true. Your two younger brothers actually died in their cradles, bloodless and I stood trial in France for their murder, and my name was smirched throughout all of Europe with such an inhuman damnation that it drove your aunt and you to America, and has left me childless, hated, and ostracized from society the world over. I must tell you that on that terrible night in Durier Castle I had been working late on historic volumes of Crespit and Prynne, and on that loathsome tome Vampires. I must tell you of the soreness that was in my throat, and of the heaviness of the blood which coursed through my veins, and of that presence which was neither man nor animal, but which I knew was some place near me, yet neither within the castle nor outside of it, and which was closer to me than my heart, and the more terrible to me than the touch of the grave. I was at the desk in my library, my head swimming in a delirium which left me senseless until dawn. There were nightmares that frightened me, frightened me, Arthur, a grown man who had dissected countless cadavers in morgues and medical schools. I know that my tongue was swollen in my mouth and that brine moistened my lips, and that a rottenness pervaded my body like a fever. I can make no recollection of sanity or of consciousness. That night remains vivid, unforgettable, yet somehow completely in shadows. When I had fallen asleep, if in God's name it was sleep, I was slumped across my desk, and when I awoke in the morning I was lying face down on my couch. So you see, Arthur, I had moved during that night, and I had never known it. What I'd done and where I'd gone during those dark hours will always remain an impenetrable mystery. But I do know this. On the morrow I was torn from my sleep by the shrieks of maids and butlers, and by that mad wailing of your aunt. I stumbled through the open door of my study, and in the nursery I saw those two babies there, lifeless, white, and dry like mummies, and with twin holes in their necks that were caked black with their own blood. Oh, I don't blame you for your incredulousness, Arthur. I cannot believe it yet myself, nor shall I ever believe it. The belief of it would drive me to suicide, and still the doubting of it drives me mad with horror. 
All of France was doubtful, and even the savants who defended my name at the trial found that they could not explain it nor disbelieve it. The case was quieted by the Republic, for it might have shaken science to its very foundation and split the pedestals of religion and logic. I was released from the charge of murder, but the actual murder was hung about me like a stench. The coroners who examined those tiny cadavers found them both dry of all their blood, but could find no blood on the floor of the nursery nor in the cradles. Something from hell stalked the halls of Durier that night, and I should blow my brains out if I dared to think deeply of who that was. You too, my son, would have been dead and bloodless if you hadn't been sleeping in a separate room with your door barred on the inside. You were a timid child, Arthur. You were only seven years old, but you were filled with the folklore of those mad Lombards and the decadent poetry of your aunt. On that same night, while I was some place between heaven and hell, you also heard the padded footsteps on the stone corridor, and heard the tugging at your door-handle, for in the morning you complained of a chill and of terrible nightmares which frighten you in your sleep. I only thank God that your door was barred." Henry Durier's voice choked into a sob which brought the stinging tears back into his eyes. He paused to wipe his face and to dig his fingers into his palm. "'You understand, Arthur, that for twenty years, under my sworn oath at the Palace of Justice, I could neither see you nor write to you. Twenty years, my son while all of that time you had grown to hate me and to spit at my name. Not until your aunt's death have you called yourself a Durier, and now you come to me at my bidding and say you love me as a son should love his father. Perhaps it is God's forgiveness for everything. Now at last we shall be together, and that terrible, unexplainable past will be buried forever." He put his handkerchief back into his pocket and walked slowly to his son. He dropped to one knee, and his hands gripped Arthur's arms. "'My son, I can say no more to you. I have told you the truth as I alone know it. I may be, by all accounts, some ghoulish creation of Satan on earth. I may be a child-killer, a vampire, some morbidly diseased specimen of Rikolakis things which science cannot explain. Perhaps the dreaded legend of the Duriers is true. Autiel Durier was convicted of murdering his brother in that same monstrous fashion in the year 1576, and he died in flames at the stake. François Durier, in 1802, blew his head apart with a blunderbuss on the morning after his youngest son was found dead, apparently from anemia and there are others of whom I cannot bear to speak that would chill your soul if you were to hear them. So, you see, Arthur, there is a hellish tradition behind our family. There is a heritage which no sane god would ever have allowed. The future of the Duriers lies in you, for you are the last of the race. I pray with all of my heart that Providence will permit you to live your full share of years, and to leave other Duriers behind you. And so, if ever again I feel that presence as I did in Durier Castle, I am going to die as Francois Durier died over a hundred years ago." He stood up, and his son stood up at his side. "'If you are willing to forget, Arthur, we shall go up to that lodge in Maine. There is a life we've never known awaiting us. We must find that life and we must find the happiness which a curious fate snatched from us on those Lombard sourlands twenty years ago. 2. Henry Durier's tall stature, coupled with a slenderness of frame and a sleekness of muscle, gave him an appearance that was unusually gaunt. His son couldn't help but think of that word as he sat on the rustic porch of the lodge, watching his father sunning himself at the lake's edge. Henry Durier had a kindliness in his face, at times an almost sublime kindliness which great prophets often possess. 
but when his face was partly in shadows, particularly about his brow, there was a frightening tone which came into his features. For it was a tone of farness, of mysticism and conjuration. Somehow, in the late evenings, he assumed the unapproachable mantle of a dreamer and sat silently before the fire, his mind ever off in unknown places. In that little lodge there was no electricity, and the glow of the oil-lamps played curious tricks with the human expression which frequently resulted in something unhuman. It may have been the dusk of night, the flickering of the lamps, but Arthur Durier had certainly noticed how his father's eyes had sunken further into his head, and how his cheeks were tighter and the outline of his teeth pressed into the skin about his lips. It was nearing sundown on the second day of their stay at Timber Lake. Six miles away the dirt road wound down toward Houtland, near the Canadian border. So it was lonely there, on a solitary little lake hemmed in closely with dark evergreens and a sky which drooped low over dusty summited mountains. Within the lodge was a homey fireplace and a glossy elk's head which peered out over the mantel. There were guns and fishing tackle on the walls, shelves of reliable American fiction, Mark Twain, Melville, Stockton, and a well-worn edition of Bret Hart. A fully supplied kitchen and a wood stove furnished them with hearty meals which were welcome after a whole day's tramp in the woods. On that evening Henry Durier prepared a select French stew out of every available vegetable and a can of soup. They ate well, then stretched out before the fire for a smoke. They were outlining a trip to the Orient together when the back door blew open with a terrific bang, and a wind swept into the lodge with a coldness which chilled them both. "'A storm,' Henry Durier said, rising to his feet. "'Sometimes they have them up here, and they're pretty bad. The roof might leak over your bedroom. Perhaps you'd like to sleep down here with me.' His fingers strayed playfully over his son's head as he went out into the kitchen to bar the swinging door. Arthur's room was upstairs, next to a spare room filled with extra furniture. He'd chosen it because he liked the altitude, and because the only other bedroom was occupied. He went upstairs swiftly and silently. His roof didn't leak. It was absurd even to think it might. It had been his father again, suggesting that they sleep together. He had done it before, in a jesting, whispering way, as if to challenge them both if they dared to sleep together. Arthur came back downstairs dressed in his bathrobe and slippers. He stood on the fifth stair, rubbing a two days' growth of beard. "'I think I'll shave tonight,' he said to his father. "'May I use your razor?' Henry Durier, draped in a black raincoat and with his face haloed in the brim of a rain hat, looked up from the hall. A frown glided obscurely from his features. "'Not at all, son. Sleeping upstairs?' Arthur nodded and quickly said, "'Are you going out?' "'Yes. I'm going to tie the boats up tighter. I'm afraid the lake will rough it up a bit.' Durier jerked back the door and stepped outside. The door slammed shut and his footsteps sounded on the wood flooring of the porch. Arthur came slowly down the remaining steps. He saw his father's figure pass across the dark rectangle of a window, saw the flash of lightning that suddenly printed his grim silhouette against the glass. He sighed deeply, a sigh which burned in his throat. For his throat was sore and aching. Then he went into the bedroom, found the razor lying in plain view on a birch tabletop. As he reached for it, his glance fell upon his father's open gladstone bag which rested at the foot of the bed. There was a book resting there, half hidden by a gray flannel shirt. It was a narrow, yellow-bound book, oddly out of place. Frowning, he bent down and lifted it from the bag. It was surprisingly heavy in his hands, and he noticed a faintly sickening odor of decay which drifted from it like a perfume. The title of the volume had been thumbed away into an indecipherable blur of gold letters. But pasted across the front cover was a white strip of paper on which was typewritten the word Infantophagi. 
He flipped back the cover and ran his eyes over the title page. The book was printed in French, and early French, yet to him wholly comprehensible. The publication date was 1580 in Cain. Breathlessly, he turned back a second page, saw a chapter headed Vampires. He slumped to one elbow across the bed. His eyes were four inches from those mildewed pages, his nostrils reeked with the stench of them. He skipped long paragraphs of pedantic jargon on theology. He scanned brief accounts of strange, blood-eating monsters, vrecolaques and leprechauns. He read Jean d'Arc, of Ludwig Prim, and muttered aloud the Latin snatches from Episcopi. He passed pages in quick succession, his fingers shaking with the fear of it and his eyes hanging heavily in their sockets. He saw a vague reference to Enoch and saw the terrible drawings by an ancient Dominican of Rome. Paragraph after paragraph he read, the horror-striking testimony of Niter's Aunt Hill, the testimony of people who died shrieking at the stake, the recitals of grave-tenders, of jurists, and hangmen. Then, unexpectedly, among all of this monumental vestige, there appeared before his eyes the name of Autiel Durier, and he stopped reading as though invisibly struck. Thunder clapped near the lodge and rattled the window panes. The deep rolling of bursting clouds echoed over the valley. But he heard none of it. His eyes were on those two short sentences which his father, someone, had underlined with dark red crayon. The execution, four years ago, of Autiel Durier does not end the Durier controversy. Time alone can decide whether the demon has claimed that family from its beginning to its end. Arthur read on about the trial of Autiel Durier before Veniti, the Carcassinian Inquisitor-General, read, with mounting horror, the evidence which had sent that far-gone Durier to the pillar, the evidence of a bloodless corpse who had been Autiel Durier's younger brother. Unmindful now of the tremendous storm which had centered over Timber Lake, unheeding the clatter of windows and the swish of pines on the roof, even of his father, who worked down at the lake's edge in a drenching rain, Arthur fastened his glance to the blurred print of those pages, sinking deeper and deeper into the garbled legends of a dark age. On the last page of the chapter, he again saw the name of his ancestor, Autiel Durier. He traced a shaking finger over the narrow lines of words, and when he finished reading them he rolled sideways on his bed and from his lips came a sobbing, mumbling prayer. God, oh God in heaven, protect me! For he had read, As in the case of Atiel Durier, we observe that this specimen of Rakolakus preys only upon the blood in its own family. It possesses none of the characteristics of the undead vampire, being usually a living male person of otherwise normal appearances unsuspecting its inherent demonism. But this Vrykolakas cannot act according to its demoniacal possession unless it is in the presence of a second member of the same family, who acts as a medium between the man and its demon. This medium has none of the traits of the vampire, but it senses the being of this creature, when the metamorphosis is about to occur, by reason of intense pains in the head and throat. Both the vampire and the medium undergo similar reactions, involving nausea, nocturnal visions, and physical disquietude. When these two outcasts are within a certain distance of each other, the coalescence of inherent demonism is completed, and the vampire is subject to its attacks, demanding blood for its sustenance. No member of the family is safe at these times, for the Vrykolakas, acting in its true agency on earth, will unerringly seek out the blood. In rare cases, where other victims are unavailable, the vampire will even take blood from the very medium which made it possible. This vampire is born into certain aged families, and naught but death can destroy it. It is not conscious of its blood madness and acts only in a psychic state. The medium also is unaware of its terrible role and when these two are together, 
despite any lapse of years, the fusion of inheritance is so violent that no power known on earth can turn it back. 3. The lodge door slammed shut with a sudden, interrupting bang. The lock grated, and Henry Durier's footsteps sounded on the planked floor. Arthur shook himself from the bed. He had only time to fling that haunting book into the Gladstone bag before he sensed his father standing in the doorway. "'You—you're not shaving, Arthur?' Durier's words, spliced hesitantly, were toneless. He glanced from the tabletop to the Gladstone and to his son. He said nothing for a moment, his glance inscrutable. Then— "'It's blowing up quite a storm outside.' Arthur swallowed, the first words which had come into his throat nodded quickly. "'Yes, isn't it? Quite a storm.' He met his father's gaze, his face burning. "'I—I I don't think I'll shave, Dad. My head aches." Durier came swiftly into the room and pinned Arthur's arms in his grasp. "'What do you mean? Your head aches! How? Does your throat? No!' Arthur jerked himself away. He laughed. "'It's that French stew of yours. It's hit me in the stomach.' He stepped past his father and started up the stairs. "'The stew?' Durier pivoted on his heel. Possibly. I think I feel it myself." Arthur stopped, his face suddenly white. "'You, too?' The words were hardly audible. Their glances met, clashed like dueling swords. For ten seconds neither of them said a word or moved a muscle. Arthur, from the stairs, looking down, his father below, gazing up at him. In Henry Durier the blood drained slowly from his face and left a purple etching across the bridge of his nose and above his eyes. He looked like a death's head. Arthur winced at the sight and twisted his eyes away. He turned to go up the remaining stairs. Son! He stopped again, his hand tightened on the banister. Yes, Dad? Durier put his foot on the first stair. I want you to lock your door tonight. The wind would keep it banging." Yes, breathed Arthur, and pushed up the stairs to his room. Dr. Durier's hollow footsteps sounded in steady, unhesitant beats across the floor of Timber Lake Lodge. Sometimes they stopped, and the crackling hiss of a sulphur match took their place, then perhaps a distended sigh, and again footsteps. Arthur crouched at the open door of his room. His head was cocked for those noises from below. In his hands was a double-barrel shotgun of violent gauge. Thud! 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 Then a pause, the clinking of a glass and the gurgling of liquid. The sigh, the tread of his feet over the floor. He's thirsty, Arthur thought. Thirsty! Outside, the storm had grown into fury. Lightning zigzagged between the mountains, filling the valley with weird phosphorescence. Thunder, like drums, rolled incessantly. Within the lodge, the heat of the fireplace piled the atmosphere thick with stagnation. All the doors and windows were locked shut. The oil lamps glowed weakly, a pale, anemic light. Henry Durier walked to the foot of the stairs and stood looking up. Arthur sensed his movements and ducked back into his room, the gun gripped in his shaking fingers. Then Henry Durier's footsteps sounded on the first stair. Arthur slumped to one knee. He buckled a fist against his teeth as a prayer tumbled through them. Durier climbed a second step, and another, and still one more. On the fourth stair he stopped. Arthur. His voice cut into the silence like the crack of a whip. "'Arthur, will you come down here?' "'Yes, Dad.' Bedraggled, his body hanging like cloth, young Durier took five steps to the landing. "'We can't be zanies!' cried Henry Durier. 
My soul is sick with dread. Tomorrow we're going back to New York. I'm going to get the first boat to open sea. Please, come down here." He turned about and descended the stairs to his room. Arthur choked back the words which had lumped in his mouth. Half-dazed, he followed. In the bedroom he saw his father stretched face up along the bed. He saw a pile of rope at his father's feet. "'Tie me to the bedposts, Arthur,' came the command. "'Tie both my hands and both my feet.' Arthur stood gaping. "'Do as I tell you!' "'Dad! What hor—' "'Don't be a fool! You read that book! You know what relation you are to me! I'd always hoped it was Cecilia, but now I know it's you! I should have known it on that night twenty years ago, when you complained of a headache and nightmares. Quickly! My head rocks with pain! Tie me!' Speechless. His own pain piercing him with agony, Arthur fell to that grisly task. Both hands he tied, and both feet, tied them so firmly to the iron posts that his father could not lift himself an inch off the bed. Then he blew out the lamps, and without a further glance at that Prometheus, he reascended the stairs to his room and slammed and locked his door behind him. He looked once at the breech of his gun and set it against a chair by his bed. He flung off his robe and slippers, and within five minutes he was senseless in slumber. 4. He slept late, and when he awakened his muscles were as stiff as boards, and the lingering visions of a nightmare clung before his eyes. He pushed his way out of bed, stood dazedly on the floor. A dull, numbing cruciation circulated through his head. He felt bloated, coarse and running with internal mucus. His mouth was dry, his gums sore and stinging. He tightened his hands as he lunged for the door. "'Dad!' he cried, and he heard his voice breaking in his throat. Sunlight filtered through the window at the top of the stairs. The air was hot and dry, and carried in it a mild odor of decay. Arthur suddenly drew back at that odor, drew back with a gasp of awful fear. For he recognized it, that stench, the heaviness of his blood, the rawness of his tongue and gums. Age long it seemed, yet rising like a spirit in his memory. All of these things he had known and felt before. He leaned against the banister, and half slid, half stumbled down the stairs. His father had died during the night. He lay like a waxen figure tied to his bed, his face done up in knots. Arthur stood dumbly at the foot of the bed for only a few seconds. Then he went back upstairs to his room. Almost immediately he emptied both barrels of the shotgun into his head. The tragedy at Timber Lake was discovered accidentally three days later. A party of fishermen, upon finding the two bodies, notified state authorities, and an investigation was directly under way. Arthur Duryea had undoubtedly met death at his own hands. The condition of his wounds and the manner with which he held the lethal weapon at once foreclosed the suspicion of any foul play. But the death of Dr. Henry Duryea confronted the police with an inexplicable mystery, for his trussed-up body, unscathed except for two jagged holes over the jugular vein, had been drained of all its blood. The autopsy protocol of Henry Duryea laid death to undetermined causes, and it was not until the yellow tabloids commenced an investigation into the Duryea family history that the incredible and fantastic explanations were offered to the public. Obviously, such talk was held in popular contempt. Yet, in view of the controversial war which followed, the authorities considered it expedient to consign both Duryea's to the crematory. The End of Doom of the House of Duryea by Earl Price, Jr.
Cold Ghost by Chester S. Geyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Cold Ghost. In the valley, with the sheltering hills now behind them, the bitterly cold wind drove at the sled with unchecked ferocity. Gusts of snow came with the wind, thick and dry, the separate particles of it stinging on contact. The dogs made slow progress through the deep drifts. Hager's smoldering irritation blazed into abrupt rage. From his position at the rear of the sled, he lashed out with the driver's whip that he held in one heavily mittened hand, shouting behind the wool scarf covering the lower half of his face. The dogs lunged in their traces, whining. A couple floundered in the powdery footing and were immediately snapped at by their companions behind them. The snow was falling swiftly and with a sinister steadiness. It seemed to hang like a vast white curtain over the valley, obscuring the hills and the fanged outline of the mountains beyond. The wind seized portions of the curtain and twisted it into fantastic shapes. The shapes of demons, Hager thought suddenly. For the scene through which he moved was a kind of hell, a white and frozen hell, with the howl of the wind like the despairing shrieks of tormented souls. Hager pictured himself as one of them, and Cahill, huddled in furs on the sled, another. He cursed behind the scarf as he thought of Cahill. This was Cahill's fault, their being out here in the storm. If it weren't for Cahill, he would be back at the cabin, snug and warm, logs blazing cheerfully in the fireplace. It was a rotten time for Cahill to have taken sick, Hager fumed. But it had happened. And it had left him with nothing else to do but pack their catch of furs, harness up the sled, and start out with Cahill for the doctor in Moose Gulch. He almost regretted having taken the furs. With Cahill an added burden on the sled, it was too large a load for the dogs to pull with the necessary speed and endurance. But he hadn't dared to leave the entire season's catch unguarded at the cabin. If some wanderer appeared in his and Cahill's absence, the furs would be an irresistible temptation. Fearing thus to leave the furs behind, and now endangered by their weight, Hager found the situation maddening and the storm was making matters worse. It was near the end of winter, but the climate had chosen this moment to be at its most uncooperative. Hager muttered blackly against the storm, wondering why he had allowed his trapper's dream of wealth to lure him to this far northern corner of Alaska. It was a cold, bleak and hostile country. Tiny settlements, like Moose Gulch, were few and far between. Of course, furs were at their best and most plentiful here. He and Cahill had proved that, for their catch was a large one. Hager's thoughts soared briefly above his bitter mood as he thought of the money the furs would bring, and of the things that the money would bring back in civilization. Added to what he had so far managed to save, his share would make almost enough to start a fox breeding ranch, or a mink ranch. Almost enough, but not quite. That meant he would have to spend another winter in this location, and Hager flinched at the thought. He hated loneliness and the bitter sub-zero cold. Most of all, he hated the cold. Only a fur breeding ranch, with large, warm living quarters, would have made it bearable. Hager didn't know when the idea came to him. It must have been lying dormant for a long time in a far, dark corner of his mind, only now surging to the fore. Subconsciously, 
he must have prepared himself for this moment of inspiration. He wasn't sure. He was aware only of an interval while he plodded behind the sled, drawn by the struggling and panting team, cursing the dogs, cursing Cahill, and the fierce cold that mischievously searched out the most tender portions of his face beneath the hood of his parka. There was that moment, and then... And then he found himself toying with the thought of murdering Cahill. With the other out of the way, the entire proceeds from the sale of furs would be his. There would be no necessity to split. He could start the fur ranch at once. He wouldn't have to spend another winter in this vicious cold. He— A dozen fascinating new possibilities opened up to Hager. It was as though he had been blind and was able to see only now. Breathtaking vistas blossomed before his awakened eyes. There was music in what he visioned, music and the voices of women, bright lights, color, movement and the warmth of gentler climes. The brightest part of the picture was that Cahill's death need not be outright murder. The man was sick. His life depended on getting him into the hands of the doctor in Moose Gulch as quickly as possible. If Hager were simply to delay in reaching the settlement, Cahill would die as surely as though from the thrust of a knife or the impact of a bullet. Exposure to the biting cold would finish him. And nobody would know. Hager could always claim that he had hurried as best he could under the difficult, hampering circumstances of the storm, but that Cahill had died on the way. As easy as that. If Marshal Art Maddox stuck his long nose into the matter, Cahill's unmarked body would be proof that there had been no foul play. Hager felt satisfied that his scheme was without loopholes. The idea had become a definite plan. And now his square lips hardened with determination behind the scarf. He looked at Cahill, dozing feverishly on the shed, with deep-set gray eyes that were bleak and implacable. Cahill would never reach Moose Gulch alive. With his grim purpose giving new drive to his actions, Hager glanced about him. It was difficult to see through the curtain of snow that hung between him and the landscape, but by squinting steadily through momentary rifts made by the frigid, lashing wind, he was able presently to discern that they were near the pass leading out of the valley. Beyond the pass, he knew, was a forest, dipping down to the banks of a frozen stream. The stream ran for several miles until it branched into a river, which in turn led directly into Moose Gulch. With these landmarks to guide him, a traveler through the snow-bound wilderness could reach the settlement easily and quickly. But Hager didn't intend to do that. He now had time to kill. He chuckled darkly over the accuracy of the phrase. Plodding toward the pass, he deliberately slowed his steps. He no longer used the whip or shouted at the dogs for greater speed. The animals were grateful for the respite. They slackened their pace, tongues lolling and bushy tails waving as they bobbed in their plowed path through the white drifts. Cahill dozed on. Once or twice, he moved restlessly amid the furs piled about him. It was as if though some deep, vague instinct warned him that something was wrong. Hager watched the other sharply for a time, then desisted to give his attention to maneuvering the sled through the pass. The forest appeared, the trees wraith-like under their thick, white mantles of snow. Hager didn't follow the dip in the land that led toward the frozen stream. He guided the dogs in the opposite direction and began watching Cahill again. He hoped that the man would not awake until less familiar territory surrounded them. 
Cahill didn't awake. He dozed and tossed, his lips moving occasionally in a soundless mutter. His gaunt, leathery face was pale under its growth of grizzled whiskers. The snow-covered land rose, became rocky and difficult. The dogs began laboring with increasing weariness in their efforts to keep pulling the heavy sled. Hager realized he couldn't go in this direction much longer. When a ravine suddenly presented itself, relatively free of snow, he decided to call a halt. Unfastening the dogs, he left the ravine and began searching through the snow for brushwood. It took time, but Hager was in no hurry. He gathered an armful and finally returned to the sled. Cahill was awake. He had propped himself feebly among the firs, his gaunt face blank and drab with sickness. His filmed blue eyes fastened on Hager. Water, he whispered. Water, Matt. Coming up, Hager said. Just you wait a minute, Ben, and you'll get all the water you want. Cahill fell back among the firs and Hager leisurely shaved kindling and stacked the wood and then set it ablaze. The ravine was shielded from the wind, and the wood ignited without difficulty. At last Hager went to the sled and removed the small pack he had fortunately thought to bring along. His experience with the wilderness had trained him never to overlook the smallest precautions. Hager took a handled pan from the pack. He filled it with the snow and then held the pan over the flames. When the snow melted, he filled a tin cup with the liquid and went over to Cahill. He had to steady the cup as the other drank. Finally Cahill nodded. His eyes seemed to clear. He glanced about him and a dim worry moved in his face. Matt, where are we? Somewhere near Boot Valley. You... you mean we're lost?" I sort of got mixed up in the storm. Nothing to worry about. Cahill shivered suddenly. We've got to reach town, Matt. Got to see the doctor. Hager nodded. How do you feel? It's getting worse. I can feel it getting worse. I'm cold now, Matt. Before... before I was... Cahill's voice trailed off. He had to make an effort before he was able to speak again. Got... got to see the doctor, Matt. Can't waste any time. I know, Hager said. But the team needs a little rest. They've had a lot of heavy hauling and there's still a distance to go. Cahill nodded miserably, shivering. He burrowed into the firs, still shivering, breathing rapidly through parted lips. Slowly the chill left him. His eyes clouded again. Then his lids fell and he dozed once more. Hager brewed tea and drank it slowly, squatting before the fire. Then he packed and lighted his pipe. He stared into the flames with narrowed eyes seeing his dreams pictured there. They were pleasant dreams. Hager remained in the ravine until the supply of wood was gone. Then he fastened the dogs back into their traces and resumed his position behind the sled. With shouts and cracks of the whip he guided the animals out of the ravine, following the downward slope of the land this time. The snow stopped falling after a while, but the wind and the cold increased. The cold hung on the air like an enormous, transparent weight. Somehow it seemed to give an impossible crystalline purity to the snow blanketing the trees and the land. In doing so, it emphasized and magnified its very presence. It made itself something almost alive and sentient, icily malignant, overbearing utterly cruel and without mercy. Hager cursed the cold with redoubled venom. 
Despite the thickness of his fur parka and the layers of clothing beneath, the cold seemed to soak into him like an all-penetrating liquid. He had to wave his arms and stamp his feet to fight back a creeping numbness. But the terrible chill could not subdue the flame of purpose burning in Hager's mind. That part of him remained keenly alert. The sled was moving in the direction of the stream, and he was careful to judge the distance carefully. He didn't want to approach too close. At just the right moment he turned the sled at angle back toward the way from which it had come. It was his plan to keep zigzagging, approaching the stream and then retreating, always at a tangent. A great deal of time would be consumed in this way with very little actual forward progress toward Moose Gulch. He repeated this maneuver again and again. Cahill roused a few times to inquire weakly about their progress. Always Hager gave the same answer. "'We're getting there, Ben. It won't be long now. Don't you worry.' After that Cahill was silent. It seemed evident to Hager that the man was sinking rapidly. But not as rapidly as Hager wished. He knew he couldn't bear the paralyzing cold much longer, and his hatred of it grew. The sled reached a group of slab-like rock outcroppings that offered shelter from the slashing wind. Hager stopped the sled behind their protection for a short rest. The additional delay suited his plans. While the dogs huddled together in the snow, Hager went around the sled to get the pack. He glanced at Cahill's face, and his muscles became tense. Cahill's eyes were open. Cahill was watching him with a terrible steadiness and a soul-searing clarity. Cahill knew. Hager realized that Cahill must have been awake for quite some time, watching the actions of the sled. The man had clearly discovered Hager's deception. Hager felt transfixed by the accusing brightness in the other's eyes. He sensed that his guilt was written vividly and unmistakably in his face. He fumbled for words that would form an excuse, an apology, some sort of plausible lie, anything that would remove the dreadful knowledge in Cahill's eyes but no words came. After a strained, bitter moment Cahill spoke. His voice was low, yet somehow curiously distinct. "'You're trying to kill me, Matt. I see it now. You aren't going straight toward Moose Gulch. You're tracking back and forth to waste time. You want me to die.' "'That isn't true.' Hager blurted. I... I got lost. The storm and the cold got me mixed up." Cahill went on as though he hadn't heard. It's the furs, isn't it, Matt? You want all the money for yourself. With me out of the way, you won't have any trouble. I got mixed up, I tell you, Hager insisted. Cahill said nothing further. With a burst of energy as sudden as it was amazing, he gripped the sides of the sled and began pushing himself erect. His strangely clear eyes were fixed on Hager. Mastering a brief surge of panic, Hager threw himself forward, forcing Cahill back into the sled. Cahill struggled a moment, but the reserve strength he had managed to summon quickly gave out. He fell back into the sled and lay limp and quiet, his eyes closed, breathing harshly and rapidly. Hager watched for several minutes, the cold creeping slyly into him with the inactivity. Then, assured that Cahill would make no further trouble, he obtained the pack. He fed the dogs this time, tossing them pieces of dried meat. They would need renewed strength and energy to take him the remaining distance to Moose Gulch. Finally, gathering brushwood, Hager built a small fire and brewed tea. 
He ate a couple of thick sandwiches as he drank the tea, chewing with methodic slowness and glancing at Cahill. The other hadn't stirred since making his accusation. But when Hager finished eating, Cahill's eyes opened once more. He looked at Hager for a long, breathless moment. Only a vestige of the unnatural brightness that had been in his eyes remained now. With what must have required a tremendous effort, he spoke. "'You aren't going to get away with this, Matt. I—I'm going to get you. I'm going to make you pay.' A moment longer Cahill looked at Hager and then the last remnant of brightness left his eyes. His lids fell slowly. He looked exhausted and seemed to be resting. But several minutes later, acting on a sudden realization, Hager felt for Cahill's pulse and found that the man was dead. Triumph spread through Hager like a heady warmth. It was over. The money from the furs would be his alone. He would have the fur ranch now. But there was no hurry about that. He would travel a little first and have some fun. The best part of it was that he would never have to worry. Cahill's body was completely unmarked. It was very obvious that he had died of illness. There couldn't possibly be any suspicions. Then Hager recalled the threat Cahill had made before dying. Cahill had promised revenge, but there was nothing he could do now. Hager shrugged the memory away. The dead were dead. They could do no harm. Hager now lost no time in reaching Moose Gulch. He drove the dogs relentlessly, trotting behind the sled. Elation gave him a strength that took him easily over the miles. A short time before he entered the settlement, it began to snow again. Hager was pleased. The snow would cover up the tracks he had left in the event that Art Maddox did any snooping. He went directly to the doctor's home, carrying the body of Cahill inside. He cleverly played the part of a man reluctant to believe that his partner had died. "'Isn't there something you can do, Doc?' he asked anxiously. "'Maybe it isn't too late.' The other straightened from his examination of Cahill and shook his white thatch. His round, ruddy features were sympathetic. "'I'm afraid it's all over. Ben Cahill's as dead as he'll ever be. Most likely he passed away some time before you were able to reach town.' Nothing left to do now but turn him over to the undertaker. That's me, in case you don't know. In Moose Gulch, it takes two, three jobs to keep a man fairly busy. Hager sighed and looked properly grief-stricken. Well, I'll leave you to take care of things, Doc. Do a good job. Nothing but the best, you know. Ben was the finest partner a man could ever have. Hager left and proceeded to visit acquaintances in the settlement, spreading the news of Cahill's death. He was showered with condolences, which he accepted with a suitable air of melancholy. Later, eating supper in the tiny dining room of Moose Gulch's small frame hotel, he was joined at the table by Art Maddox. The marshal was a tall, raw-boned man with a long nose and protruding eyes, that looked deceptively mild. His presence filled Hager with a vague dread. "'Heard Ben Cahill took sick and died while you were bringing him into town,' Maddox began. "'Sure is too bad. How did it happen?' Hager explained, adhering closely to essential facts, though he omitted certain others and stretched a point here and there. He finished, I tried to get Ben into town as fast as I could, but it was snowing hard, and I almost got lost a couple of times. Ben was sick bad, and with the cold and all, he died on the way. 
It kind of looks like you expected that to happen, Maddox said. Hager grew tense. What do you mean? The way you took the furs along kind of makes it look like you expected Ben Cahill to die. Besides, you ought to have known that the furs would slow you down on the trip to town. I was afraid to leave the furs at the cabin, Hager defended. Suppose somebody stole them while me and Ben were gone. A whole season's catch. I just couldn't take a chance. Maddox nodded with evident reluctance. That's true enough, I guess. I was just sort of wondering about it. He stood up. Well, sorry to have bothered you. Hager made a generous gesture. No bother at all. He watched as Maddox left the room, grinning inwardly. Maddox apparently suspected something in his snooping, suspicious way, but the only point of attack he'd been able to find was one for which Hager had a satisfactory explanation. Hager felt certain that he wouldn't be questioned again, and with the snow blotting out the erratic trail the sled had left, he was confident that he had nothing to fear from Maddox any longer. The grin crept out around his square lips. He was safe. He had committed the perfect crime. Hager checked in at the hotel, and after a pleasant evening spent at one of Moose Gulch's two saloons, he returned and went to bed. He had a restless night. The hotel was warm enough, and the covers on the bed thick, but a strange feeling of cold seemed to envelop him and though he emptied the bottle of whiskey he had brought with him, the cold persisted. He slept fitfully. Once he dreamed that he was tied, naked to the sled, and being driven by Cahill through a terrific snowstorm. The cold was so intense it seared him like fire. He awoke shivering, a vivid recollection of Cahill's gaunt, accusing features in his mind. Again he seemed to hear Cahill's dying promise. "'You aren't going to get away with this, Matt. I'm going to get you. I'm going to make you pay.' And now, shuddering with that weird cold that seemed to enclose him like a huge, vengeful fist, Hager wondered. The cold remained with him in the days that followed. It not only remained, it grew more unbearable. Hager began to have a persecuted feeling. The cold stayed with him wherever he went. Even near hot stoves, or in heated rooms, he felt chilled. No one else seemed to notice it. The cold seemed intended for him alone. More and more he wondered about Cahill's threat. He was materialistic. He didn't believe in ghosts but he knew that he was being haunted by an unnatural cold that nobody else seemed able to feel. He cast about for a method of escaping the cold. The obvious solution was to leave Moose Gulch, as he had intended all along. In his mind the cold was somehow connected with the settlement, through Cahill, who was buried there. A trip to one of the warm southern regions in the States, he decided, should bring relief. He sold the furs, and with the money took passage on a plane that operated between the settlement and a large town some distance away. Continuing to travel by plane, he presently arrived in Seattle. Still the cold remained with him. The miles he had put between Moose Gulch and himself hadn't done any good. Nothing seemed to help. Heavy clothes, nourishing foods, whiskey vigorous exercise. Nothing brought him the warmth he was beginning to crave as an addict craves dope. Desperately, he resumed his trip, traveling by air and then by train, and finally grasping at any means of transportation that happened to be most convenient. The coal traveled with him. It enveloped him like a shell. It was an invisible prison shutting him away from the world of warmth. 
the climate grew increasingly mild and balmy as he progressed southward. But the chill that always surrounded him grew worse. More often now he thought of Cahill's grim promise. I'm going to get you. I'm going to make you pay. It repeated itself over and over in his mind. It was emphasized by the invisible blanket of cold wrapped inescapably about him. Once, in a hotel room where he had been drinking steadily, Hager's despair rose in him to the point of madness. He leapt from the bed, hurling an empty whiskey bottle against the wall, screaming mingled curses and entreaties. "'Damn you, Cahill! Leave me alone! Haven't you had enough? How much longer are you going to keep torturing me? Leave me alone, do you hear? Leave me alone!' Cahill didn't seem to hear. Or, if he did, he paid no attention. The cold stayed. Hager began to lose weight. His stocky figure became gaunt, his cheeks sunken. Dark hollows cupped his feverishly bright eyes. His hands trembled. He jerked nervously at sudden noises. In Los Angeles, he yielded to a wild impulse and visited a doctor. He explained his symptoms, omitting their true cause, and pleaded for help. The doctor gave him a complete physical examination, though it was evident from the man's expression of perplexity that he had learned nothing. "'I can't understand it,' he told Hager. "'There's nothing seriously wrong with you. All you need is plenty of food and rest. You're probably just imagining things." Hager groaned, paid his bill, and fled. Several days later found him in Mexico. It was warm, but he didn't feel it. He knew with a terrible certainty that he would never feel warmth again. And he was tired of futilely trying to escape something from which there was no escape. He rented a small house on the outskirts of a town far from the border, and hired an elderly Mexican named Pancho to attend to his needs. Pancho was a good servant. But he was evidently greatly puzzled by Hager. According to the stories Pancho told his cronies in the town, his gringo master insisted that a hot fire be kept going constantly in the fireplace. And in this warm weather, too and if that alone wasn't enough, the gringo also kept himself wrapped thickly in blankets. It was all very strange. The gringo, he said, was being tormented by a demon. The people of the town, a simple folk to whom the supernatural was as real as the sun in the sky, were sympathetic. A priest at the church promptly volunteered his aid. He had, as Pancho subsequently explained to Hager when he appeared with the man, an enviable reputation for his skill in exorcising devils and evil spirits. Hager seized at the hope. He clutched at the priest eagerly. "'Try it! Pray for me! Do something! Anything!' The priest nodded gravely and began his task. It worked. Hager felt warm again. A wild delight filled him. For the first time he became aware that the room was stifling, but the mere fact that he was able to feel it seemed the most wonderful thing in the world. He had a sense of freedom as complete as though he had been released into the sunlight after long confinement in a lightless dungeon. He wrung the priest's hand, forced money on him, and then told Pancho he was throwing a fiesta for the entire town that evening. Pancho was to take care of the details immediately. No expense was to be spared. For the rest of the day, Hager soaked himself in the sunlight, reveling in the delicious warmth. And when evening came, he attended the fiesta in high spirits. He ate tortillas, drank wine, and danced with innumerable dark-eyed senoritas. It was late when he returned to the house with Pancho. 
he found a robed figure waiting patiently at the door. It was the priest. Something about the man's solemn expression filled Hager with dread. "'What's the matter?' he demanded. "'Has something happened?' In his halting English, Pancho translated the gist of the priest's explanation. "'The padre say he no can help you, senor. He say he have how you call vision. He tell him you must pay.' There was more, but Hager didn't need any more to know that he was being refused further help for the crime he had committed. A short while after the priest left, he felt the cold again. Pancho built a fire in the fireplace, and Hager crouched before it, huddled in blankets and shivering. He was still there when Pancho went to bed, and he was still there when Pancho awoke in the morning. But he was no longer shivering. He no longer felt the cold. He was dead. It had been a warm night. The fire had been hot, the blankets numerous and thick. Yet Hager had frozen to death. The End of Cold Ghost by Chester S. Geyer